Chapter One of The Young Diana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter One. Once upon a time, in earlier and less congested days of literary effort, an author was accustomed to address the public as gentle reader. It was a civil phrase, involving a pretty piece of flattery. It implied three things. First, that if the reader were not gentle, the author's courtesy might persuade him or her to become so. Secondly, that criticism, whether favourable or the reverse, might perhaps be generously postponed till the reading of the book was finished. And, thirdly, that the author had no wish to irritate the reader's feelings, but rather sought to prepare and smooth the way to a friendly understanding. Now I am at one with my predecessors in all these delicate points of understanding, and, as I am about to relate what every person of merely average intelligence is likely to regard as an incredible narrative, I think it as well to begin politely, in the old-fashioned, grand, manner of appeal which is half apologetic and half conciliatory. Gentle reader, therefore, I pray you to be friends with me. Do not lose either patience or temper while following the strange adventures of a very strange woman, though in case you should be disappointed in seeking for what you will not find, let me say at once that my story is not of the sex problem type. No. My heroine is not perverted from the paths of decency and order, or drawn to a bad end. In fact, I cannot bring her to an end at all, as she is still very much alive, and doing uncommonly well for herself. Any end for Diana May would seem not only incongruous, but manifestly impossible. Life, as we all know, is a curious business. It is like a stage mask with two faces, the one comic, the other tragic. The way we look at it depends on the way it looks at us. Some of us have seen it on both sides, and are neither edified nor impressed. Then, again, life is a series of sensations. We who live now are always describing life. They who lived long ago did the same. It seems that none of us have ever found, or can ever find, anything better to occupy ourselves with all. All through the ages the millions of human creatures who once were born and who are now dead passed their time on this planet in experiencing sensations and relating their experiences to one another, each telling his or her little tale of woe in a different way. So anxious were they, and so anxious are we, to explain the special and individual manner in which our mental and physical vibrations respond to the particular circumstances in which we find ourselves, that all systems of religion, government, science, art and philosophy have been, and are, evolved simply and solely out of the pains and pleasures of a mass of atoms who are feeling things and trying to express their feelings to each other. These feelings they designate by various lofty names, such as faith, logic, reason, opinion, wisdom, and so forth. And upon them they build temporary fabrics of law and order, vastly solid in appearance, yet collapsible as a house of cards, and crumbling at a touch, while every now and again there comes a sudden, unlooked-for interruption to their discussions and plans a kind of dark pause and suggestion of chaos, such as a great war, a plague, or other unwelcome visitation of God, wherein feelings almost cease, or else people are too frightened to talk about them. They are chilled into nervous silence and wait, afflicted by fear and discouragement, till the cloud passes and the air clears. Then the perpetual buzz of feeling begins again in the mixed bass and treble of complaint and rejoicing, a kind of monotonous noise without harmony. External nature has no part in it, for man is the only creature that ever tries to explain the phenomena of existence. 
it is not in the least comprehensible why he alone should thus trouble and perplex himself or why his incessant consideration and analysis of his own emotions should be allowed to go on for whatsoever education may do for us we shall never be educated out of the sense of our own importance which is an odd fact moving many thoughtful minds to never-ending wonder my heroine diana may wondered she was always wondering she spent weeks and months and years in a chronic state of wonder she wondered about herself and several other people because she thought both herself and those several other people so absurd she found no use for herself in the general scheme of things and tried with much patient humility to account for herself but though she read books on science books on psychology books on natural and spiritual law and studied complex problems of evolution and selection of species till her poor dim eyes grew dimmer and the lines from nose to chin became ever longer and deeper she could discover no way through the thick bog of her difficulties she was an awkward numeral in a sum she did not know why she came in or how she was to be got out her father and mother were what are called very well-to-do people with a pleasantly suburban reputation for respectability and regular church attendance mr james polydore may this was his name in full as engraved on his visiting card was a small man in stature but in self-complacency the biggest one alive he had made a considerable fortune in a certain manufacturing business which need not here be specified and he had speculated with it in a shrewd and careful manner which was not without a touch of genius the happy result being that he had always gained and never lost now at the age of sixty he was free from all financial care and could rattle gold and silver in his trousers pockets with a sense of pleasure in their clinking sound they had the sweetness of church bells which proclaim the sure nearness of a prosperous town he was not a bad-looking little veteran he had as he was fond of saying of himself a good chest measurement and though his legs were short they were not bandy inclined to corpulence the two lower buttons of his waistcoat were generally left undone that he might the more easily stretch himself after a full meal his physiognomy was not so much intelligent as pugnacious his bushy eyebrows hair and moustache gave him at certain moments the look of an irascible old terrier he had keen small eyes coming close to the bridge of a rather pronounced israelitish nose and to these characteristics was added a generally assertive air an air which went before him like an advancing atmosphere heralding his approach as a somebody that sort of atmosphere which invariably accompanies nobodies his admiration of the fair sex was open and not always discreet and from his youth up he had believed himself capable of subjugating any and every woman he had an agreeable first manner of his own on introduction a manner which was absolutely deceptive giving no clue to the uglier side of his nature his wife could have told whole stories about this first manner of his had she not long ago given up the attempt to retain any hold on her own individuality she had been a woman of average intelligence when she married him commonplace certainly but good-natured and willing to make the best of everything needless to say that the illusions of youth vanished with the first years of wedded life as they are apt to do and she had gradually sunk into a flabby condition of resigned nonentity seeing there was nothing else left for her the dull tame tenor of her days had once been interrupted by the birth of her only child diana who as long as she was small and young and while she was being educated under the usual system of governesses and schools was an object of delight affection amusement and interest and who when she grew up and came out at eighteen as a graceful pretty girl of the freshest type of english beauty gave her mother something to love and to live for but alas diana had proved the bitterest of all her disappointments the coming out business the balls the race meetings and other matrimonial traps had been set in vain the training the music the dancing the toilette had failed to attract 
and Diana had not married. She had fallen in love, as most girls do before they know much about men, and she had engaged herself to an officer with expectations, for whom, with a romantic devotion as out of date as the poems of Chaucer, she had waited for seven long years in a resigned condition of alarming constancy. And then, when his expectations were realised, he had promptly thrown her over for a fairer and younger partner. By that time Diana was what is called getting on. All this had tried the temper of Mrs. James Polydor May considerably, and she took refuge from her many vexations in the pleasures of the table and the consolations of sleep. The result of this mode of procedure was that she became corpulent and unwieldy. Her original self was swallowed up in a sort of feather-bed of adipose tissue, from which she peered out on the world with protruding, lustreless eyes, the tip of her small nose seeming to protest feebly against the injustice of being well-nigh walled from sight between the massive flabby cheeks on either side of its never-classic and distinctly parsimonious proportions. With oversleep and overeating she had matured into a stupid and somewhat obstinate woman, with a habit of saying unmeaningly nice or nasty things. She would gush affectionately to all and sundry. To the maid who fastened her shoes as ardently as to a friend of many years' standing. Yet she would mock her own guests behind their backs, or unkindly criticise the physical and mental defects of the very man or woman she had flattered obsequiously five minutes before, so that she was not exactly a safe acquaintance. You never knew where to have her. But, as is often the case with these placidly smiling, obese ladies, everyone seemed to be in a conspiracy to call her sweet, and dear, and kind whereas in truth she was one of the most selfish souls extant. Her charities were always carefully considered and bestowed in quarters where she was likely to get most credit for them. Her profusely expressed sympathy for other people's troubles exhausted itself in a few moments, and she would straightway forget what form of loss or misfortune she had just been commiserating, while, despite her proverbial dear and sweet attributes, she had a sulky temper which would hold her in its grip for days, during which time she would neither speak nor be spoken to. Her chief interest and attention were centred on eatables, and she always made a point of going to breakfast in advance of her husband, so that she might select for herself the most succulent morsels out of the regulation dish of fried bacon, before he had a chance to look in. Husband and wife were always arguing with each other, and both were always wrong in each other's opinion. Mrs. James Polydor May considered her worse her half as something of a wayward and peevish child, and he in turn looked upon her as a useful domestic female. Perfectly simple and natural, he was wont to say, a statement which, if true, would have been vastly convenient to him as he could then have deceived her more easily. But, deeper than ever plummet sounded, was the simplicity, wherewith Mrs. James Polydor May was endowed, and the natural way in which she managed to secure her own comfort, convenience, and ease, while assuming to be the most guileless and unselfish of women. Indeed, there were times when she was fairly astonished at herself for having arranged things so cleverly, as she expressed it. Whenever a woman of her type admits to having arranged things cleverly, you may be sure that the most astute lawyer alive could never surpass her in the height or the depth of duplicity. Such, briefly outlined, were the characteristics of the couple who, in an absent-minded moment, had taken upon themselves the responsibility of bringing a woman into the world for whom, apparently, the world had no use. Woman, considered in the rough abstract, is only the pack-mule of man. His goods, his chattels, created specially to be the vessel of his passion and humour, and without his favour and support she is by universal consent set down as a lonely and wandering mistake. Such is the law and the prophets. Under these circumstances, which have recently shown signs of yielding to pressure, Diana, 
the rapidly aging spinster daughter of Mr. and Mrs. James Polydor May, was in pitiable plight. No man wanted her, not even to serve him as a pack mule. No man sought to add her person to his goods and chattels, and at the time this true story opens, she was not fair or fascinating or young enough to serve him as a toy for his delight, a plaything of his pleasure. Life had been very monotonous for her since she had passed the turning point of thirty years. Nice people, who always say nasty things, remarked how passé she was getting, thereby helping the ageing process considerably. She, meanwhile, bore her lot with exemplary cheerfulness. She neither grizzled nor complained, nor showed herself envious of youth or youthful loveliness. A comforting idea of duty took possession of her mind, and she devoted herself to the tenderest care of her fat mother and irritable father, waiting upon them like a slave, and saying her prayers for them night and morning as simply as a child, without the faintest suspicion that they were past praying for. The years went on, and she took pains to educate herself in all that might be useful. She read much and thought more. She mastered two or three languages, and spoke them with ease and fluency, and she was an admirable musician. She had an abundance of pretty light brown hair, and all her movements were graceful, but, alas, the unmistakable look of growing old was stamped upon her once mobile features. She had become angular and flat-chested, and the unbecoming straight line from waist to knee, which gave her figure a kind of pitiful masculinity, was developing with hard and bony relentlessness. One charm she had, which she herself recognised and took care to cultivate, a low, sweet voice, an excellent thing in woman. If one chanced to hear her speaking in an adjoining room, the effect was remarkable. One felt that some exquisite creature of immortal youth and tenderness was expressing a heavenly thought in music. Mr. James Polydor May, as I have already ventured to suggest, was nothing if not respectable. He was a J.P. This, in English suburban places at least, is the hallmark of an unimpeachable rectitude. Another sign of his good standing and general uprightness was that at stated seasons he always went for a change of air. We all know that the person who remains in one place the whole year round is beyond the pale and cannot be received in the best society. Mr. May had a handsome house and grounds in the close vicinity of Richmond, within easy distance of town, but when the London season ended, he and Mrs. May invariably discovered their home to be stuffy, and sighed for more expansive breathing and purer oxygen than Richmond could supply. They had frequently taken a shooting or fishing in Scotland, but that was in the days when there were still matrimonial hopes for Diana, and when marriageable men could be invited, not only to handle rod and gun, but to inspect their one ewe lamb, which they were over-anxious to sell to the highest bidder. These happy dreams were at an end. It was no longer worth while to lay in extensive supplies of whisky and cigars by way of impetus to timid or hesitating Benedicts when they came back from a day on the moors, tired, sleepy, and stupid enough to drift into proposals of marriage almost unconsciously. Mr. May seldom invited young men to stay with him now, for the very reason that he could not get them. They found him a bore, his wife dull, and his daughter an old maid, a term of depreciation still freely used by the golden youth of the day, despite the modern and more civil term of Lady Bachelor. So he drew in the horns of his past ambition, and consoled himself with the society of two or three portly men of his own age and habits, men who played golf and billiards, and who, if they could do nothing else, smoked continuously and for the necessary change of air the seaside offered itself as a means of health without too excessive an expenditure and instead of chasing the wild deer and following the row a simple hammock chair on the sandy beach 
and a golf course within easy walking distance provided sufficient relaxation. Not that Mr. May was in any sense parsimonious. He did not take a cottage by the sea or cheap lodgings. On the contrary, he was always prepared to do the thing handsomely, and to select what the house agents call an ideal residence. At the particular time I am writing of, he had just settled down for the summer in a very special ideal on the coast of Devon. It was a house which had formerly belonged to an artist, but the artist had recently died, and his handsome and not inconsolable widow stated that she found it dull. She was glad to let it for two or three months, in order to get away, with that restless alacrity which distinguishes so many people who find anything better than their own homes, and Mr. and Mrs. Polydor May, though, as they said, it certainly was a little quiet after London, were glad to have it, at quite a moderate rental for the charming place it really was. The gardens were exquisitely laid out and carefully kept. The smooth, velvety lawns ran down almost to the sea, where a little white gate opened out from the green of the grass, to the gold of the sand. The rooms were tastefully furnished, and Diana, when she first saw the place, going some days in advance of her father and mother, as was her wont, in order to make things ready and comfortable for them, thought how happy she could be if only such a house and garden were hers to enjoy, independently of others. For a week before her respected and respectable parents came, in the intervals of unpacking, and arranging matters so that the domestic staff could assume their ordinary duties with smoothness and regularity, she wandered about alone, exploring the beauties of her surroundings, her thin, flat figure striking a curious note of sadness and solitude, as she sometimes stood in the garden among a wealth of flowers, looking out to the tender dove-grey line of the horizon across the sea. The servants peeping at her from kitchen and pantry windows made their own comments. "'Poor dear,' said the cook, thoughtfully. "'She do wear thin.' "'Ah, it's a sad look-out for her,' sighed the upper housemaid, who was engaged to a pork-butcher with an alarmingly red face, whom one would have thought any self-respecting young woman would have died rather than wedded. To be all alone in the world like that, unprotected, as she will be when her pa and ma are gone. Well, they won't go in a hurry, put in the butler, who was an observing man. Leastways, Mr. May won't. He'll hold on to life like a cat to a mouse. He will. He's that arty. Why, he thinks he's about thirty instead of sixty. The missus now, if she goes on eating as she do... She'll drop off sudden like a bursting bean, but he, I shouldn't wonder if he outlasted us all. Lor, Mr. Johnson, exclaimed the upper housemaid, how you do talk, and you such a young man, too. Johnson smiled, inwardly flattered. He was well over forty, but like his master wished to be considered a kind of youth, fit for dancing, tennis, and other such gamesome occupations. Miss Diana, he now continued, with a judicial air, has lost her chances. It's a pity, for no one won't marry her now. There's too many young girls about it. No man wants the old uns. She'll have to take up her mission or something to get noticed at all. Here a quiet-looking woman named Grace Laurie interposed. She was the lady's maid, and she was held in great respect, for she was engaged to marry at some uncertain and distant date, an Australian farmer with considerable means. "'Miss Diana is very clever,' she said. "'She could do almost anything she cared to. She's got a great deal more in her than people think. And—' here Grace hesitated. "'She's prettily made, too, though she's over-thin. When she comes from her bath with all her hair hanging down, she looks sweet.' A gurgle of half-hesitating, half-incredulous laughter greeted this remark. "'Well, it's few ladies as look sweet coming from the bath,' declared the butler with emphasis. "'I've had many a peep at the missus.' 
Here the laughter broke out loudly, with little cries of, Oh, oh, and the kitchen chatter ended. It had come to the last day of Diana's free and uncontrolled enjoyment of the charming seaside Eden which her parents had selected as a summer retreat, and regretfully realising this, she strolled lingeringly about the garden, inhaling the sweet odours of roses and mignonette with the salty breath of the sea. The next morning Mr. and Mrs. Polydore May would arrive in time for luncheon, and once more the old domestic jog-trot would commence, the same routine as that which prevailed at Richmond, with no other change save such as was conveyed in the differing scene and surroundings. Breakfast punctually at nine. Luncheon at one. Tea at four-thirty. Dinner at a quarter to eight. Dinner at a quarter to eight was one of Diana's bugbears. Why not have it at eight o'clock, she thought. The quarter to was an irritating juggling with time for which there was no necessity. But she had protested in vain. Dinner at quarter to eight was one of her mother's many domestic fads. Between the several meals enumerated there would be nothing doing, Nothing, that is to say, of any consequence or use to anybody. Diana knew the whole weary, stupid round. Mr. May would pass the morning reading the papers either in the garden or on the sandy shore. Mrs. May would give a few muddled and contradictory orders to the servants, who never obeyed them literally, but only as far as they could be conveniently carried out, and then would retire to write letters to friends or acquaintances. In the afternoon Mr. May would devote himself to golf, while his wife slept till tea-time. Then she would take a stroll in the garden, and perhaps, only perhaps, talk over a few household affairs with her daughter. Then came the quarter-to-eight dinner with desultory and somewhat wrangling conversation, after which Mrs. May slept again, and Mr. May played billiards, if he could find any one to play with him. If not, he practised tricky things alone with the cue. Neither of them ever thought that this sort of life was not conducive to cheerfulness so far as their daughter Diana was concerned. Indeed, they never considered her at all. When she was young, ah, yes, of course, it was necessary to find such entertainment and society for her as might show her off. But now, when she was no longer marriageable in the conventionally accepted sense of marriage, she was left to bear the brunt of fate as best she might, and learn to be contented with the plain feminine duty of keeping house for her parents. It must be stated that she did this keeping house business to perfection, she controlled expenses without a taint of meanness, managed the servants, and made the whole commonplace affair of ordinary living run smoothly. But whatever she did, she never had a word of praise from either her father or mother. They took her careful service as their right, and never seemed to realise that most of their comforts and conveniences were the result of her forethought and good sense. Certainly they did not trouble themselves as to whether she was happy or the reverse. She thought of this, just a little, but not morosely. On the last evening she was to spend alone at Rose Lee, as the ideal summer residence was called, probably on account of its facing west, and gathering on its walls and windows all the brilliant flush of the sunset. She was somewhat weary, she had been occupied for hours in arranging her mother's bedroom, and seeing that all the numerous luxuries needed by that placid mass of superfluous flesh were in their place and order, and now that she had finished everything she had to do, she was glad to have the remainder of her time to herself, in the garden, thinking, and, as usual, wondering. Her wonder was just simply this— how long would she have to go on in the same clockwork mechanism of life as that which now seemed to be her destiny? She had made certain variations in the slow music of her days by study. Yes, that was true. But then no one made use of her studies. 
no one knew the extent of her attainments and even in her music she had no encouragement no one ever asked her to play all her efforts seemed so much wasted output of energy she had certain private joys of her own a great love of nature which like an open door in heaven allowed her to enter familiarly into some of the marvels and benedictions of creative intelligence she loved books and could read them in french and italian as well as in her native english and she had taken to the study of russian with some success greek and latin she had learned sufficiently well to understand the great authors of the elder world in their own script but all these intellectual diversions were organized and followed on her own initiative and as she sometimes said to herself a trifle bitterly nobody knows i can do anything but check the tradesmen's books and order the dinner this was a fact nobody knew ordinary people considered her unattractive what they saw was a scraggy woman of medium height with a worn face visibly beginning to wrinkle under a profusion of brown hair a woman who had been pretty when younger but who now had a rather restrained and nervous manner and who was seldom inclined to speak yet who when spoken to answered always gently in a sweet voice with a wonderfully musical accentuation no one thought for a moment that she might possibly be something of a scholar and certainly no one imagined that above all things she was a great student of all matters pertaining to science every book she could hear of on scientific subjects whether treating of wireless telegraphy light rays radium or other marvellous discoveries of the age she made it her special business to secure and to study patiently and comprehendingly the result being that her mind was richly stored with material for thought on far higher planes than the majority of reading folk ever attempt to reach but she never spoke of the things in which she was so deeply interested and as she was reserved and almost awkwardly shy in company the occasional callers on her mother scarcely noticed her except casually and with a careless civility which meant nothing she was seen to knit and to do jacobean tapestry rather well and people spoke to her of these accomplishments as being what they thought she was most likely to understand but they looked askance at her dress which was always a little tasteless and unbecoming and opined that poor dear mrs may must be dreadfully disappointed in her daughter it never occurred to these easy-tongued folk that diana was dreadfully disappointed in herself this was the trouble of it she asked the question daily and could find no answer and yet she was useful to her parents surely yes but in her own heart she knew they would have been just as satisfied with a paid companion housekeeper they did not really love her now that she had turned out such a failure alas poor diana her hunger for love was her misfortune it was the one thing in all the world she craved it had been this desire of love that had charmed her impulsive soul when in the heyday of her youth and prettiness she had engaged herself to the man for whom she had waited seven years only to be heartlessly thrown over at last she had returned all his letters in exchange for her own at the end of the affair all save two and these two she read every night before she said her prayers to keep them well fixed in her memory one of them contained the following passage how i love you my own sweet little diana you are to me the most adorable girl in the world and if i ever do an unkind thing to you or wrong you in any way may god punish me for a treacherous brute my one desire in life is to make you happy the other letter written some years later was rather differently expressed i am quite sure you will understand that time has naturally worked changes in you as well as in myself and i am obliged to confess that the feelings i once had for you no longer exist but you are a sensible woman and you are old enough now to realise that we are better apart 
you are old enough now was the phrase that jarred upon diana's inward sense like the ugly sound of a clanking chain in a convict's cell you are old enough now well it was true she was old enough but she had taken this oldness upon her while faithfully waiting for her lover and he had been the first to punish her for her constancy it was very strange indeed it was one of those many things that had brought her to her chronic state of wonderment the great writers more notably great poets themselves the most fickle of men eulogized fidelity in love as a heavenly virtue why then when she had practised it had she been so sorely rewarded yet since the rupture of her engagement and the long and bitter pain she had endured over this breaking up of all she had held most dear her many studies and her careful reading had gradually calmed and strengthened her nature and she was able to admit to herself that there were possibly worse things than the loss of a heartless lover who might have proved a still more heartless husband she felt no resentment towards him and his memory now scarcely moved her to a thrill of sorrow or regret she only asked herself why it had all happened of course there was no answer to such a query there never is and she was old enough yes quite old enough to push away all romance and sentimentality yet as she walked slowly in the garden among the roses and watched the sea sparkling in the warm afterglow of what had been an exceptionally fine sun-setting the old foolish craving stirred in her heart again the scent of the flowers the delicate breathings of the summer air the flash of the seagull's white wings skimming over the glittering sand pools all these expressions of natural beauty saddened while they entranced her soul she longed to be one with them sharing their life and imparting to others something of their joy they never grow old she said half aloud or if they do it is not perceived they seem always the same always beautiful and vital here she paused a standard rose tree weighted with splendid blossom showed among its flowers one that had been cramped and spoiled by the over profusion and close pressure of its companions it was decaying amid the eager crowd of bursting buds that looked almost humanly anxious to be relieved of its presence with soft deft fingers diana broke it away from the stem and let it drop to earth that is me she said and that's what ought to become of me nothing withered or ugly ought to live in such a lovely world i am a blot on beauty she looked out to sea again the afterglow had almost faded only one broad line of dull gold showed the parting trail of the sun no there's no hope she murmured with an expressive gesture of her hands i must plod on day after day in the same old rut of things doing my duty which is perhaps all i ought to ask to do trying to make my mother comfortable and to keep my father in decent humour and then then when they go i shall be alone in the world no one will care what becomes of me even as it is now no one cares whether i live or die this is the discordant note in many a life's music no one cares when no one cares for us we do not care about ourselves or about anybody else and in not caring we stumble blindly and unconsciously on our only chance of safety and happiness a heartless truth but a truth all the same for when we have become utterly indifferent to destiny destiny like a spoiled child does all she can to attract our notice and manifests a sudden interest in us of which we had never dreamed and the less we care the more she clings end of chapter one
How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Chapter 2 of The Young Diana This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli Chapter 2 Diana was old enough as her recalcitrant lover had informed her, to value the blessing of a good night's rest. She had a clear conscience. She was, indeed, that rara avis, in these days, a perfectly innocent-minded woman, and she slept as calmly and peacefully as a child. When she woke to the light of a radiant morning, with the sunshine making diamonds of the sea, she felt almost young again as she tripped to and fro, putting the final touches of taste to the pretty drawing-room, and giving to every nook and corner that indefinable air of pleasant occupation which can only be bestowed by the hand of a dainty, beauty-loving woman. At the appointed hour, the automobile was sent to the station to meet Mr. and Mrs. James Polydor May, and punctual to time the worthy couple arrived, both husband and wife slightly out of humour with the heat, of the fine summer's day, and the fatigue of the journey from London. "'Well, Diana,' sighed her mother, turning a fat, buff-coloured cheek to be kissed, "'is the house really decent and comfortable?' "'It's lovely,' declared Diana, cheerfully. "'I'm sure you'll be happy here, mother. The garden is perfectly delightful.' "'Your mother spoke of the house, not the garden?' interposed Mr. May, judicially. You really must be accurate, Diana. Yes, er, uh, yes, that will do. This, as Diana somewhat shrinkingly embraced him. Your mother is always suspicious, and rightly so, of damp in rented country houses, but I think we made ourselves certain that there was nothing of that kind before we decided to take it. And no poultry clucking? No noises of a farmyard close by? No? That's a comfort. Yes, sir, uh, it, it seems fairly suitable. Is luncheon ready? Diana replied that it was, and the family of three were soon seated at table in the dining room, discussing lobster mayonnaise. As Mrs. May bent her capacious bosom over her plate, her round eyes goggling with sheer greed, and Mr. May ate rapidly, as was his wont, casting sharp glances about him to see if he could find fault with anything, Diana's heart sank more and more. It was just the same sort of luncheon as at home in Richmond, tainted by the same sordid atmosphere of commonplace. Her parents showed no spark of pleasurable animation or interest in the change of scene, or the loveliness of the garden and sea as glimpsed through the open French windows, Everything had narrowed into the savoury but compressed limit of lobster mayonnaise. "'Too much mustard in this as usual,' said Mr. May, scraping his plate noisily. "'Not at all,' retorted his wife with placid obstinacy. "'If there is anything Marsh knows how to make with absolute perfection, it is mayonnaise.' Marsh was the cook, and the cause of many a matrimonial wrangle. "'Oh, of course, Marsh is faultless,' sneered Mr. May. "'This house has been taken solely that Marsh shall have a change of air and extra perquisites.' Mrs. May's eyes goggled a little more prominently, and protecting her voluminous bust with a dinner napkin, she took a fresh supply of mayonnaise. Diana, who was a small eater and who rather grudged the time her parents spent over their meals, took no part in this sort of sparring, which always went on between the progenitors of her being. She was thankful when luncheon was over and she could escape to her own room. There she found the maid, 
Grace Laurie, with some letters which had just arrived. These are for you, miss, said Grace. I brought them up out of the hall, as I thought you'd like to be quiet for a bit. Diana smiled gratefully. Thank you, Grace. Mother is coming upstairs directly to lie down. Will you see she has all she wants? Yes, miss. Then, after a pause, It's you that should lie down and get a rest, Miss Diana. You've been doing ever such a lot all these days. You should just take it easy now. Diana smiled again. There was something of kindly compassion in the Take it easy suggestion. But she nodded assentingly and the well-meaning maid left her. There was a long mirror against the wall and Diana suddenly saw her own reflection in it. A hot flush of annoyance reddened her face. What a scarecrow she looked to herself. So angular and bony. Her plain navy linen frock hung as straight as a man's trousers. No gracious curves of body gave prettiness to its uncompromising folds. And, as for her poor worn countenance, she could have thrown things at it for its doleful pointed chin and sharp nose. She looked steadfastly into her own eyes. They were curious in colour, and rather pretty with their melting hues of blue and grey. But, oh, those crow's feet at the corners! Oh, the wrinkling of the eyelids! Oh, the tiredness and dimness and ache! Turning abruptly away, she glanced at the small timepiece on her dressing table. It was three o'clock. Then she took off her navy linen gown, one of the serviceable, ugly sort of things her father was never tired of recommending for her wear, and slipped on a plain little white wrapper which she had made for herself out of a cheap length of nun's veiling. She loosened her hair and brushed it out. It fell to her waist in pretty rippling waves, and it was full of golden glints so much so that spiteful persons of her own sex had even said, At her age it can't be natural, it must be dyed. Nevertheless, its curling tendency and its brightness were all its own, but Diana took no heed of its beauty, and she would have been more than incredulous had anyone told her that in this array, or, rather, disarray, she had the appearance of a time-worn picture of some delicate saint in a French medieval book of hours. But such was her aspect, and with the worn saint look upon her, she drew a reclining chair to the window and lay down, stretching herself restfully at full length, and gazing out to sea, her unopened letters on her lap. How beautiful was that seemingly infinite line of shining water, melting into shining sky. How far removed from the little troubles and terrors of the world of mankind. I wonder, she murmured. The old story again. She was always wondering. Then, with eyes growing almost youthful in their intense longing for comprehension, she became absorbed in one of those vague reveries, which, like the things of eternity, have no beginning and no end. She wondered. Yes. She wondered why, for example, nature was so grand and reasonable, and man so mean and petty, when surely he could, if he chose, be master of his own fate, master of all the miracles of air, fire and water, and supreme sovereign of his own soul. A passage in a book she had lately been reading recurred to her memory. If any man once mastered the secret of governing the chemical atoms of which he is composed, he would discover the fruit of the tree of life, of which, as his creator said, he would take, eat, and live forever. She sighed, a sigh of weariness and momentary depression, then began turning over her letters and glancing indifferently at the handwriting on each envelope, till one, addressed in a remarkably clear, bold calligraphy, made her smile in evidently pleasurable anticipation. 
from Sophy Lansing, she said. Dear little Sophy, she's always amusing with her suffragette enthusiasms and her vivacious independent ways. And she's one of those very few clever women who manage to keep womanly and charming in spite of their cleverness. Oh, what a fat letter! She opened it and read the dashing scrawl, still smiling. Dearest Di, I suppose you are now settling down by the sad sea waves with Pa and Ma. Oh, you poor thing! I can see you hard at it like a donkey at a well, trotting in the common round the daily task of keeping Pa as tolerable in temper as such an old curmudgeon can be, and Ma as reposeful under her burden of superfluous flesh as is at all possible. What a life for you, patient Grizel! Why don't you throw it up? You are really clever, and you could do so much. This is Woman's Day, and you are a woman of exceptional ability. You know I've asked you over and over again to retire from the whole domestic show, and leave those most uninteresting and selfish old parents of yours to their own devices, with a paid housekeeper to look after their food, which is all they really care about. Come and live with me in London. We should be quite happy together, for I'm good-natured and sensible, and so are you, and we're neither of us contending for a man, so we shouldn't quarrel. And you'd wake up, Diana. You'd wake to find that there are many more precious things in life than Pa and Ma. I could even find you a few men to entertain you, though most of them become bores after about an hour, especially the ones that think themselves vastly amusing. Like your Pa, you know, who, when he tells a very ancient good story, thinks that God himself ought to give up everything else to listen to him. No, don't be shocked. I'm not really irreverent. But you know it's true. Woe betide the hapless white, male or female, who dares utter a word while Pa Polydor is on the story trail. How I've longed to throw things at him, and have only refrained for your sake. Well, God a mercy on us, as Shakespeare's Ophelia says, and defend us from the anecdotal men. You'll perhaps be interested to hear that a proposal of marriage was made to me last night. The bold adventurer is rather like your pa. Well, on, in years. Rich, with a prosperous tum, and a general aspect of assertive affluence. I said, no, of course, and he asked me if I knew what I was doing, exactly as if he thought I might be drunk or dreaming. I replied that I was quite aware of myself, of him, and the general locality. And yet you say no, he almost whispered in a kind of stupefied amazement. I repeated, no, and no, and clinched the matter by the additional remark that he was the last sort of man I would ever wish to marry. Then he smiled feebly and said, Poor child, you have been sadly led astray. These new ideas. I cut him short by ringing the bell and ordering tea, and fortunately just at the moment in came Jane Prowser. You know her, the tall, bony woman who goes in for eugenics, and she did the scarecrow business quite effectively. As soon as she began to talk in her high, rasping voice, he went. Then I had tea alone with the Prowser. Rather a trying meal, as she would, she would, describe in detail all the deformities and miseries of a child, what well, hadn't no business to be born, as my housemaid once remarked of a certain domestic upset. However, I got rid of her after she had eaten all the cress and tomato sandwiches, and then I started to read a batch of letters from abroad. I'm so thankful for my foreign correspondents. They write and spell so well, and always have something interesting to say. One of my great friends in Paris, Blanche de Rouet, sent me a most curious advertisement, which she tells me is appearing in all the French papers. I enclose it for you, as you are so scientific, and it may interest you. It is rather curiously worded, and sounds uncanny, but it occupies nearly half a column in all the principal Paris papers, and is repeated in five different languages, French, Italian, Spanish, Russian, and English. I suppose it's a snare, or a do of some sort. The world is full of scoundrels, even in science. Now, remember what I tell you. Come to me at once if Pa and Ma kick over the traces, and allow their ingrained selfishness to break out of bounds. There's plenty of room for you in my cosy little flat, and we can have a real good time together. Don't bother about money. With your talent and knowledge of languages, you can soon earn some, and I'll put you in the way of it. You really must do something for your own advantage. Surely you don't mean to waste your whole life in soothing Pa and massaging Ma? It may be dutiful, but it must be dull. I don't think all the massaging in the world will ever reduce Ma to normal proportions, and certainly nothing can ever cure Pa of his detestable humours which are always lurking in ambush below his surface manner. 
ready to jump out like little black devils on the smallest provocation. We can never be really grateful enough, dear Di, for our single blessedness. Imagine what life would have been for us with husbands like Pa. Absolute misery. For you and I could never have taken refuge in food and fat like Ma. We would have died sooner than concentrate our souls on peas and asparagus. We would have gone to the stake like martyrs rather than have allowed our bosoms to swell with the interior joys of roast pork and stuffing. Oh yes, there is much to be thankful for in our spinsterhood. We can go to our little beds in peace, knowing that no pig-like snoring from the superior brute will disturb the holy hours of the night. And if we are clever enough to make a little money, we can spend it as we like, without being cross-examined as to why it is that the dress we wore four years ago is worn out, and why we must have another. I could run on for pages and pages concerning the blessings and privileges of unmarried women, but I'll restrain my enthusiasm till we meet. Let that meeting be soon, and remember that I am always at your service as a true friend, and that I'll do anything in the world to help you out of your domestic harness. For the old people who drive you can't and won't see what a patient, kind, helpful, clever daughter they've got, and they don't deserve to keep you. Let them spend their spare cash on a housekeeper, who is sure to cheat them, and a good job too, and take your freedom. Get away, never mind how or where or when, but don't spend all your life in drudging. You've done enough of it. Get away. This is the best of good advice from your loving friend, Sophie Lansing. A slight shadow of meditative gravity clouded Diana's face as she finished reading this letter. She was troubled by her own thoughts. Sophie's lively strictures on her parents were undoubtedly correct and deserved. And yet, father and mother were father and mother after all. It is curious how these two words still keep their sentimental significance, despite state education. Mother, in the lower classes, is often a drab, and in the higher a frivolous wastrel. Father, in the slums, may beat his children black and blue, and in Mayfair neglect them to the point of utmost indifference. But, mother and father, totally undeserving as they often are, still come in for a share of their offspring's vague consideration and lingering respect. Education, of the wrong sort, however, is doing its best to deprive them of this regard, and it appears likely that the younger generation will soon be so highly instructed as to be able to ignore mother and father as easily as fully-fledged cygnets ignore the parent birds who drive them away from their nesting haunts. But Diana was old-fashioned. She had an affectionate nature, and she took pathetic pains to persuade herself that Pa and Ma meant to be kind, and must in their hearts love her, their only child. This was pure fallacy but it was the only little bit of hope and trust left to her in a hard world, and she was loath to let it go. The smallest expression of tenderness from that ruffled old human terrier, her father, would have brought her to his feet, an even more willing slave to his moods than she already was. A loving embrace from her mother would have moved her almost to tears of joy and gratitude, and would have doubly strengthened her unreasoning and unselfish devotion to the bogey of her duty. But she never received any such sign of affection or encouragement from year's end to year's end, and it was like a strange dream to her now to recall that, when she had been young, in the time of her teens, her father had called her his beautiful girl, and her mother had chosen pretty frocks for her darling child. Youth and the prospects of marriage had made this difference in the temperature of parental tenderness. Now that she was at that fatal stopgap called middle age and a hopeless spinster, the pretty frocks and the beautiful girl, darling child, period, had vanished with her matrimonial chances. There was no help for it. At this point in her thoughts, she gave a little half-unconscious sigh. Mechanically, she folded up Sophie Lansing's letter, and as she did so, 
noticed that a slip of printed paper had fallen out of it and lay on the floor. She turned herself on her reclining chair and stooped for it, then, as she picked it up, realised that it must be the advertisement in the five different languages which her friend had mentioned. Glancing carelessly over it at first, but afterwards more attentively, her interest was aroused by its unusual wording, and then, as she read it over and over again, she found in it a singular attraction. It ran as follows. To any woman who is alone in the world without claims on her time or her affections, a scientist, engaged in very important and difficult work, requires the assistance and cooperation of a courageous and determined woman of mature years. She must have a fair knowledge of modern science, and must not shrink from dangerous experiments, or be afraid to take risks in the pursuit of discoveries which may be beneficial to the human race. Every personal care, consideration, and courtesy will be shown towards her, and she will be paid a handsome sum for her services, and be provided with full board and lodging, in an elegant suite of apartments, placed freely at her disposal. She must be prepared to devote herself for one or two years entirely to the study of very intricate problems in chemistry, concerning which she will be expected to maintain the strictest confidence. She must be well educated, especially in languages and literature, and she must have no ties of any kind or business which can interrupt or distract her attention from the serious course of training which it will be necessary for her to pursue. This advertisement cannot be answered by letter. Each applicant must present herself personally and alone between the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. on Tuesdays and Fridays only to Dr. Feodor Dimitrius, Chateau Fragonard, Geneva. The more Diana studied this singular announcement, the more remarkable and fascinating did it seem. The very hours named as the only suitable ones for interviewing applicants, between six and eight in the morning, were unusual enough, and the whole wording of the advertisement implied something mysterious and out of the common. Though I dare say it is, as Sophie suggests, only a snare of some sort, she thought, and yet to me it sounds genuine. But I don't think this Dr. Feodor Dimitrius will get the kind of woman he wants easily. A handsome salary with board and lodging are tempting enough, but few women would be inclined to take risks in the inventions and discoveries of modern science. Some of them are altogether too terrible. She read the advertisement carefully through again, then rose and locked it away in her desk with Sophie Lansing's letter. She glanced through the rest of her correspondence, which was not exciting. One note asking for the character of a servant, another for the pattern of a blouse, and a third enclosing a recipe for a special sort of jam. With love to your sweet, kind mother. She put them all by, and stretching her arms languidly above her head, caught another glimpse of herself in the mirror. This time it was more satisfactory. Her hair hanging down to her waist, was full of a brightness, made brighter just now by the sunlight streaming through the window, and her nun's veiling, rest gown, had a picturesque grace in its white fall and flow, which softened the tired look of her face and eyes into something like actual prettiness. The fair ghost of her lost youth peeped at her for a moment, awakening a smarting sense of regretful tears. A light tap at the door fortunately turned the current of her thoughts, and the maid Grace Laurie entered, bearing a dainty little tray with a cup of tea invitingly set upon it. "'I've just taken some tea to Mrs. May in her bedroom,' she said, "'and I thought you'd perhaps like a cup.' "'You're a treasure, Grace,' and Diana sat down to the proffered refreshment. "'What shall we all do when you go away to be married?' Grace laughed and tossed her head. "'Well, there's time enough for that, miss,' she replied. "'He ain't in no hurry, nor am I. You see, when you're married, you're just done for. There's no more fun. It's drudge, wash, cook and sew for the rest of your days, and no way of getting out of it.' Diana, sipping her tea, looked at her, smiling. "'If that's the way you think, you shouldn't marry,' she said. "'Oh, yes, I should!' <laughs> and Grace laughed again. "'A woman like me wants a home and a man to work for her, 
i don't care to be in service all my days i may as well wash and sew for a man of my own as for anybody else but you love him don't you asked diana well he isn't much to love declared grace with twinkling eyes his looks wouldn't upset anyone's peace i've never thought of love at all all i want is to be warm and comfortable in a decent house with plenty to eat and a good husband is a man who can do that and keep it going as for loving that's all stuff and nonsense as i always say you should never care more for a man with your head than you can kick off with your eels this profound utterance had the effect of moving diana to the most delightful mirth she laughed and laughed again and her laughter was so sweet and fresh that it was like a little chime of bells her voice as already hinted was her great charm and whether she laughed or spoke her accents broke the air into little bars of music oh grace grace she said at last you are too funny for words i must learn that wise saying of yours by heart what is it never care more for a man with your head than you can kick off with your eels splendid and you mean it grace nodded emphatically of course i mean it it don't do to care too much for a man he's always a sort of spoilt babe and what he gets easy he don't care for and what he can't have he's always crying crying after you'll find that true miss diana the sparkle of laughter quenched itself in diana's eyes and left her looking weary yes i dare say you are right she said quite right grace and looking up she spoke slowly and rather sadly perhaps it's true some people say it is that men like bad women better than good and that if a woman is thoroughly selfish vain and reckless treating men with complete indifference and contempt they admire her much more than if she were loving and faithful of course assented grace positively look at mrs potter barney the one the halfpenny papers call the beautiful mrs barney i know a maid who was told by another maid that she got five hundred guineas for a kiss and lady wasterick has had thousands of pounds for diana held up a hand she smiled still but a trifle austerely that will do grace grace coughed discreetly and subsided is mother still lying down then asked diana yes miss she'll be on her bed till the dinner dressing bell rings and mr may's asleep over his newspaper in the garden again diana laughed her clear pretty laugh the somnolent habits of her parents were so enlivening and made home life so cheerful well all right grace she said if there's nothing for me to do i shall go for a walk presently so you'll know what to say if i'm asked for grace assented and then departed diana finished her cup of tea in meditative mood then resolving to throw her retrospective thoughts to the winds prepared to go out it was an exceptionally fine afternoon warm and brilliant and instead of her navy linen gown which had seen considerable wear and tear she put on a plain white one which became her much better than the indigo blue and completing her costume with a very simple straw hat and white parasol she went downstairs and out of the house into the garden she had meant to avoid her father whom she saw on the lawn under the spreading boughs of a cedar tree seated in one rustic armchair with his short legs comfortably disposed on another and the day's newspaper modestly spread as a coverlet over his unbuttoned waistcoat but an inquisitive wasp happening to buzz too near his nose he made a dart at it with one hand and opening his eyes perceived her white figure moving across the grass who's that what's that he called out sharply don't glide about like a ghost is it you diana yes it's me she replied and came up beside him he gave her a casual look then sniffed and smiled sardonically dear me how fine we are i thought it was some young girl of the neighbourhood leaving cards on your mother why are you wearing white going to a wedding diana coloured to the roots of her pretty hair it's one of my washing frocks she submitted 
Oh, is it? Well, I like to see you in dark colours. They are more suited to... to your age. Only very young people should wear white. He yawned capaciously. Only very young people. He repeated, closing his eyes. Try and remember that. Mrs. Ross Percival wears white, said Diana, quietly. You are always holding her up to admiration, and she's sixty if she's a day. Mr. Polydor May opened his eyes and bounced up in his chair. Mrs. Ross Percival is a very beautiful woman, he snapped out. One of the beautiful women of society, and she's married. Oh, yes, she's a grandmother, murmured Diana, smiling. But you don't tell her not to wear white. Good God, of course not. It's no business of mine. What are you talking about? She's not my daughter. Diana laughed her pretty, soft laugh. No, indeed. Poor Pa, that would be terrible. She'd make you seem so old if she were. But perhaps you wouldn't mind as she's so beautiful. Mr. May stared at her wrathfully with the feeling that he was being made fun of. She is beautiful, he said firmly. Only a jealous woman would dare to question it. Diana laughed again. Very well, she is beautiful, wig and all, she said, and moved away, opening her parasol as she passed from the shadow of the cedar boughs into the full sun. She's getting beyond herself, thought her father, watching her as she went, and noting what he was pleased to consider affectation in her naturally graceful way of walking. And if she once begins that sort of game, she'll be unbearable. Nothing can be worse than an old maid who gets beyond herself or above herself. She'll be fancying some man is in love with her next. He gave a snort of scorn and composed himself to sleep again. Meanwhile, Diana had left the garden and was walking at an easy pace, which was swift without seeming hurried, down to the seashore. It was very lovely there at this particular afternoon hour. The tide was coming in, and the long, shining waves rolled up one after the other in smooth lines of silver on sand that shone in wet patches like purest gold. The air was soft and warm, but not oppressive, and as the solitary woman lifted her eyes to the peaceful blue sky, arched like a sheltering dome above the peaceful blue sea, her solitude was, for the moment, more intensified. More keenly than ever, she felt that there was no one to whom she could look for so much as a loving word. Not in her own home, at any rate. Her friends were few. Sophie Lansing was one of the most intimate, but Sophie lived such a life of activity, throwing her energies into so many channels, that it was not possible to get into very close or constant companionship with her. While I live, she said to herself, deliberately, I shall have no one to care for me. I must make up my mind to that. And when I die, if I go to heaven, there will be no one there who cares for me. And if I go to hell, no one there either. <laughs> She laughed at this idea, but there were tears in her eyes. It's curious not to have any one on earth or in heaven or hell who wants you. I wonder if there are many like that. And yet, I've never done anything wicked or spiteful to deserve being left so unloved. She had come to a small, deep cove, picturesquely walled in by high masses of rock whose summits were gay with creeping plants, grass and flowers, and though the sea was calm, the pressure of the incoming tide through the narrow inlet made waves that were almost boisterous as they rushed in and out with a musical splash and roar. It was hardly safe or prudent to walk further on. Any of those waves could carry one off one's feet in a minute, she thought, and went upwards from the beach beyond the highest mark left by the fringes of the sea where the fragments of an old broken boat made a very good seat. Here she rested a while, allowing vague ideas of a possible future to drift through her brain. The prospect of a visit to Sophie Lansing seemed agreeable enough. 
but she knew very well that it would be opposed by her parents, that her mother would say she could not spare her, and that her father would demand angrily, "'What have I taken this seaside house for, out of pure good nature and unselfishness, just to give you and your mother a summer holiday, and now you want to go away? That's the way I'm rewarded for my kindness.' If any one had pointed out that he had only thought of himself and his own convenience in taking the seaside house, and that he had chosen it chiefly because it was close to the golf links, and also to the club, where there was a billiard-room, and that his women-folk were scarcely considered in the matter at all, he would have been extremely indignant. He never saw himself in any other light but that of justice, generosity, and nobility of disposition. Diana knew his little ways, and laughed at them, though she regretted them. Poor Pa, she would sigh. He would be so much more lovable if he were not quite so selfish. But I suppose he can't help it. And, on turning all the pros and cons over in her mind, she came to the conclusion that it would not be fair to leave her mother alone to arrange all the details of daily life in a strange house, and strange neighbourhood, where the tradespeople were not accustomed to the worthy lady's rather vague ideas of domestic management, such as the ordering of the dinner two hours before it ought to be cooked, and other similar trifles, resulting in kitchen chaos. And, after all, I ought to be very contented. And, lifting her head, she smiled resignedly at the placid sea. It's lovely down here, and I can always read a good deal, and so I can finish my bit of tapestry, and I can master that wonderful new treatise on etheric vibration. Here something seemed to catch her breath. She felt a curious quickening thrill as though an etheric vibration had touched her own nerves and set them quivering. Some words of the advertisement she had lately read sounded on her ears as though spoken by a voice close beside her. She must have a fair knowledge of modern science, and must not shrink from dangerous experiments, or be afraid to take risks in the pursuit of discoveries which may be beneficial to the human race. She rose from her seat a little startled, her cheeks flushing with the stir of some inexplicable excitement in her blood. How strange that I should think of that just now! she said. I wonder. <laughs> and she laughed. I wonder whether I should suit Dr. Feodor Demetrius. The idea amused her. It was so new, so impracticable and absurd, yet it remained in her mind, giving sparkle to her eyes and colour and animation to her face as she walked slowly home in a sort of visionary reverie. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Young Diana This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Young Diana by Marie Corelli Chapter 3 Within a very few days of their settling down, at Rose Lee, everybody in the neighbourhood, that is to say, everybody of county standing, that height of social magnificence, had left their cards on Mr. and Mrs. Polydor May. They had, of course, previously made the usual private, kind inquiries, first as to the newcomer's financial position, and next as to their respectability, and both were found to be unimpeachable. One of the most curious circumstances in this curious world is the strictness with which certain little bipeds inquire into the reported life and conduct of other little bipeds, the inquisitors themselves being generally the most doubtful characters. "'Funny little man, that Mr. May,' said the woman leader of the hunting set, who played bridge all day and as far into the night as she could. 
like a retired tradesman, must have sold cheese and butter at some time of his life. Oh, no, explained a male intimate, whose physiognomy strangely resembled that of the fox he chased all the winter. He made his pile in copper. Oh, did he? Then he's quite decent? Quite. That daughter of his. Here a snigger went round the county company. They were discussing the new arrivals at their afternoon tea. Poor old thing. Must be forty if she's a day. Oh, give the dear girl forty-five at least, said a chivalrous youth, declining tea and helping himself to a whisky soda at the sideboard. They say she was jilted. No wonder. <laughs> and a bleating laugh followed this suggestion. I suppose, remarked one man of gloomy countenance and dyspeptic eye, I suppose it's really unpardonable for a woman to get out of her twenties and remain unmarried, but if it happens so, I don't see what's to be done with her. Smother her, said the chivalrous youth, drinking his whisky. Everybody laughed. What a witty boy he was. No wonder his mother was proud of him. We shall have to ask her to one or two tennis parties, said the woman who had first spoken. We can't leave her out altogether. She doesn't play, said the gloomy man. She told me so. She reads Greek. A shrill chorus of giggles in falsetto greeted this announcement. Reads Greek? How perfectly dreadful! A blue stocking! No, really, it's too weird exclaimed the bridge and hunting lady. I hope she's not an art person. No. And the gloomy man began to be cheerful, seeing that his talk had awakened a little interest. No, not at all. She told me she liked pictures but hated artists. I said she couldn't have pictures without artists. And she agreed, but observed that fortunately all the finest pictures of the world were painted by artists who were dead. Curious way of putting it. Going off it? queried the chivalrous youth, having now drained his tumbler of drink. No, I don't think so. The fact is, er, uh, she, well, she appeared to me to be rather, er, uh, clever. Clever? Oh, surely not. The county, dames, almost shuddered. Clever? She couldn't be, you know, not with that spoilt, old young sort of face. And her hair, all dyed, of course. And her voice was very affected, wasn't it? Yes, almost as if she were trying to imitate Sarah Bernhardt. So stupid in a woman of her age. She ought to know better. So the little vicious, poisonous, gossiping mouths jabbered and hissed about the woman who was left like a forgotten apple on a bough to wither and drop unregarded to the ground no one had anything kind to say of her it mattered not at all that they were not really acquainted with her personally or sufficiently to be able to form an opinion the point with these precious sort of persons was and always is that an unwanted feminine non-entity had arrived in the neighbourhood who was superfluous, and therefore likely to be tiresome. One can always leave her out of a dinner invitation, said one woman, thoughtfully. It will be quite enough to ask Mr. and Mrs. Oh, quite. Thus it was settled. Meanwhile, Diana, happily unconscious of any discussion concerning her, went on the even tenor of her way, keeping house for her parents, reading her favourite authors, studying her scientific subjects, and working at her tapestry without any real companionship, save that of books and her own thoughts, 
and the constant delight she had in the profusion of flowers with which the gardens of Rose Lee abounded. These she arranged with exquisite taste and effect in the various rooms, so artistically that on one occasion the vicar of the parish, quite a dull, unimaginative man, was moved, during an afternoon call, to compliment Mrs. Polydor May on the remarkable grace with which some branches of roses were grouped in a vase on the table. Mrs. May looked at them sleepily and smiled. Very pretty, yes, she murmured. I used to arrange every flower myself, but now my daughter Diana does it for me. You see, she can give her time to it. She has nothing else to do. The vicar smiled the usual smile of polite agreement to everything which always gives a touch of sickliness to the most open countenance, and said no more. Diana was not present, so she did not hear that her mother considered she had nothing else to do but arrange flowers. Even if she had heard it, she would hardly have contradicted it. It was one of those things which she would not have thought worth while arguing about. The fact that she governed all the domestic working of the house, so that it ran like a perfectly going machine on silent and well-oiled wheels, required no emphasis, at least not in her opinion. And though she knew that not one of the servants would have stayed in Mrs. May's service or put up with her vague, fussy and often sulky disposition, unless she, Diana, had managed them. She took no credit to herself for the comfortable and well-ordered condition of things under which her selfish old parents enjoyed their existence. That she had nothing else to do but arrange flowers was a sort of house tradition with Pa and Ma, through which they found all manner of excuse for saddling her with as much work as they could possibly give her in the way of constant attendance on themselves. But she did not mind. She was obsessed by the duty fetish, which too often makes prisoners and slaves of those who should be free. Like all virtues, devotion to duty can become a vice if carried to excess, and it is unquestionably a vice when it binds unselfish souls to unworthy and tyrannical taskmasters. The summer moved on in shining weeks of sunlight and still air, and Rose Lee lost nothing of its charm for Diana, despite the taint of the commonplace with which the eating and sleeping silkworm lives of her parents invested it. Now and then a few visitors came from London, men and women of the usual dull type, bringing no entertainment in themselves, and whose stay only meant a little more expenditure and a more lavish display of food. One or two portly club friends of James Polydor came to play golf and drink whiskey with him, and they condescended to converse with Diana at meals, because, perforce, they thought they must. But, meals being over, they gave her no further consideration, except to remark casually one to another, Pity old Polydor couldn't have got that daughter off his hands. And the long, lovely month of August was nearly at its end when an incident happened which, like the small displacement of earth that loosens an avalanche, swept away all the old order of things, giving place to a new heaven and a new earth, so far as Diana was concerned. It had been an exceedingly warm day, and nightfall was more than usually welcome after the wide glare of the long, sunlit hours. Dinner was over, and Mr. and Mrs. Polydor May, fed to repletion and stimulated by two or three glasses of excellent champagne, were resting in a dolce far niente condition, each cushioned within a deep and luxurious armchair placed on either side of the open French windows of the drawing-room. The lawn in front of them was bathed in a lovely light, 
reflected from the afterglow of the vanished sun, and a pale glimmer from the risen half-moon, which hung in soft brilliance over the eastern half of the quiet sea. Diana had left her parents to their after-dinner somnolence, and was walking alone in the garden, up and down a grass path between two rose hedges. She was within call should she be wanted by either Pa or Ma, but they were not aware of her close proximity. Mr. May was smoking an exceptionally choice cigar. He was in one of his juvenile moods, and for once was not inclined to take his usual catnap or waking doze. He had been to a tennis party that afternoon, and had worn, with a young man's fancy, a young man's flannels, happily unconscious of the weird appearance he presented in that unsuitable attire, and, encouraged by the laughter and applause of the more youthful players, who looked upon him as the comic man of the piece, he had acquitted himself tolerably well, so that, for the moment, he had cast off the dignity and weight of years, and the very air with which he smoked his cigar, flicking off the burnt ash now and again in the affected style of a young blood about town, expressed the fact that he considered himself more than a merely well-preserved man, and that if justice were done him, he would be admitted to be a violet in the youth of primy nature. His better half was not in quite such pleasant humour. She was self-complacent enough, but the heat of the day had caused her to feel stouter and more unwieldy than usual, and inclined to wish, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw and dissolve itself into a dew. When her husband lit his cigar, she had closed her eyes, thinking, now there will be a little peace. Knowing that a good cigar to an irritable man is like the bottle to a screaming baby. But Mr. May was disposed to talk, just as he was disposed to admire the contour of his little finger whenever he drew his cigar from his mouth or put it back again. There were some smart girls playing tennis today, he presently remarked. One of them I thought very pretty. She was about seventeen. His wife yawned expansively. She made no comment. She was my partner, went on Mr. May, as skittish as you please. Mrs. May cuddled herself together among her cushions. The slightest glimmer of a smile lifted the corners of her pursy mouth towards her parsimonious nose. Her husband essayed once more the fascinating flick of burnt ash from his cigar. They'd have been as dull as a sermon at tea-time if it hadn't been for me, he resumed. You see, I kept the ball rolling. Naturally, it's tennis murmured his wife, drowsily. Don't be a fool, Margaret. I mean, I keep people amused. I'm sure you do. His Margaret agreed, as she smothered another yawn. You're the most amusing man I know. Glad you admit it, he said captiously. Not being amusing yourself, you ought to thank God you've got an amusing husband. This time Mrs. May emitted a bleating giggle. <laughs> I do. Now, if it were not for Diana... His wife opened her eyes. What about Diana? Well... Diana, put it how you like, but she's Diana. She'll never be anything else. Our daughter, oh, yes, I know all that. Her hangs sentiment. Everybody calls her an old maid, and 
She's in the way. A light-footed figure pacing up and down the grass walk, unseen between the two rose hedges close by, came to a sudden pause, listening. She's in the way, repeated Mr. May with somewhat louder emphasis. Unmarried women of a certain age always are, you know. You can't class them with young people, and they don't like being parcelled off with old folks. They're out of it altogether, unless they've got something to do which takes them away from their homes, and saves them from becoming a social nuisance. They're superfluous. How is your daughter? The women here ask me, with a kind of pitying smile, as though she had the plague or was recovering from smallpox. To be a spinster over thirty seems to them a kind of illness. Well, it's an illness that cannot be cured with Diana now, sighed Mrs. May. Quite hopeless. Quite and her husband gave his chronic snort of ill-tempered defiance. It's a most unfortunate thing, especially for me. You see, when I go about with a daughter like Diana, it makes me seem so old. And me, she interposed. You talk only of yourself. Don't forget me. Mr. May laughed, a short, sardonic laugh. Oh, you, my dear Margaret, I don't wish to be unkind, but really, you needn't worry yourself on that score. Surely you don't suppose you'll ever look... Young again? Think of your size, Margaret. Think of your size. Somewhat roused from her customary inertia by this remark, Mrs. May pulled herself up in her chair with an assumption of dignity. You are very coarse, James, she said. Very coarse, indeed. I consider that I look as young as you do. Any day. I ought to, for you are fully eight years my senior. I dare say more, for I doubt if you gave your true age when I married you. You want to play the young man, and you only make yourself ridiculous. I have no wish to play the young woman, but certainly Diana, with her poor, thin face, getting so many wrinkles too, does make me seem older than I am. She has aged terribly the last three or four years. She'll never see forty again, said Mr. May tersely. Mrs. May rolled up her eyes in pained protest. Why say it? she expostulated. You only give yourself and me away. We are her parents. I don't say it in public, he replied. Catch me. But it's true. Let me see. Why, Diana was born in... His wife gave an angry gesture. Never mind when she was born, she said, with a tremble as of tears in her voice. You needn't recall it. Our only child, and she has spoiled her life and mine, too. A faint whimper escaped her, and she put a filmy handkerchief to her eyes. Mr. May took no notice. For women's tears he had a sovereign contempt. The fact is, he said judicially, we ought to have trained her to do something useful. 
nursing or doctoring or dressmaking or typewriting she would have had her business to attend to which would have kept her away from us and i uh, we could have gone about free as air we need never have mentioned that we had a daughter mrs may looked scrutinizingly at her lace handkerchief she remembered it had cost a couple of guineas and now there was a hole in it she must tell diana to mend it with this thought uppermost in her always chaotic mind she said between two long-drawn sighs after all james poor diana does her best she is very useful in the house stuff and nonsense she does nothing at all she spoils the servants if that is what you mean allows them to have their own way a great deal too much in my opinion it amuses her to play at housekeeping she doesn't play at it remonstrated mrs may weakly endeavouring to espouse the cause of justice she is very earnest and painstaking about it and does it very well she keeps down expenses and saves me a great deal of worry <laughs> growled her husband it would do you good to be worried a bit take down your weight of course what can't be cured must be endured but i've spoken the brutal truth diana at her age and with her looks and all her chances of marriage gone is in the way for instance suppose i go to a new neighbour's house and i'm asked have you any family i reply yes one daughter then some fool of a woman says oh do bring your girl with you next time well she's not a girl i don't wish to say she's not but if i do take her with me next time everybody is surprised you see when they look at me they expect my daughter to be quite a young person mrs may sank gradually back in her chair as though she were slowly pushed by an invisible finger do they the query was almost inaudible of course they do and upon my soul it's rather trying to a man you ought to sympathise but you don't well i really can't see what's to be done she murmured closing her eyes in sheer weariness diana cannot help getting older poor thing and she's our child don't i know she's our child he snapped out what do you keep on telling me that for why i mean that you can't turn her out of the house or say you don't want her or anything of that sort but i'm sure here the round pale eyes opened appealingly over the buff-coloured cheeks i'm sure james that if you don't wish to take her out with you she'd never dream of expecting you to do so she's very unselfish besides she's so happy with her books 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 hang books he exclaimed irascibly there's another drawback if there's one thing people object to more than another it's a bookish spinster any assumption of knowledge in a woman is quite enough to keep her out of society his wife yawned i dare say she admitted but i can't help it you want to go to sleep that's what you want 
said Mr. May, contemptuously. Well, sleep. I'm going over to the club. She murmured an inward, Thank God, and settled down in her chair to her deferred and much-desired doze. Mr. May threw on his cap, one of a jaunty shape, which he fondly imagined gave him the look of a dashing sportsman of some thirty summers, and stepped out on to the now fully moonlit lawn, crossing it at as swinging a pace as his little legs would allow him, and making for the high road just outside the garden gates. Not till he had disappeared did the figure which had stayed statuesquely still between the two rose hedges show any sign of movement. Then it stirred, its dark grey drapery swaying like mist in a light wind. The bright moonlight fell on its uplifted face. Diana's face, pale always, but paler than ever in that ghostly radiance from the skies. She had heard all, and there was a curious sense of tightening pain in her throat and round her heart, as if an overflow of tears or laughter struggled against repression. She had stood in such a motionless attitude of strained attention that her limbs felt cramped and stiff, so that when she began to walk it was almost with difficulty. She turned her back to the house and went towards the sea, noiselessly opening the little white gate that led to the shore. She was soon on the smooth, soft sand where the little wet pools glittered like silver in the moon, and, going to the edge of the sea, she stood a while, watching wave after wave glide up in small, fine lines and break at her feet in a delicate fringe of snowy foam. She was not conscious of any particularly keen grief or hurt feeling at the verdict of her general tiresomeness which her parents had passed upon her. Her thoughts were not in any way troubled. She only felt that the last thing she had clung to as giving value to life, her affection and duty towards the old people, was counted as valueless. She was merely in the way. Watching the waves, she smiled, a pitiful little smile. Poor old dears, she said tenderly, and again, poor old dears. Then there arose within her another impulse, a suggestion almost wildly beautiful, the idea of freedom. No one wanted her, not even her father or her mother. Then was she not at liberty? Could she not go where she liked? Surely, just as a light globe of thistledown is blown by the wind to fall where it will, so she could drift with the movement of casual things anywhere, so long as she troubled nobody by her existence. The world is wide, she said half aloud, stretching her arms with an unconscious gesture of appeal towards the sea. I have stayed too long in one small corner of it. The little waves plashed one upon the other with a musical whisper, as though they agreed with her thought. And yet, yet there was something appalling in the utter loneliness of her heart. No one loved her. No one wanted her. She was in the way. Smarting tears filled her eyes but they angered her by their confession of weakness, and she dashed them away with a quick, defiant hand. She began to consider her position coldly and critically. Her thoughts soon ranged themselves in order like obedient soldiers at drill under their commanding officer, each in its place and ready for action. 
it was useless to expect help or sympathy from any one. She would not get it. She must stand alone. It is perhaps a little hard and difficult to stand alone when one is a woman. It used to be considered cruel and pitiful, but in these days it has become such a matter of course that no one thinks about it or cares. The nature and temperament of woman as God made her have not altered. With all her advancement, she is just as amative, as credulous, as tender, as maternal, as ever she was longing for man's love as her right, which it is, and becoming hardened and embittered when this right is withheld from her. But the rush of the time is too swift and precipitous for any display of masculine chivalry on her behalf. She has elected to be considered co-equal with man, and she is now, after a considerable tussle, to be given her chance. What she will make of the long-deferred privilege remains a matter of conjecture. Slowly, and with a vague reluctance, Diana turned away from the moonlit sea. The murmur of the little waves followed her, like suggestive whispers. A curious change had taken place in her mentality during the last few minutes. She, who was accustomed to think only of others, now thought closely and consistently of herself. She moved quietly towards the house, gliding like a grey ghost across the lawn which showed almost white in the spreading radiance of the moon. The drawing-room windows were still open, and Mrs. May was still comfortably ensconced in her armchair, sleeping soundly and snoring hideously. Her daughter came up and stood beside her, quite unobserved. Nothing could have been more unlovely than the aspect she presented, sunk among the cushions, a mere adipose heap, with her fat cheeks, small nose, and open mouth protruding above the folds of a grey woollen shawl which was her favourite evening wear, her resemblance to a pig being more striking than pleasing. But Diana's watching face expressed nothing but the gentlest solicitude. Poor mother, she sighed to herself. She's tired, and, and, of course, it's natural she should be disappointed in me. I've not been a success. Poor dear mother. God bless her. She went out of the room noiselessly and made her way upstairs. She met Grace Laurie. I'm going to bed, Grace, she said. I've got a tiresome headache and shall be better lying down. If mother wants to know where I am, will you tell her? Yes, miss. Can I do anything for you? Grace asked, for, as she often said afterwards, she... Thought Miss Diana looked a bit feverish. No, thanks very much. Diana answered in her sweet-voiced, pleasant manner. Bed is the best place for me. Good night. Good night, miss. And Diana, entering her own room, locked the door. She was eager to be alone. Her window was open, and she went to that and looked out. All was silent and calm. The night was beautiful. The sea spread itself out in gently heaving stretches of mingled light and shade, and above it bent a sky in which the moon's increasing splendour swamped the sparkling of the stars. The air was very still. Not a leaf on any small branch of tree or plant stirred. The scent of roses and sweetbriar and honeysuckle floated upwards like incense from the flower altars of the earth. I am free, murmured Diana to the hushed night. Free. 
and then, turning, she saw herself in the mirror, as she had already seen herself that day, only with a greater sense of shock. The evening gown she wore, chosen to please her father's taste, of dull, dowdy grey chiffon, intensified her worn and ageing look. The colour of her hair was deadened by contrast with it, and in very truth she had at that moment a sad and deplorably jaded aspect. Free, she repeated in half scorn, and what is the use of freedom to me at my age, and with my face and figure? She shrank from her own pitiful double in the glass. It seemed asking her why she was ever born. Then she put away all doleful thoughts that might weaken her or shake her already formed resolution. Nothing venture, nothing have, she said. And, shutting her window, she drew the blinds and curtains close, so that no glimpse of light from her room might be seen by her father when he should cross the lawn on his return from the club. She had plenty to do, and she began to do it. She had a clear plan in view, and as she said to herself, a trifle bitterly, she was old enough to carry it out. And when all her preparations were fully made and completed, she went to bed and slept peacefully till the first break of dawn. End of chapter 3「Four of the Young Diana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter Four. When morning came, it brought with it intense heat and an almost overpowering glare of sunshine, and Mr. James Polydor May, stimulated by the warm atmosphere, went down to breakfast in a suit of white flannels. Why not? A sportive and youthful spirit had entered into him with his yesterday's experience of tennis, and his, skittish as you please, partner of seventeen, and, walking with a jaunty step, he felt that there was, and could be, no objection to the wearing of white, as far as he was concerned. But, had he not said on the previous day to his daughter, Only very young people should wear white. Ah, yes, his daughter, as a woman, was too old for it. But he, why, if the latest scientific dictum is correct, namely, that a man is only as old as his arteries, then he, James Polydor May, was convinced that, arterially speaking, he was a mere boy. True, his figure was a little gone from its original slimness, but plenty of golf and general bracing up would soon put that all right, so that even the skittish as you please young thing might not altogether despise his attentions. Whistling gaily the charming tune of Believe me if all those endearing young charms, he contemplated the well-set-out breakfast-table with satisfaction. He was first in the field that morning, and his better half had not been at the fried bacon before him, selecting all the best bits as was her usual custom. He sat down to that toothsome dish and helped himself bountifully. Then, missing the unobtrusive hand which generally placed his cup of tea beside him, he called to the parlour maid. Where's Miss Diana? Isn't she up? Oh, yes, sir. She was up very early, about six, I believe, when she went down to the cove to bathe, so she told the kitchen maid. Not back yet? 
No, sir. Mr. May pulled out his watch and glanced at it. It was half past nine. At that moment, his wife entered the room. Oh, you're out of bed at last, he said. Well, now you can pour out my tea, and mind you don't fill the cup too full. Diana hasn't got back from her dip. Mrs. May was still rather sleepy, and, as usual, more or less inattentive to her husband's remarks. She began turning over the letters the post had just brought for her, whereat Mr. May gave a sharp rap on the table with the handle of a fork. My tea, he repeated. Do you hear? I want my tea. Mrs. May rolled her eyes at him protestingly as she lifted the teapot. I hear perfectly, she answered with an assumption of dignity. And... Please be civil. You can't bully me as you bully Diana. I bully Diana. I. <laughs> and Mr. May gave a short, scornful laugh. Come, I like that. Why, the woman doesn't know what bullying is. She's had a puff of roses all her life. Roses, I tell you. Never a care. Never a worry. No financial difficulties, always enough to eat, and a comfortable home to live in. What more can she want? Bully, indeed. If she had married that confounded officer for whom she wasted the best seven years of her life, then she'd have known something about bullying. Rather. And I dare say it'd have done her good. Better than being an old maid, anyhow. Mrs. May handed him his tea across the table. I wonder where she is, she questioned plaintively. I've never known her so late before. One out at six, said Mr. May, with his mouth full of bacon. The kitchen maid saw her go. Mrs. May rang a small handbell at her side. The parlour maid answered it. Hasn't Miss Diana come in? No, ma'am. Mrs. May rubbed her small nose perplexedly. Who saw her go out? The kitchen maid, ma'am. She was cleaning the doorstep when Miss Diana came out and said she was going for a sea bath. That was about six o'clock, ma'am. Again Mrs. May rubbed her nose. Send Grace here. Yes, am Another minute and Grace Laurie appeared. Grace, did you see Miss Diana go out this morning? No, ma'am. Last night I met her on the stairs and she said she had a headache and was going to bed early. I haven't seen her since. Good heavens, Margaret, what a fuss you're making. Here exclaimed Mr. May. One would think she'd been carried off in an aeroplane. She's probably gone for a walk after bathing and forgotten the time. That's not like Miss Diana, sir, ventured Grace respectfully. She never forgets anything. Another cup of tea, Margaret, and look sharp interposed Mr. May testily. Mrs. May sighed and poured hot water into the teapot. Then she addressed Grace in a low tone. Ask the kitchen maid just what Miss Diana said. Grace retired and returned again quickly. Miss Diana came down at about six this morning, she said, and Jenny, the kitchen maid, was the only one of us up. She was cleaning the doorstep and moved her pail for Miss Diana to pass. Miss Diana had on her navy blue serge and black straw sailor hat, and she carried what Jenny thought were her bathing things hanging over her arm. She was very bright and said, Good morning, Jenny. I'm going for a dip in the sea before the sun gets too hot. And so she went. And so she went. Amen, said Mr. May, biting a hard bit of toast noisily. And so she'll come back and wonder what all the deuced fuss is about. 
as if a woman of her age couldn't go for a bath and a walk without being inquired after as if she were a two-year-old are you going to have your breakfast margaret or do you prefer to read your letters first his wife made no reply she was watching the boiling of an egg in a small specially constructed vessel for the purpose which diana had added to the conveniences of the breakfast table she was annoyed that diana herself was not there to attend to it diana always knew when the egg was done to a turn grace still lingered in the room mrs may languidly raising her fish-like eyes saw her you can go grace yes ma'am shall i just run out to the shore and see if miss diana is coming yes and tell her to make haste back i want her to do some shopping in the village for me grace left the room closing the door behind her a clock on the mantelpiece gave several little sharp ting-tings what time is that asked mrs may ten o'clock replied her husband unfolding the day's newspaper and beginning to read dear me how very extraordinary of diana to be out from six in the morning till now and with the aid of a spoon she carefully lifted the egg she had been watching as though it were the most precious object in life out of the boiling water in mournful doubt as to whether after all it really was done perfectly it's so unlike her well you may be pretty certain no one has run away with her said mr may ironically she's safe enough the dear child has not eloped mrs may ignored both his words and his manner she looked at him meditatively over the lid of the silver teapot and permitted herself to smile a small fat pursy smile those white flannels have got rather tight for you haven't they she suggested he flushed indignantly tight certainly not do they look tight well just a little but of course white always makes one appear stout stout you talk about stoutness you why i'm a paper knife compared to you a positive paper knife i believe you actually grudge my wearing white flannels his wife laughed <laughs> indeed no she declared it amuses me i rather like it i should think you did he retorted or if you don't you ought to she surveyed him pensively with round lacklustre eyes what a long time it is she said what a long long time since you were thin really quite thin james do you remember when you proposed to me in father's dining-room and the parlour-maid came in and lit the gas just as you were going to you seem very reminiscent this morning interrupted her husband sharply do white flannels move you to sentiment oh no not at all not now <laughs> she replied with a small giggle only one cannot but think of the change between then and now it's almost humorous i should think it is he agreed it's more than humorous it's comic what do you expect when i think of what you were a nice little pink and white thing with a small waist and see you now 
Here he snorted half contemptuously. But there, we can't all remain young, and you're quite comfortable looking, a sort of pillow of ease. You might be worse. Here their mutual personal compliments were interrupted by the hurried entrance of Grace Laurie, looking pale and scared. Oh, ma'am, I'm afraid some accident has happened to Miss Diana, she said breathlessly. I've been all the way down to the cove, and, and... Here she suddenly burst out crying. Mr. May bounced up from his chair. Do you take the woman? Don't stand there grizzling. What's the matter? Speak out. Mrs. May stared feebly, her mouth opening slowly, like that of a fish on dry land. What? What is it, Grace? She stammered. You frighten me. Yes, um, I know, but I can't help it. Grace answered, gaspingly. But, but I've been down to the cove and all round in every place, and there's Miss Diana's clothes all put together on the rocks, and her shoes and hat and bathing towel, but, but there's no Miss Diana. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sure she's drowned. Oh, Miss Diana, poor thing, I'm sure she's drowned. She's been carried off her feet by the waves. There was a high tide this morning, and I know she's drowned. She's drowned, she's drowned. Her voice rose to a high, shrill pitch, and she wrung her hands. Mrs. May struggled weakly out of her chair, and then dropped heavily into it again. Drowned? Diana, don't be foolish, Grace. It's not possible. Mr. May seized his cap and threw it on his head. Here, I'll soon put a stop to all this nonsense, he said. Let me get down to the cove. What's the good of a parcel of silly fools of women shrieking and crying before they know what's happened? He marched up to Grace Laurie and grasped her by the shoulder. Now be calm. Can you be calm? Grace caught her breath and wriggled herself away from the nip of his fingers. Yes, sir. Well, then, repeat what you said just now. He went down to the cove and saw. Miss Diana's clothes, all put by on the rocks, just as she always puts them out of the way when she's going to bathe, said Grace. And her bathing towel, that hasn't been used, and her shoes and stockings, but Miss Diana's gone. Oh dear, oh dear, moaned Mrs. May. What dreadful, dreadful things you are saying. What are we to do? Oh, I feel so ill. My sweet Diana, my only, only precious child. Oh, James, James. And with her face suddenly working up into all sorts of lines and creases, as though it were an India rubber mask pulled from behind, she began to weep slowly and tricklingly, like a tap with a stoppage in its middle. "'Be quiet!' shouted Mr. May, fiercely. "'You unnerve me with all this snivelling, and I won't be unnerved. I'm going myself to the cove. I'll soon clear up this business. I don't believe anything has happened to Diana. It's a fine morning, and she's probably enjoying a swim.' She can swim like a fish. You know she can. She couldn't drown. And with a half-suppressed oath, he trotted out, all fuss and feathers, like an angry turkey-cock, his whole mentality arrayed against fate and circumstance, resolved to show that he was stronger than either. By this time the ill news had spread, and the servants, the gardeners, and a few of the villagers went running down to the cove. 
It was true there had been a high tide that morning. There was yet the glistening trail of the loftiest wave on the rocks where the freshly tossed seaweed clung. Safe out of all possible reach of the water, and neatly piled together on a ledge of rock, were Diana's simple garments, as Grace had said, with her hat, stockings, and shoes, and the unused bathing towel. A veteran sailor had joined the group of onlookers, and now, drawing his pipe from his mouth, he asked, "'What time did the lady come down here?' Mr. May had by now lost a little of his self-assertiveness, and was feeling distinctly uncomfortable. He was not a man of sentiment, though he could often feign emotion successfully enough to deceive the very elect. But, just now, he was, as he would himself have said, very much upset. He knew that he ought to appear to his own servants and to the villagers, like a fond father distracted with anxiety and suspense, and he was aware that his dumpy figure in tight white flannels did not dress the part. He replied curtly, She was here a little before six, I'm told. Ah, poor thing, and she's been carried out of her depth, said the old salt. There's a main deal o' suction with the sea in this ear cove when the full tide comes in. She's an excellent swimmer, said Mr. May, gazing at the sea in a vaguely disappointed way, as though he thought each wave that swept slowly in ought to bring Diana riding triumphantly on top of it. Aye, aye, that may be. But swimmin were not allus save a woman what's lightweight and ain't got the muscles of a man. There's a force o' water here, sometimes as it'd sweep a cart and arse off like a bit of straw. Ay, ay, she's gone for sure, and maybe her poor body'll never come nigh. Least waves not here, it might lower down the coast. Here, Grace Laurie who was with the other servants watching, began to cry bitterly. Oh, Miss Diana, she sobbed. She was so good and kind. Oh, poor dear Miss Diana. The old sailor patted her gently on the shoulder. Now, don't you fret, don't you fret, my girl, he said. We're all swept off our feet sooner or later when the big tide comes in. Some goes first and others last, but tis all the same. Now you just pull yourself together and take the poor lady's clothes back home, and I and my mates will watch all along shore, and if we hears anything or finds anything. Mr. May coughed noisily. <coughs> 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 I am the father of the unfortunate lady, he said stiffly. I cannot yet believe or realise this, this awful business, but anything you can do will be suitably rewarded, of course. Thank ye, sir, thank ye. I makes no doubt on't. But I'll not worry ye with the owls and the wens in your sorrow, for sorrow ye must have, for all ye look so dry. What we is will let ye know, and what we finds too. And he subsided into silence, watching Grace, who, with choked sobs and tears, took up Diana's clothes as tenderly as if they were living objects. Some of the other servants wept too out of sympathy, and Johnson, the butler, approached his master with solemn deference. "'Will you take my arm, sir?' he said. Mr. May stared at him angrily. Then, remembering the circumstances, assumed a melancholy and resigned air. "'No, Johnson, 
Thank you. He answered, I will walk home alone. Then, after a pause, Hugh and Grace had better see to Mrs. May. Prepare her a little. It will be a terrible blow to her. He turned away, and as he went, the group of sightseers went also, slowly dispersing and talking about the fatality in hushed voices, as though they were afraid the sea would hear. The old sailor remained behind, smoking and watching the waves. Presently he saw something on the surface of the water that attracted his attention, and he went to the edge of the breaking surf and waited till the object was cast at his feet. It was a woman's white canvas bathing shoe. All right, t'other'll maybe come in presently, he said. Poor soul, he's washed off her feet. She's gone for sure. I'll keep this a bit, in case t'other comes. And, shaking it free from the sand and dripping water, he put it in his jacket pocket and resumed his smoky meditations. Meanwhile at Rose Lee the worst had been told. Mrs. May, weeping profusely and tottering like a sack too full to stand upright, had been put to bed in a state bordering on collapse. Mr. May occupied himself in sending off telegrams and writing letters. Two representatives of the local press called, asking for details of the shocking bathing fatality, which they secured, first from the bereaved Mr. May himself, next from the butler, then from the maid, then from the cook, and then from the kitchen maid, who had been the last to see the poor dear lady, with the result that they had a sufficiently garbled and highly coloured account to make an almost sensational column in their profoundly dull weekly paper. The day wore on. The house was invested with a strange silence. Diana's presence, Diana's busy feet tripping here and there on household business, might have been considered trifling things, but the fact that she was no longer in evidence created a curious, empty sense of loneliness. Mrs. May remained in bed, moaning and weeping drearily, with curtains drawn to shut out the aggressively brilliant sunshine. And Mr. May began to take a mysterious pleasure in writing the letters which told his friends in London and elsewhere of his tragic and irreparable loss. He surprised himself by the beautiful sentences he managed to compose. Our only darling child, who was so beloved and precious to us and to all who knew her, was one. I shall do my best to cheer and support my dear wife, who is quite prostrated by this awful calamity was another. You know how dear she was and how deeply cherished, was a third. Sometimes, while he was writing, a small twinge of conscience hurt the mental leather whereof he was largely composed, and he realised his own hypocrisy. He knew he was not really sorry for what had happened. And yet, memory pointed him backward with something of reproach to the day when Diana, a pretty and winsome child, with fair hair dancing about her in bright curls, had clambered on his knee and caressed his ugly face as though it were an adorable object. And to the aftertime, when as a girl in the fine bloom of early youth, she had gone with him to her first ball, sweet and fresh as the roses which adorned her simple white gown, and had charmed everyone by her grace, gentleness, and exquisite speaking voice, which, in its softly modulated tones, exercised a potent witchery on all who heard it. 
True, she had missed all her chances, or rather, all her chances had somehow missed her, and she had grown not exactly old, but passé. And it was a pity she had not married. But now, now all her failures and shortcomings were forever at an end. She was drowned. The sea had wedded her and set its salty weed among her hair in place of the never-granted orange blossom. Mr. May shivered a little at this thought. After all, the sea was a cold and cruel grave for his only child. And yet no tear of human or fatherly emotion generated itself out of his dry brain to moisten his hard little eyes. He stiffened himself in his chair and resumed the writing of his letters which announced the sudden and awful bereavement which had befallen him and was charmed by the ease with which the tenderest expressions concerning his dead daughter flowed from his pen. And, after a long, sobbing, snoring sleep, Mrs. May woke up to the practical everyday points of the situation and realised that there could be no funeral. This was an awful blow. Unless, unless the poor body of the drowned woman came ashore, there could be no black procession winding its doleful way through the flowering lanes of the little Devonshire village, where it would have been picturesque to make a show of mourning. So far, the sea had cheated the undertaker. I cannot even put a wreath upon my darling's coffin she moaned, and she loved flowers. Fresh sobs and tears followed this new phase of misfortune. Mrs. May was accustomed to find balm in Gilead for the death of any friend by sending a wreath for the corpse, and her husband had been heard to say that if he died first he would be sure to have a nasty wet wreath laid on his chest before he was cold. Most of the burden and heat of the day fell on the maid, Grace Laurie, who had to take cups of soup, glasses of wine, and other strengthening refreshments to Mrs. May in her bedroom, and to see that Mr. May had everything he wanted, which is the usual rule of a house sustained by the presence of a man. She was an honest, warm-hearted girl, and was genuinely sorry for the loss of Diana, far more so than were the bereaved parents. Once, during the later afternoon, when it was verging towards sunset, she went to Diana's room and entered it half-trembling, moved by a sort of superstitious fear, lest she should, perhaps, see the spirit of its late occupant. The window was open, and a rosy glow from the sky flushed the white muslin curtains with pale pink, and gave deeper colour to a posy of flowers in a vase on the dressing-table. Everything was scrupulously tidy. The servants had made the bed early in the morning, before the fatality had become known, and the whole room had an attractive air of peaceful expectation, as though confident of its owner's return. Grace opened the wardrobe. There were all the few dresses Diana possessed, in their usual places, with two or three simple country hats. Was there anything missing? No sooner did this thought enter her head than Grace began to search feverishly. She opened drawers and boxes and cupboards, but, so far as she knew, everything was as it always appeared to be. Yet she could not be quite sure. She was not Diana's own maid, except by occasional service and favour. Her duties were, 
strictly speaking, limited to personal attendance on Mrs. May. Diana was accustomed to do everything for herself, arranging and altering her own clothes, and even making them sometimes, so that Grace never quite knew what she really had in the way of garments. But as she looked through all the things hurriedly, they seemed to be just what Diana had brought with her from Richmond for the summer, and no more. The clothes found on the seashore Grace had herself placed on one chair, all folded in a sad little heap together. She opened the small jewel box that always stood on the dressing table, and recognised everything in it, even to the wristlet watch which Diana always left behind when she went to bathe. Apparently there was nothing missing. For one moment a sudden thought had entered her head, that perhaps Diana had run away? But she as quickly realised the absurdity of such an idea. How stupid of me, she said. She had no cause to run away. She looked round once again, sadly and hopelessly, then went out and closed the door softly behind her. She felt there was a something mysterious and suggestive in that empty room. Towards dinner time, Mrs. May struggled out of bed and sat up in an armchair, swathed in a voluminous dressing gown. I cannot go down to dinner, she wailed to Grace. The very idea idea of it is terrible. Tell Mr. May I want to speak to him. Grace obeyed, and presently Mr. May came in obedience to the summons, wearing a curious expression of solemn shamefacedness, as if he had done a mean trick some time and had just been found out. His wife gazed at him with red, watery eyes. James! she said quaveringly. It's dreadful to have to remember what you said last night about poor Diana. Oh, it's dreadful. What did I say? He asked nervously. I, I forget. You said, oh dear, oh dear, I hope God may forgive you. You said Diana was in the way. You did. Our child. Oh, James, James. Your words haunt me. You said she was in the way. And now she has been taken from us. Oh, what a punishment for your wicked words. And you a father. Oh, how shall we ever get over it? Mr. Polydor May sat down by his wife's chair and looked foolish. He knew he ought to say that it was indeed a dreadful thing, and that of course they could never get over it. But all the time he was perfectly aware that the getting over it would be an easy matter for them both. He had even already imagined it possible to secure a young and pretty companion housekeeper, to assist Mrs. May in the cares of domestic management, and, when required, to wait upon James Polydor himself with all that deferential docility which should be easy to command for a suitable salary. That would be one way of getting over it, quite pleasantly. But in reply to his wife's melancholy adjuration, he judged it wisest to be silent. She went on, drearily. Fortunately, I have one black dress. It belonged to my poor sister's set of mourning for her husband. But as she married again and went to Australia within the year, it's really as good as new, and she sold it to me for a pound. And Grace can alter my bonnet. It's black, but it has a pink flower. I must get a crepe poppy instead, and black gloves. 
Oh, James, and you wore white flannels this morning. I'm glad you've had the decency to change them. Mr. May had certainly changed them, partly out of conviction that such change was necessary, and partly because Johnson, the butler, had most urgently suggested it. And he was now attired in his regulation Sunday suit, which gave him the proper appearance of a respectable J.P. in mourning. All day he had practised an air of pious resignation and reserved sadness. It was difficult to keep it up because his nature was captious and irascible, especially when things happened that were opposed to his personal convenience and comfort. His efforts to look what he was not gave him the aspect of a Methodist minister disappointed in the silver collection. But perhaps, on the whole, his wife was a greater humbug than he was. She was one of those curious but not uncommon characters who imagine themselves to be full of feeling, when truly they have no feeling at all. Nobody could gush with more lamentable pathos than she over a calamity occurring to any of her friends or acquaintances, but no trouble had ever yet lessened her appetite or deprived her of sleep. Her one aim in life was to seem all that was conventionally correct, to seem religious when she was not, to seem sorry when she was not, to seem glad when she was not, to seem kind when she was not, to seem affectionate when she was not. Her only real passions were avarice, tuft-hunting, and gluttony. These were the fundamental chords of her nature, hidden deep behind the fat, urbane mask of flesh which presented itself as a woman to the world. There are thousands like her who, unfortunately, represent a large section of the matronhood of Britain. The news of Diana's sudden and sad end soon spread among the old and new friends and neighbours of the Polydor maze, arousing languid comment here and there, such as, Poor woman, but after all there wasn't much for her in life, she was quite the old maid. Or, as at Mr. May's club, Best thing that could have happened for old Polydor, he can't trot her round any more and he'll be able to play the man about town more successfully. Nobody gave a thought to the quiet virtues of the industrious, patient, unaffected daughter who had devoted herself to the duty of caring for and attending upon her utterly selfish parents. And certainly nobody ever remembered that her spinsterhood was the result of a too lofty and faithful conception of love, or that her nature was in very truth an exceptionally sweet and gracious one, and her intelligence of a much higher order than is granted to the average female. In that particular section of human beings among whom she had lived and moved, her career was considered useless because she had failed to secure a mate and settle down to bear the burden and brunt of his passions and his will. And so, as she had never displayed any striking talent, or thrust herself forward in any capacity, or shown any marked characteristic, and as the world is overfull of women, she was merely one of the superfluous, who, not being missed, was soon forgotten. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Young Diana This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org 
The Young Diana by Marie Corelli Chapter 5 On that same eminently tragic afternoon when Mr. Polydore May found it necessary to change his white flannels so soon after putting them on, and his wife had to think seriously of a crepe poppy for her bonnet, two ladies sat in the charmingly arranged drawing-room of a particularly charming flat in Mayfair, enjoying their afternoon tea. One was a graceful little woman arrayed in a captivating tea-gown. The other, a thin, rather worn-looking creature with a pale face and bright hair tucked closely away under a not very becoming felt hat, garbed in a severely plain costume of dark navy serge. The butterfly person in the tea-gown was Miss Sophie Lansing, a noted suffragette, and the authoress of a brilliantly witty satire entitled Adam and His Apple, which, it was rumoured, had made even the Dean of St. Paul's laugh. The tired-featured woman with the air of an intellectual governess out of place was no other than the victim of the morning's disastrous death by drowning. Diana May. Dead in Devonshire, she was alive in London, and her friend, Sophie Lansing, was sitting beside her, clasping her hands in a flutter of delight, surprise, and amusement all commingled. You dear! she exclaimed. How ever did you manage to get away? I never was so astonished, or so pleased. When I got your note by express messenger, I could hardly believe my eyes. What time did you arrive in town? About midday, replied Diana. I felt comfortably drowned by that time, and I lunched at the stores. Drowned? cried Sophie. My dear, what do you mean? Diana released her hands from her friend's eager grasp and took off her hat. There was a gleam of whimsical humour in her eyes. One moment, and I'll explain everything, she said. But, first of all, let me tell you why I sent you a message in advance, instead of coming to you direct. It's because I'm obliged for the present to be like a travelling royalty, in cog. Your servants must not know my real name. To them, and to everybody else who sees me here, I'm Miss Graham, not Miss May. Miss May is dead. As Peggotty says in David Copperfield, she's drowned dead. Drowned dead this very morning. <laughs> she laughed. Sophie Lansing looked as she felt, utterly bewildered. You are a positive enigma, Diana, she said. Of course, when I got your note, I understood you had some reason or other for wishing to be incog, and I told my maids that I expected a friend to stay with me, a Miss Graham, and that she would come this afternoon. So that's all right, but about the drowning business. You'll see it mentioned, no doubt, in the papers tomorrow, said Diana. Under various headings, bathing fatality, or sad end of a lady. And you'll probably get a black-bordered letter from Ma, or Pa, or both. Diana! exclaimed Sophie vehemently. You are too provoking. Tell me all about it, straight. There's not so very much to tell, answered Diana in her sweet, mellow accents, thrilled at the moment by a note of sadness. Only that last night I had the final disillusion of my life. I found that my father and mother did not really love me. Love you? interrupted Sophie, heatedly. You dear goose, there's no such thing as love in their composition. Maybe not, said Diana. But if there is, they've none to spare for me. You see, dear Sophie, it's all the fault of my silly conceit. I really thought I was useful, even necessary to the old people, and that they cared for me. But when I heard my father say most emphatically that I was in the way, 
and my mother rather agreed to that, I made up my mind to relieve them of my presence, which I have done, forever. Forever? echoed Sophie. My poor dear Diana. No, I'm not a poor dear Diana, she answered, smiling. I'm a dead and gone Diana. You will see me in the leading obituary columns of the newspapers tomorrow. But how? The how and the when and the why are thus. And Diana played with the silken tassels of the girdle which belted in the dainty chiffon and lace of her friend's tea-gown. This very morning, as ever was, I went for my usual morning dip in the sea, at a cove, not a quarter of a mile away from the house. I knew that at a certain hour there would be a high tide, which, of course, on any other day I would have avoided. I went to the spot, dressed in two of everything. Two of everything? Sophie murmured bewilderedly. Yes, you pretty little thick-head. Two of everything. Don't you see? Being as thin as a clothes prop, that was easy for me. Two combis, two chemises, two petticoats, two serge gowns. Having no figure, I wear no corsets, so I didn't have two of those. Two pairs of knickers, two pairs of stockings, one pair of shoes on, another pair off and carried secretly under my bathing gown along with my felt hat as to start with i wore a black straw one then when i got to the cove i disrobed myself of one set of garments and put them with my straw hat and one pair of shoes all in an orderly heap on a rock out of the way of the water as any sensible person preparing to bathe would do then i waited for the high tide it came swiftly and surely and soon filled the cove Big waves came with it, rolling in with a splendid dash and roar, and at the proper psychological moment, I threw in all my bathing things, as far out to sea as I could from the summit of the rock where I stood. I saw them whirled round and round in the whelming flood. In the whelming flood, Sophie, where my dear Pa and Ma believe I also have been whelmed. Then when they had nearly disappeared in the hollow of a receding mass of water, I put on my felt hat, and, completely clothed in my one set of decent garments, I quietly walked away. Walked away? Where to? Not to the nearest railway station, you may be sure, replied Diana. I might have been known there and traced. I'm a good walker, and it was quite early only a little after seven, so I struck across some fields and went inland for about six or eight miles. Then I came upon a little out-of-the-way station, connected with a branch line to London. Happily a train was just due and I took it. I had saved five pounds on the housekeeping last month. I had intended to give them back to my mother, but, considering everything, I felt I might take that small sum for myself without so much as a prick of conscience. So that's my story, and here I am. And here you'll stay, said Sophie eagerly. Not a soul shall know who you are. I'll stay for two or three days, but not longer, said Diana. I want to get abroad as quickly as possible and I'm afraid I shall have to ask you to lend me a little money. I'll lend or give you anything you want, interrupted Sophie quickly. Surely you know that? Surely I know that you are one of the kindest-hearted little women in the world, said Diana. And your wealthy old bachelor uncle never did a wiser thing than when he left you two thousand a year. Why you remain single, I can never understand. That's because you are a sentimental goose, declared Sophie. If you were worldly wise, you would see that it's just that two thousand that does it. The men who propose to me, and there are a good few of them, want the two thousand first, and me afterwards. 
or rather let us say some of them would be glad of the two thousand without me altogether all the nonsense in poetry books about love and dove and sigh and die and moon and spoon doesn't count i've lived till i'm thirty-five and i've never met a man yet who is worth a trickle of a tear they are all sensualists and money-grubbers polygamous as monkeys and the only thing to be done with them is to make them work to keep the world going though even that seems little use sometimes sophy dear are you becoming a pessimist asked diana half smiling surely it is a beautiful world yes it's beautiful in a natural way but the artificiality of human life in it is depressing and disgusting don't let us talk of it tell me why you are going abroad what are your plans diana took a neat leather case from her pocket and drew out of it a folded slip of paper you sent me that she said that advertisement she exclaimed the man who wants any woman alone in the world without claims on her time or her affections oh diana you don't mean it you're not really going on such a wild goose chase what harm can it do said diana quietly i'm old enough to take care of myself and i fulfil all the requirements i am a woman of mature years i am courageous and determined and i have a fair knowledge of modern science i am well educated especially in languages and literature thanks to my solitary studies and as i've nothing to look forward to in the world i'm not afraid to take risks it really seems the very sort of thing for me at any rate i can but go and present myself as suggested personally and alone to this dr demetrius at geneva and if he turns out an impostor well geneva isn't the worst of places and i'm sure i could find something to do as a teacher of music or a companion housekeeper in any case i'm determined to go there and investigate things for myself and whatever money you are good enough to lend me dear sophy be sure i'll never rest till i pay you back every penny sophy threw an embracing arm round her and kissed her if you never paid me back a farthing i shouldn't mind she said laughing here di i'm not one of those friends who measure love by money money and the passion for acquiring it make more than half the hypocrisy cruelty and selfishness of the age but all the same i'm not quite sure that i approve of this plan of yours my dear sophy why should you disapprove just think of it here am i past forty without any attraction whatsoever no looks no fortune and nothing to look forward to in life except perhaps the chance of travel and adventure i'm fond of studies in modern science and i believe i've read every book of note on all the new discoveries and here's a man who plainly announces in his advertisement that he needs the assistance of a woman like me there can be no harm done by my going to see him very likely by the time i get to geneva he'll be what the servants call suited then i'll try something else for now as long as i live i'm alone in the world and must stand on my own do you mean to say that you'll never go back to the old folks asked sophy how can i when i'm dead laughed diana no no it would be too awful for them to see me turning up again just when i had ceased to be in the way sophy frowned selfish old brutes she said diana demurred no don't say that she expostulated you must bear in mind that i've been a terrible disappointment to them they wanted me to marry well for money rather than love and when i wasted my youth for love's sake of course they were angry they thought me a fool and really so i was i don't think there can be anything more foolish than to sacrifice the best part of one's life for any man he is never worth it 
He never understands or appreciates it. To him women are all alike, one as good or as bad as t'other. The mistake we make is when we fail to treat him as he treats us. He is a creature who from very babyhood upwards should be whipped rather than spoiled. That is why he is frequently more faithful to his mistress than his wife. He's afraid of the one, but he can bully the other. Sophie clapped her hands. Well said, Di. You begin to agree with me at last. Once upon a time you were all for believing in the chivalrous thought and tenderness of men. I wanted to believe, interrupted Diana with a half smile. I can't honestly say I did. No one can who studies life ever so superficially, declared Sophie. Particularly the ordinary matrimonial life. A man selects a woman entirely for selfish purposes. She may be beautiful and he wishes to possess her beauty. Or rich and he wants the use of her money. Or well-connected and he seeks to push himself through her relations. Or a good cook and housekeeper and he wants his appetite well catered for. As for children, well, sometimes he wants them, and more often he doesn't. I remember what an awful fuss there was in the house of an unfortunate friend of mine who had twins. Her husband was furious. When he was told of the interesting event, he used the most unedifying language. Two more mouths to feed. He groaned, Good God, what a visitation! From the way he went on, you'd have thought that he had had no share at all in the business. He didn't mind hurting his wife's feelings or saying hard things to her. Not he. And it's the same story everywhere you go. A few months of delightful courtship, then marriage, then incessant routine of housekeeping, illness, and childbearing, and afterwards, when the children grow up, the long, dull days of resigned monotony, toothlessness, which is only partially remedied by modern dentistry, and an end of everything vital or pleasurable. Except, of course, unless you kick over the traces and become a fast matron, with your weather eye open on all men. But that kind of woman is always such bad form. Marriage is not worth the trouble it brings. Even children are not unmixed blessings. I've never seen any I could not do without. In fact... <laughs> and she laughed. A bachelor woman with two thousand a year doesn't want a man to help her spend it. Quite true, said Diana with a slight sigh. But I haven't got two thousand a year or anything a year at all. Never mind. And Sophie looked wisely confident. You'll have all you want and more, yes. Something tells me you are going to make a great success. Sophie, Sophie, in what? Oh, I don't know. And the vivacious little lady jumped up from her chair and shook out her filmy skirts and floating ribbons. But I feel it. It is one of those waves. What do you call them? Etheric vibrations. Yes, that's it. Don't you feel those sort of things ever? Diana had also risen, and as she stood upright, very still, there was a curious look in her face of expectancy and wonder. Yes, she answered slowly. I felt one just now. Sophie laughed merrily. Of course, I imparted it to you, and you're going to be a wonderful creature, I'm sure of it. Your poor brain, so long atrophied by the domestic considerations of Pa and Ma, is about to expand, to breathe, to move, to act. Yes, Diana, think of it. Cinderella shall go to the prince's ball. <laughs> Her bright laughter pealed out again, and Diana laughed too. Come and see your room, went on Sophie. You're here at any rate for a day or two, and I'll keep you as secretly and preciously as a saint in a shrine. You've no luggage? Of course, I forgot. I'll lend you a nightie, and you must buy a lot of clothes tomorrow and a box to pack them in. It won't do for you to go abroad without any luggage, and I'll help you choose your garments, Di. 
you must have something really becoming, something not after the taste of pa or ma. Am I to make a conquest of Dr. Feodor Demetrius? asked Diana, playfully. One would think you had that sort of thing in view. One never knows, said Sophie, shaking a warning finger at her. Dr. Demetrius may be hideous, or he may be fascinating, and whether hideous or fascinating, he may be amorous. Most men are at moments, and in such moments they'll make love to anything feminine. Not anything feminine of my age, said Diana, calmly. He distinctly advertises for a woman of mature years. That may be his cunning, and Sophie looked mysterious. If we are to believe history, Cleopatra was fifty when she enchanted Antony. Dear old Egyptian days, sighed Diana, with a whimsical uplifting of her eyebrows. Would I had lived in them, with a long plaited black wig and darkened lashes, I, too, might have found an Antony. Well, dress does make a difference, said Sophie seriously. That is, of course, if you know where to get it made, and how to put it on and don't bundle it round you in a gathered balloon, like Ma. What a sight that woman does look, to be sure. Poor mother, I tried to make her clothes sit on her, murmured Diana regretfully. But they wouldn't. Of course they wouldn't. They simply couldn't. Now take Mrs. Ross Percival, a real old, old harridan, the terror of her grown-up daughters, who are always watching her lest a wig of young curls should come off. She gets herself up in such a style that I once heard your father, an easily duped old thing, say he thought her the most beautiful woman in London. And it was all the dress, with a big hat, cosmetics, and a complexion veil. Diana laughed. <laughs> Pa's a very susceptible little man, she said tolerantly. He has often amused me very much with his amorettes. Sometimes it's Mrs. Ross Percival. Then he becomes suddenly violently juvenile and pays his devoirs to a girl of seventeen. I think he'd die straight off if he couldn't believe himself still capable of conquering all hearts. And he'll be able to get on in that line much better now that I'm drowned. I was in the way. Silly old noodle said Sophie. He'd better not come near me. I should tell him a few plain truths of himself which he would not like. Oh, he wouldn't mind, Diana assured her. To begin with, he wouldn't listen, and if he did, he would grin that funny little grin of his and say you were overwrought. That's his great word. You can make no impression on Pa if he doesn't want to be impressed. He has absolutely no feelings. I mean real feelings. He has only just impulses of anger or pleasure such as an animal has, and he doesn't attempt to control either. They had by this time left the drawing room, and were standing together in a charming little bedroom, furnished all in white and rose colour. This is my visitor's room said Sophie. And you can occupy it as long as you like, and I'll bring you one of my Paris tea gowns to slip on for dinner. It's lovely, and you'll look sweet. Diana smiled. I? Dear Sophie, you expect miracles. But Sophie was not so far wrong. That evening, Diana, arrayed in a gracefully flowing garment of cunningly interwoven soft shades, varying from the hue of Neapolitan violets to palest turquoise, and wearing her really beautiful, bright hair artistically coiled on the top of her well-shaped head, was a very different-looking Diana to the weary, worn and angular woman in severely cut navy serge who had presented the appearance of an out-of-place governess but a few hours before. If she could not be called young or beautiful, she was distinctly attractive, 
and Sophie Lansing was delighted. "'My dear, you pay for dressing,' she said enthusiastically. "'And you mark my words, you don't look mature enough for that Dr. Demetrius.' End of chapter 5「Six of the Young Diana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter Six. There are certain people who take a bland and solemn pleasure in the details of death and disaster who are glad to assume an air of what they call Christian resignation, and who delight in funerals and black-edged notepaper. Regular churchgoers are very frequently most particular about this last outward sign and token of the heart's incurable sorrow. Some choose a narrow black edge as being less obtrusive, but more subtle, others abroad as emblematic of utter hopelessness. The present writer once happened on a cynical stationer who had his own fixed ideas on this particular department of mourning, which was so closely connected with his trade. The broader the edge, the less the grief, he assured me. Just as I say of widows, the longer the veil, the sooner the second wedding, and the more wreaths there are on a hearse, the fewer the friends of the deceased. That's my experience. But no one should accept these remarks as anything but the cynical view of a small tradesman whose opinion of his clients was somewhat embittered. A letter with a black border which was neither broad nor narrow, but discreetly medium, appeared among Sophie Lansing's daily pile of correspondence the morning after Diana's arrival at her flat, and... Recognising the handwriting on the envelope, she at once selected it from the rest, and ran into her friend's room, waving it aloft triumphantly. Look! she exclaimed, from your poor afflicted pa, to announce the sad news. Diana, fresh from her bath, her hair hanging about her and the faint pink of her cheeks contrasting becomingly with the pale blue of her dressing gown, looked up rather wistfully. "'Do open it,' she said. "'I'm sure it will be a beautiful letter. Pa can express himself quite eloquently when he thinks it worth while. I remember he wrote a most charming gush of sympathy to a woman who had lost her husband suddenly. She was a titled person, and Pa worships titles. And when he had posted it, he said, Thank God that's done with. It's bad enough to write a letter of condolence at all, but when you have to express sorrow for the death of an old fool who is better out of the world than in it, it's a positive curse. <laughs> she laughed, adding, I know he isn't really sorry for my supposed death. If the real, bare, brutal truth were told, he's glad. Sophie Lansing paused in the act of opening the letter. Diana! she exclaimed in a tone of thrilling indignation. If he's such an old brute as that! Oh no, he isn't really an old brute, Diana averred gently. He's just a very ordinary sort of man. Lots of people pretend to be sorry for the deaths of their friends and relatives when they're not, and half the morning in the world is sheer hypocrisy. Pa's a bit of a coward, too. He hates the very thought of death, and when some person he has known commits this last indiscretion of dying, he forgets it as quickly as possible. I don't blame him, I'm sure. Everyone can't feel deeply. Some people can't feel at all. Here Sophie opened the letter and glanced at it. Presently, she looked up. "'Shall I read it to you?' she asked. Diana nodded. With a small, preparatory cough, which sounded rather like a suppressed giggle, 
Sophie thereupon read the following effusion. <laughs> Dear Miss Lansing, I hardly know how to break to you the news of the sudden and awful tragedy which has wrecked the happiness of our lives. Our beloved only child, our darling daughter Diana, is no more. I am aware what a shock this will be to your feelings, for you loved her as a friend, and I wish any words of mine could soften the blow. But I am too stunned myself with grief and horror to write more than just suffices to tell you of the fatal calamity. The poor child was overtaken by a high tide while bathing this morning, and was evidently carried out of her depth. For some hours I have waited and hoped against hope that perhaps, as she was a good swimmer, she might have reached some other part of the shore, but, alas, I hear from persons familiar with this coast that the swirl of water in a high tide is so strong and often so erratic that it is doubtful whether even her poor body will ever be found. A sailor has just called here with a melancholy relic, her poor little bathing shoes. He picked up one this morning soon after the accident, he says, and the other has lately been washed ashore. I cannot go on writing. My heart is too full. My poor wife is quite beside herself with sorrow. We can only place our trust in God that he will, with time, help us to find consolation for our irreparable loss. We shall not forget your affection for our darling, and shall hope to send you her little wristlet watch as a souvenir. Yours, in the deepest affliction, James Polydor May. Diana had listened with close and almost fascinated attention. "'Of course it isn't true,' she said, when the reading was finished. "'It can't be true.' "'What can't be true?' queried Sophie, puckering her well-arched eyebrows. "'All that,' and Diana waved her hand expressively. "'Pa's not a bit stunned with grief and horror.' You couldn't fancy him in such a condition if you tried. And mother is not in the least beside herself. She's probably ordering her mourning. Why, they are already parceling out my trinkets, and before I've been drowned, twenty-four hours they're thinking of sending you my wristlet watch by way of an in-memoriam. I hope they will. I should love you to have it. But people who are stunned with grief and horror, and, beside themselves, are not able to make all these little arrangements so quickly. Ah, Sophie, an hour ago I was actually fancying that perhaps I had behaved cruelly. There was a stupid, lingering sentiment in my mind that suggested the possible suffering and despair of my father and mother at having lost me. But after that letter I am reassured. I know I have done the right thing. Sophie looked at her with a smile. You are a curious creature, she said. Surely Pa expresses himself very touchingly? Too touchingly by half, answered Diana. Had he really felt the grief he professes to feel, he could not have written to you, or to any other friend, for several days about it. Perhaps, interrupted Sophie, he thought it would be in the papers, and that unless he wrote it, might be taken for someone else. He knew it would be in the papers, said Diana, and naturally wished to let his acquaintances know that he, and no other man of the name of May, is the bereaved father of the domestic melodrama. Well, and she shook back her hair over her shoulders, it's finished. I am dead, and born again, as the scripture saith, at rather a mature age. But I may yet turn out worth regenerating. Who knows? <laughs> she laughed and turned to the dressing-table to complete her toilette. Sophie put affectionate arms about her. "'You are a dear, strange, clever, lovable thing anyway,' she said. "'But really, I've had quite a sleepless night thinking about that Dr. Demetrius. He may be a secret investigator, 
or a spy, and if you go to him he may want you to do all sorts of dreadful, even criminal things. But I shouldn't do them, laughed Diana. Sophie, have you no confidence in my mental balance? I have, but some people wouldn't, Sophie replied. They would say that a woman of your age ought to know better than to leave a comfortable home where you had only the housekeeping to do, and give up the chance of an ample income at your parents' death, just to go away on a wild goose chase after new adventures, and all because you imagined you weren't loved. Oh, dear, love is only a springe to catch woodcocks, as the venerable Polonius so wisely remarks in Hamlet. I know a sneering cynic who says that women are always asking for love. Diana paused in the act of brushing out a long, bright ripple of hair. Her eyes grew sombre, almost tragic. So they are, she said. They ask for it because they know God meant them to have it. They know they were created for lover love, wife love, mother love. Just think what life means to them when cheated out of all three through the selfishness and treachery of man. Their blood gets poisoned. Their thoughts share the bitterness of their blood. They are no longer real women. They become abnormal and of no sex. They shriek with the suffragettes and put on trousers to go on the land with the men. They do anything and everything to force men's attention. Forgetting that efforts made on the masculine line completely fail in attraction for the male sex. It is the sensual and physical side of a woman that subjugates a man. Therefore, when she is past her youth, she has little or no chance, as they call it. If she happens to be brainless, she turns into a sour, grizzling, tea-drinking non-entity, and talks nothing but scandal and diseases. If she is intellectually brilliant, well, sometimes she rounds on the dogs that have bayed her into solitude, and, like a wounded animal, springs to her revenge. The words came impetuously from her lips, uttered in that thrillingly sweet voice which was her special gift and charm. Sophie's bright eyes opened in sheer astonishment. Why, Diana, she exclaimed, you talk like a tragedy queen. Diana shrugged her shoulders lightly. Do I? and she slowly resumed the brushing of her hair. There's nothing in what I say but the distinctly obvious. Love is the necessity of life to a woman, and when that fails... Diana, Diana, interrupted Sophie, shaking a warning finger at her. You talk of love as if it really were the ideal thing described by poets and romancists, when it's only the sugar paper to attract and kill the flies. We women begin life by believing in it, but every married friend of mine tells me that all the honey of the moon is finished in a couple of months, never again to be found in the patoful of matrimony. Out of a thousand men taken at random, perhaps one will really love in the best and finest sense, but the rest are only swayed by animal passion, such as is felt by the wolf, the bear, or even the rabbit. I really think the rabbit is the most exact prototype. How many wives one knows whose husbands not only neglect them, but are downright rude to them? Why, my dear, your notion of love is a dream beyond all realisation. Possibly, and Diana went on with her hair brushing. But whatever it is, or whatever I imagined it to be, I don't want it now. I want revenge. Revenge? Sophie gave a little start of surprise. You, you, always gentle, patient, and adaptable. You want revenge? On whom? On what? On all and everything that has set me apart and alone as I am, Diana answered. Perhaps science can show me a way to it. If so, I shall not have lived in vain. Diana, exclaimed her friend. One would think you were going to bring microbes in a bottle, or something awful of that kind, and kill people. Not I. <laughs> and Diana laughed quite merrily. Killing is a common thing, and vulgar. But 
I have strange dreams. She twisted up her hair dexterously and coiled it prettily round her small, compact head. Yes, I have strange dreams, she went on. In these times we are apt to forget the conquests possible to the brain. We let fools override us when we could far more easily override them. In my salad days, which lasted far too long, I asked for love. Now I ask for vengeance. I gave all my heart and soul to a man whose only God was self. And I got nothing back for my faith and truth. So I have a long score to settle. And I shall try to have some of my spent joys returned to me, with heavy interest. But how? inquired Sophie, perplexed. You don't expect to get any spent joys out of this Dr. Demetrius, do you? Diana smiled. No. And if he proves to be a charlatan, as he probably will, you say you'll go as companion or governess or housekeeper to somebody out in Geneva? Well, where are you going to find any joy in such a life as that? Diana looked at her, still smiling. My dear, I don't expect anything. Who was it that said, Blessed are they that expect nothing, for they shall not be disappointed. The chief point I have now to dwell upon is, that I am, to all intents and purposes, dead, and, being dead, I'm free, almost as free as if my spirit had really escaped from its mortal prison. Really, there's something quite vitalising in the situation. Just now I feel ready for anything. I shouldn't mind trying an airship voyage to the moon. <laughs> With Dr. Demetrius, suggested Sophie, laughing. Well, I don't know anything about Dr. Demetrius yet, answered Diana. Judging from his advertisement, I imagine he is some wealthy crank who fancies himself a scientist. There are any amount of them wandering about the world at the present time. I shall soon be able to tell whether he's a humbug or an honest man, whether he's mad or sane. Meanwhile, dear little Sophie, let's have breakfast and then go shopping. We've done with Pa and Ma. At any rate, I have, bless their dear old hearts. We know they're stunned with grief and horror, and beside themselves, and as happy in their misery as they ever were in their lives. I can see my mother getting fitted for her mourning, and Pa arguing with the hatter as to the proper width of his hat-band, and all the neighbours calling, and proffering sympathy when they don't care a scrap. It's a curious little humbug of a world, Sophie. But for the remainder of my time, I'll try to make it of use to me. Only you'll have to lend me some money to begin upon. Any amount you want, said Sophie enthusiastically. You must have proper clothes to travel in. I must, agreed Diana with humorously dramatic emphasis. I haven't had any since I was withdrawn from the matrimonial market for lack of bidders. Mother used to spend hundreds on me so long as there was any help. I had the prettiest frocks, the daintiest hats, and in these I radiated at all the various shows. Ranelagh, Hurlingham, Henley, Ascot, Goodwood. How sick I used to be of it! But when these little crow's feet round my eyes began to come, and she touched her temples expressively, then poor, disappointed Ma drew in the purse-strings. She found that very young hats didn't suit me. Delicate sky-pinks and blues made me look sallow. So she and Pa decided on giving me an allowance, too meagre to stand the cost of anything but the plainest garments, and... So here I am. Pa says only very young people should wear white. But the vain old boy got himself up in white flannels the other day to play tennis and thought he looked splendid. But what's the odds, so long as he's happy? <laughs> she laughed and turned to the mirror to complete her toilette, and in less than an hour's time 
she and sophie lansing had finished their breakfast and were out together in bond street exploring the mysteries of the newest aladdin's palace of elegant garments where the perfect taste and deft fingers of practised parisian fitters soon supplied all that was needed to suit diana's immediate requirements at one very noted establishment she slipped into a model gown of the finest navy serge of a design and cut so admirable that the couturier could hardly be said to flatter when he declared that madame looked a princess in it do princesses always look well she asked with a quaint little uplifting of her eyebrows the great french tailor waved his hands expressively ah madame it is a figure of speech diana laughed but she purchased the costume sophie whispering mysteriously in her ear let us take it with us in the automobile one never knows they might change it and you'll never get anything to suit you more perfectly miss lansing was worldly wise she had not gained the reputation of being one of the best dressed women in london without learning many little ins and outs of model gowns which are hidden from the profane many and many a time had she been taken in on this deep question many a model had she chosen leaving it to be sent home and on receipt had found it to be only a clever copy which on being tried on had proved a misfit and well she knew that complaint was useless as the tailor or modiste who supplied the goods would surely prove a veritable ananias in swearing that she had received the model and the model only on this occasion she had her way and despite the deprecating appeal of the couturier that he might be allowed to send it the becoming costume was packed and placed safely in the automobile and she and diana drove off with it you never could look better in anything declared sophie promise me you'll wear it when you make your first call on dr demetrius but my dear it may be too much for him laughed diana he wants a courageous and determined woman of mature years and so charming a paris costume may not dress the part never mind whether it does or not said sophie i can't believe he wants an old frump you may not believe me di but you look perfectly fascinating in that gown almost young again diana's blue eyes clouded with a touch of sadness she sighed a little almost not quite she answered but dress does make a difference there's no doubt of it these last few years i'm not ashamed to say i've longed for pretty clothes i suppose it's the dying spirit of youth trying to take a last caper and now with all these vanity purchases i am horribly in your debt dear sophie how shall i ever repay you don't know and don't care said sophie recklessly i'm not a grasping creditor and something tells me you are going to be very rich perhaps this man demetrius is a millionaire and wants a clever woman for his wife a sort of madame curie to help him with his experiments then i shall not suit him interrupted diana for i never intend to be wife to any man first of all i'm too old secondly if i were young again i wouldn't it isn't worth while but didn't you say you wanted to be loved queried sophie does marriage always fulfil that need counter queried diana they exchanged glances smiled shrugged shoulders and dropped the conversation two days later diana left england for geneva end of chapter six chapter seven of the young diana this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
Please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter 7. Geneva is one of those many towns in Switzerland which give the impression of neat commonplace in the midst of romance, the same impression which is conveyed by a housewife's laying out of domestic linen in the centre of a beautiful garden. The streets are clean and regular, the houses well built and characterless, sometimes breaking forth into villas of fantastic appearance and adornment, which display an entire absence of architectural knowledge or taste. The shops are filled with such trifles as are likely to appeal to tourists, but have little to offer of original production that cannot be purchased more satisfactorily elsewhere, and the watches that glitter in the chief jeweller's window on the Quai de Berbe are nothing better than one sees in the similar windows of Bond Street or Regent Street. There is nothing indeed remarkable about Geneva itself, beyond its historic associations and memories of famous men, such as Calvin and Rousseau, its chief glory is gained from its natural surroundings of blue lake and encircling chain of mountains, with Mont Blanc towering up in the distance, in a wreath of mist by the sunlight kissed and a diadem of snow. The suburbs are far more attractive than the town, for, beyond the radius of the streets and the hateful, incessant noise of the electric trams, there are many charming residences set among richly wooded grounds and brilliant parterre of flowers, where the most fastidious lover of loveliness might find satisfaction for the eyes and rest for the mind, especially on the road towards Montsalève and Mornex. Here one sees dazzling mists streaming off the slopes of the mountains, exquisite tints firing the sky at sunrise and sunset, and mirrored in the infinite blue of the lake. And even in the heats of summer, a delicious breeze blows over the fresh green fields with the cold scent of the alpine snow in its breath. And here on a fresh, beautiful autumn morning, Diana May found herself walking swiftly along with light and eager steps, her whole being alive with interested anticipation. Never had she felt so well, Health bounded in her pulse and sparkled in her eyes, and the happy sense of perfect freedom gave to every movement of her thin, supple figure that elasticity and grace which are supposed to be the special dower of extreme youth, though, as a matter of fact, youth is often ungainly in action and cumbersome in build. She had stayed two days and nights at a quiet little hotel in Geneva on arrival, in order to rest well and thoroughly after her journey from England before presenting herself at the Chateau Fragonard, the residence of the mysterious Dr. Demetrius, and she had made a few casual yet careful inquiries as to the Chateau and its owner. Nobody seemed to know more than that Monsieur le Docteur Demetrius was a rich man, and that his chateau had been built for him by a celebrated French architect who had spared neither labour nor cost. He was understood to be a scientist, very deeply absorbed in difficult matters of research. He was unmarried and lived alone with his mother. Just now he had so much to do that he was advertising in all the papers for an intellectual elderly lady, to assist him. Diana was indebted for this last personal note to a chatty bookseller in the Rue de Mont Blanc. She smiled as she listened, turning over some of the cheap fiction on his counter. He is not suited yet? she inquired. Ah, no, madame, it is not likely he will be suited. For what lady will admit herself to be sufficiently elderly? Ah, no, it is not possible. Later on, she learned that the Chateau Fragonard was situated some distance out of Geneva and well off the high road. Madame wishes to see the grounds? inquired the cheery driver of a little carriage plying for hire. 
It would be necessary to ask permission, but they are very fine. Ah, wonderful, as fine as those of Rothschild. And if one were not admitted, it is easy to take a boat and view them from the lake. The lawn slope to the water's edge. Exquisite, murmured Diana to herself. It will be worth while trying to remain in such a paradise. And she questioned the willingly communicative cocher as to how long it might take to walk to the chateau. About an hour, he replied. A pleasant walk too, madame. One sees the lake and the mountains nearly all the way. This information decided her as to her plans. She knew that the eccentric wording of the Demetrius advertisement required any applicant to present herself between six and eight in the morning, which was an ideal time for a walk in the bracing, brilliant alpine air. So she determined to go on foot the very next day, and before she parted with the friendly driver, she had ascertained the exact position of the chateau and the easiest and quickest way to get there. And now, having risen with the first peep of dawn, and attired herself in that becoming navy serge model, which her astute friend Sophie had borne triumphantly out of the French tailor's emporium, she was on her way to the scene of her proposed adventure. She walked at a light, rapid pace, the morning was bright and cool, almost cold when the wind blew downward from the mountains, and she was delightfully conscious of that wonderful exhilaration and ease given to the whole physical frame by a clear atmosphere, purified by the constant presence of ice and snow. As she moved along in happiest mood, she thought of many things. She was beginning to be amazed, as well as charmed, by the various changes which had, within a week, shaken her lately monotonous life into brilliant little patterns like those in a kaleidoscope. The web and woof of circumstance was no longer all dull grey, like the colour her father had judged most suitable for her, now that she was no longer young. Threads of rose and sky blue had found their hopeful way into the loom. Her days of housekeeping, checking tradesmen's bills, and flower arranging, seemed a very long way off. It was hardly credible to her mind that, but a short time ago, she had been responsible for the ordering of her parents' lunches and dinners, and the general management of the summer, change, at Rose Lee on the coast of Devon that fatal coast where she had been so cruelly drowned. Before leaving London, she had seen a few casual paragraphs in the newspapers concerning this disaster, headed, Bathing Fatality, Sad End of a Lady, or Drowned While Bathing. But, naturally, being a nobody, she had left no gap in society, she was only one of many needless women, and it was an altogether new and aspiring Diana May that found herself alive on this glorious morning in Switzerland, not the resigned, patient, orderly, old maid, with a taste for Jacobean embroidery and a wholesome dislike of the snap-snap-snarl humours of her father. I never seem to have been my own real self till now, she said inwardly, and now I hardly realise that I have a father and mother at all. What a tyrannical bogey I have made of my duty to them. And love is another bogey. She glanced at her watch, one of Sophie Lansing's numerous dainty trifles. Keep it in exchange, Sophie had said for yours which your bereaved parents are going to send me as an in-memoriam. It was ten minutes to seven. Looking about her to take note of her bearings, she saw on the left-hand side a deep bend in the road, which curved towards a fine gateway of wrought iron, surmounted by a curious device, representing two crossed spears 
springing from the centre of a star, and she knew she had arrived at her destination. Her heart beat a little more quickly as she approached the gateway. There was no keeper's lodge, so she pulled at a handle which dimly suggested the possibility of a bell. There was no audible response, but to all appearance the gates noiselessly unbarred themselves and slowly opened. She entered at once without hesitation, and they as slowly closed behind her. She was in the grounds of the Chateau Fragonard, Immense borders of heliotrope and full bloom fringed either side of the carriage drive where she stood, and the mere lifting of her eyes showed masses of flowering shrubs and finely grown trees, bending their shadowy branches over velvety stretches of rich green grass, or opening in leafy archways here and there, to disclose enchanting glimpses of blue water, or dazzling peaks of far-off snow. She would have been glad to linger among such lovely surroundings, for she had a keen comprehension of, and insight into, the beauty of nature, and all the joys it offers to a devout and a discerning spirit. But she bethought herself that if Dr. Demetrius was anything of an exact or punctilious person, he would expect an applicant to be rather before than after time. A silver-toned chime, striking slowly and musically on the sunlit silence, rang seven o'clock as she reached the chateau, which looked like a miniature palace of Greek design, and was surrounded by a broad white marble loggia, supported by finely fluted ionic columns, between two of which, on each side, a fountain played. But Diana had scarcely time to look at anything while quickly ascending the short flight of steps leading to the door of entrance. She saw a bell and was in haste to ring it. Her summons was answered at once by a negro servant dressed in unassuming dark livery. Dr. Demetrius? she queried. The negro touched his lips with an expressive movement, signifying that he was dumb. But he was not deaf, for he nodded an affirmative to her inquiry, and by a civil gesture invited her to enter. In another few seconds she found herself in a spacious library, a finely proportioned room, apparently running the full length of the house, with large French windows at both ends, commanding magnificent views. Left alone for several minutes, she moved about half timidly, half boldly, looking here and there at the great globes, celestial and terrestrial, which occupied one corner, at the long telescope on its stand, ready for use, and pointed out to the heavens, and especially at a curious instrument of fine steel set on a block of crystal, which swung slowly up and down incessantly striking off an infinitesimal spark of fire as it moved. Some clockwork thing, she said half aloud, but where is its mechanism? Ah, where? echoed a deep, rather pleasant voice close at her ear. That, as Hamlet remarked, is the question. She started and turned quickly with a flush of colour mounting to her brows. A man of slight build and medium height stood beside her. You are Dr. Demetrius? she said. He smiled. Even so, I am he. And you? Swiftly she glanced him over. He was not at all an alarming, weird, or extraordinary-looking personage. Young? Yes, surely young for a man. Not above forty, and very personable, if intelligent features, fine eyes, and a good figure can make a man agreeable to outward view. And yet there was something about him more than mere appearance. She could not tell what it was, and just then she had no time to consider. She rushed at once into the business of her errand. My name is May. Diana May, she said, conscious of nervousness in speaking, but mastering herself by degrees. 
I have come from England in answer to your advertisement. I am interested, very deeply interested, in matters of modern science, and I have gained some little knowledge through a good deal of personal, though quite unguided study. I am most anxious to be useful, and I am not afraid to take any risks. She broke off, a little confused under the steady scrutiny of Dr. Demetrius's eyes. He placed an easy chair by the nearest window. Pray sit down, he said, with a courteous gesture. Then, as she obeyed, You have walked here from Geneva? Yes. When did you arrive from England? Two days ago. Have you stated to anyone the object of your journey? Only to one person, an intimate woman friend who lent me the money for my travelling expenses. I see. And Demetrius smiled benevolently. You have not explained yourself or your intentions to any good Genevese hotel proprietor? She looked up in quick surprise. No, indeed. Wise woman. Here Demetrius drew up a chair opposite to her and sat down. My experience has occasionally shown me that lone ladies, arriving in a strange town and a strange hotel, throw themselves, so to speak, on the bosom of the housekeeper or the landlady, and to her impart their whole business. It is a mistake, an error of confiding innocence, but it is often made. You have not made it, and that is well. You have never married? Diana coloured, then answered with gentleness. No, I am what is called a spinster, an old maid. The first is by far the prettiest name, said Demetrius. It evokes a charming vision of olden time, when women sat at their spinning wheels, each one waiting for Faust, a la Marguerite, unaware of the devil behind him. Old maid is a coarse English term. There are coarse English terms. And, much as I adore England and the English, I entirely disapprove of their horseplay on women. No doubt you know what I mean? I think I do, replied Diana, slowly. It is that when a woman is neither a man's bound slave nor his purchased toy, she is turned into a jest. Precisely. You have expressed it perfectly. And his keen eyes flashed over her comprehensively. But let us keep to business. You are a spinster, and I presume you are, in the terms of my advertisement, alone in the world, without claims on your time or your affections. Is that so? Quietly, she answered. That is so. Now you will remember I asked for a courageous and determined woman of mature years. You do not look very mature. I am past forty, said Diana. A frank but unnecessary admission, he answered, smiling. You should never admit to more years than your appearance gives you. However, I am glad you told me, as it better suits my purpose. And you consider yourself courageous and determined? She looked at him straightly. I think I am. I hope I am, she said. I have had many disillusions and have lost all I once hoped to win, so that I can honestly say even death would not matter to me as I have nothing to live for, except the love of nature and its beauty, and its wisdom and mastery of all things, finished Demetrius, and to feel that unless we match its wisdom with our will to be instructed, and its mastery with our obedience and worship, we shall surely die. His eyes flashed upon her with a curious expression, and just for a passing moment, she felt a little afraid of him. He went on, speaking with deliberate emphasis. Yes, if you are indeed a student of nature, you surely know that. And you know also that the greatest, 
deepest, most amazing, and most enlightening discoveries made in science during the last thirty years or so are merely the result of cautious and sometimes casual probing of one or two of this vast nature's smaller cells of active intelligence. We have done something, but how much remains to do? He paused, and Diana gazed at him questioningly. He smiled as he met her eager and interested look. We shall have plenty of time to talk of these matters, he said if I decide that you can be useful to me. What languages do you know besides your own? French, Italian, and a little Russian, she answered, the first two quite fluently. Russian I have studied only quite lately, and I find it rather difficult. Being a Russian myself, I can perhaps make it easy for you said Demetrius, kindly. To study such a language without a teacher shows considerable ambition and energy on your part. She flushed a little at the mere suggestion of praise and sat silent. I presume you have quite understood, Miss May, he presently resumed, in a more formal tone, that I require the services of an assistant for one year at least, possibly two years. If I engage you, you must sign an agreement with me to that effect. Another very special point is that of confidence. Nothing that you do, see, or hear, while working under my instructions, is ever to pass your lips. You must maintain the most inviolable secrecy, and when once you are in this house, you must neither write letters nor receive them. If you are, as I suggested in my advertisement, alone in the world without any claims on your time or your affections, you will not find this a hardship. My experiments in chemistry may or may not give such results as I hope for, but while I am engaged upon them, I want no imitative bunglers attempting to get on the same line. Therefore, I will run no risks of even the smallest hint escaping as to the nature of my work. Diana bent her head in assent. I understand, she said, and I am quite willing to agree to your rules. I should only wish to write one letter, and that I can do from the hotel, just to return the money my friend lent me for my expenses and I should ask you to advance me that sum out of whatever salary you offer. Then I need give no further account of myself. Sophie, that is my friend, would write to acknowledge receipt of the money, and then our correspondence would end. This would not worry or vex you? inquired Demetrius. She smiled. I am past being vexed or worried at anything, she said. Life is just a mere going on for me now, with thankfulness to find even a moment of interest in it as I go. Demetrius rose from his chair and walked up and down, his hands clasped behind his back. She watched him in fascinated attention, with something of suspense and fear, lest, after all, he should decide against her. She noted the supple poise of his athletic figure, clad in a well-cut, easy summer suit of white flannels. His dark, compact head, carried with a certain expression of haughtiness, and last, but not least, his hands, which in their present careless attitude nevertheless expressed both power and refinement, Suddenly he wheeled sharply round and stood, facing her. I think you will do, he said, and her heart gave a quick throb of relief, which, unconsciously to herself, suffused her pale face with a flush of happiness. I think I shall find in you obedience, care, and loyalty. But there is yet an important point to consider. Do you, in your turn, think you can put up with me? 
I am very masterful, not to say obstinate. I will have no scamp work. I am often very impatient, and I can be extremely disagreeable. You must take all this well into your consideration, for I am perfectly honest with you when I say I am not easy to serve. And remember, here he drew a few steps closer to her and looked her full in the eyes, the experiments on which I am engaged are highly dangerous, and, as I stated in my advertisement, you must not be afraid to take risks, for if you agree to assist me in the testing of certain problems in chemistry, it may cost you your very life. She smiled. It's very kind of you to prepare me for all the difficulties and dangers of my way, she said, and I thank you. But I have no fear. There is really nothing to be afraid of. One can but die once. If you will take me, I'll do my faithful best to obey your instructions in every particular, and so far as is humanly possible, you shall have nothing to complain of. He still bent his eyes searchingly upon her. You have a good nerve? I think so. You must be sure of that. My laboratory is not a place for hesitation, qualms, or terrors, he said. The most amazing manifestations occur there sometimes. I have said I am not afraid, interrupted Diana, with a touch of pride. If you doubt my word, let me go. But if you are disposed to engage me, please accept me at my own valuation. He laughed and his face lightened with kindliness and humour. I like that, he said. I see you have some spirit. Good. Now, to business. I have made up my mind that you will suit me, and you have also apparently made up your mind that I shall suit you. Very well. Your salary with me will be a thousand a year, Diana uttered a little cry. A thou! A thousand a year! She ejaculated. Oh, you mean a thousand francs! No, I don't. I mean a thousand good British pounds sterling. The risks you will run in working with me are quite worth that. You will have your own suite of rooms and your own special hours of leisure for private reading and study and all your meals will be supplied, though we should like you to share them with us at our table, if you have no objection. And when you are not at work, or otherwise engaged, I should be personally very much obliged if you would be kind and companionable to my mother. Diana could scarcely speak. She was overwhelmed by what she considered the munificence and generosity of his offer. You are... Too good, she faltered. You wish to give me more than my abilities merit. I must be the best judge of that, he said, and moving to a table desk in the centre of the room, he opened a drawer and took out a paper. Will you come here and read this, and then sign it? She went to his side, and taking the paper from his hand, read it carefully through. It was an agreement, simply and briefly worded, which found her as confidential assistant and private secretary to Feodor Demetrius for the time of one year positively, with the understanding that this period should be extended to two years, if agreeable to both parties. Without a moment's hesitation, she took up a pen, dipped it in ink, and signed it in a clear and very firmly, characteristic way. A good signature, commented Demetrius. If handwriting expresses anything, you should be possessed of a strong will and a good brain. Have you ever had occasion to exercise either? Diana thought a moment, then laughed. <laughs> yes, in a policy of repression. A humorous sparkle in his eyes responded to her remark. I understand. Well now. 
and he put away the signed agreement in a drawer of his desk and locked it. You must begin to obey me at once. You will first come and have some breakfast, and I'll introduce you to my mother. Next, you will return to your hotel in Geneva, pay your bill, and remove your luggage. I can show you a shortcut back to the town, through these grounds, and by the border of the lake. By the way, how much do you owe your friend in England? About a hundred pounds. Here is an English banknote for that sum, said Demetrius, taking it from a roll of paper money in his desk. Send it to her in a registered letter, and here is an extra fifty-pound note for any immediate expenses. You will understand you have drawn this money in advance of your salary. Now, when you get to your hotel, have your luggage taken to the railway station and left in the Salle de Bagages. They will give you a number for it. Then, when all this is done, walk quietly back here by the same private path through the grounds, which you will presently become acquainted with, and I will send a man I sometimes employ from Warnex to fetch your belongings here. In this way the good gossiping folk of Geneva will be unable to state what has become of you, or where you have chosen to go. You follow me? Quite, answered Diana and I shall obey you in every particular. Good. Now come and see my mother. He showed her into an apartment situated on the other side of the entrance hall. A beautiful room, lightly and elegantly furnished, where, at a tempting-looking breakfast table, spread with snowy linen, delicate china and glittering silver, sat one of the most picturesque old ladies possible to imagine. She rose as her son and Diana entered, and advanced to meet them with a charming grace. Her tall, slight figure, snow-white hair and gentle, delicate face, lit up with the tenderest of blue eyes, making an atmosphere of attractive intelligence around her as she moved. Mother, said Demetrius, I have at last found the lady who is willing to assist me in my work. Here she is. She has come from England. Let me introduce her. Miss Diana May? Madame Demetrius. You are very welcome. And Madame Demetrius held out both hands to Diana, with an expressive kindness which went straight to the solitary woman's heart. It is indeed a relief to me to know that my son is satisfied. He has such great ideas. Such wonderful schemes. Alas, I cannot follow or comprehend them. I am not clever. You have walked from Geneva? And no breakfast. My dear, sit down. The coffee is just made. And in two or three minutes, Diana found herself chatting away at perfect ease with two of the most intelligent and companionable persons she had ever met so that the restraint under which she had suffered for years gradually relaxed, and her own natural wit and vivacity began to sparkle with a brightness it had never known since her choleric father and adipose mother had sat upon her once and for all as a matrimonial failure. Madame Demetrius encouraged her to talk, and every now and then she caught the dark, almost sombre eyes of Demetrius himself, fixed upon her musingly, so that occasionally the old familiar sense of wonder arose in her, wonder as to how all her new circumstances would arrange themselves, what her work would be, and what might result from the whole strange adventure. But when, after breakfast, she was shown the beautiful suite of apartments destined for her occupation, with windows commanding a glorious view of the lake and the Mont Blanc chain of mountains, and furnished with every imaginable comfort and luxury, she was amazed and bewildered at the extraordinary good luck which had befallen her, and said so openly, without the slightest hesitation, 
Madame Demetrius seemed amused at the frankness of her admiration and delight. This is nothing for us to do, she said kindly. You will have difficult and intricate work and much fatigue of brain. You will need repose and relaxation in your own apartments, and we have made them as comfortable as we can. There are plenty of books, as you see, and the piano is a bijou grand, very sweet in tone. Do you play? A little, Diana admitted. Play me something now. Obediently she sat down, and her fingers wandered as of themselves into a lovely prelude of Chopin's, a tangled maze of delicate tones which crossed and recrossed each other like the silken flowers of fine tapestry. The instrument she played on was delicious in touch and quality, and she became so absorbed in the pleasure of playing that she almost forgot her listeners. When she stopped, she looked up and saw Demetrius watching her. Excellent. You have a rare gift, he said. You play like an artist and thinker. She coloured with a kind of confusion. She had seldom or never been praised for any accomplishment she possessed. Madame Demetrius smiled at her with tears in her eyes. Such music takes me back to my youth, she said. All the old days of hope and promise. Ah, you will play to me often? "'Whenever you like,' answered Diana, with a thrill of tenderness in her always sweet voice. She was beginning to feel an affection for this charming and dignified old lady, who had not outlived sentiment so far as to be unmoved by the delicate sorrows of Chopin. "'You have only to ask me.' "'And now,' put in Demetrius, "'as you know where you will live,' You must go back to Geneva and get your luggage in the way I told you. We'll go together through the grounds. It's half an hour's walk, instead of nearly two hours, by the road. It did not seem like two hours this morning, said Diana. No, I dare say not. You were eager to get here, and walking in Switzerland is always more delight than fatigue. But it is actually a two hours walk. Our private way is easier and prettier. Au revoir, smiled Madame Demetrius. You, Feodor, will be in to luncheon, and you, Miss May? I give her leave of absence till the afternoon, said Demetrius. She must return in time for that English consoler of trouble, tea. <laughs> he laughed and with a light parting salute to his mother, preceded Diana by a few steps to show the way. She paused a moment, with a look half shy, half wistful, at the kindly Madame Demetrius. "'Will you try to like me?' she said softly. "'Somehow I have missed being liked, but I don't think I'm really a disagreeable person.' Madame took her gently by both hands and kissed her. "'Have courage, my dear,' she said. "'I like you already. You will be a help to my son, and I feel that you will be patient with him. That will be enough to win more than my liking, my love.' With a grateful look and smile, Diana nodded a brief adieu, and followed Demetrius, who was already in the garden waiting for her. Women must always have the last word, he said, with a good-humoured touch of irony. And even when they are enemies, they kiss. She raised her eyes frankly to his. That's true, she answered. I've seen a lot of it, but your mother and I could never be enemies. And I, well, I am grateful for even a show of liking. He looked surprised. "'Have you had so little?' he queried. "'Does not everyone care for it?' 
No, for example, I do not. I have lived too long to care. I know what love or liking generally mean, love especially. It means a certain amount of pussycat comfort for oneself. Now, though all my efforts are centred on comfort in the way of perfect health and continuous enjoyment of life for this self of ours, I do not care for the mere pussy-cat pleasure of being fondled to see if I will purr. I have no desire to be a purring animal. Diana laughed, a gay, sweet laugh that rang out as clearly and youthfully as a girl's. He gave her a quick, astonished glance. I amuse you? he inquired, with a slight touch of irritation. Yes, indeed, but don't be vexed because I laugh. You, you mustn't imagine that anybody wants to make you purr. I don't. I'd rather you growled like a bear. <laughs> she laughed again. We shall get on splendidly together. I know we shall. He walked a few paces in silence. I think you are younger than you profess to be, he said at last. I wish I were, she answered fervently. Alas, alas, it's no use wishing. I cannot go like a crab backwards, though just now I feel like a mere kiddie, ready to run all over these exquisite gardens and look at everything, and find out all the prettiest nooks and corners. What a beautiful place this is! and how fortunate I am to have found favour in your eyes. It will be perfect happiness for me just to live here. Demetrius looked pleased. I'm glad you like it, he said, and, taking a key from his pocket, he handed it to her. Here we are coming to the border of the lake, and you can go on alone. Follow the private path till you come to a gate, which this key will open. Then turn to the left, up a little winding flight of steps, under trees. This will bring you out to the high road. I suppose you know the way to your hotel, when you are once in the town? Yes, and I shall know my way back again to the chateau this afternoon, she assured him. It's kind of you to have come thus far with me. You are breaking your morning's work. He smiled. My morning's work can wait, he said. In fact, most of my work must wait, till you come. With these words he raised his hat in courteous salutation, and left her, turning back through his grounds, while she went on her way swiftly and alone. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Young Diana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter 8. Arrived at her hotel, Diana gave notice that she was leaving that afternoon. Then she packed up her one portmanteau and sent it by a porter to the station, with instructions to deposit it in the Salle des Bagages to await her there. He carried out this order, and brought the printed number entitling her to claim her belongings at her convenience. "'Madame is perhaps going to Vevey or to Montreux?' he suggested cheerfully. "'The journey is pleasanter by boat than by the train.' "'No doubt,' Yes, of course, I am quite sure it is, murmured the astute Diana with an abstracted smile, giving him a much larger tip than he expected, which caused him to snatch off his cap and stand with uncovered head, as in the presence of a queen. But I have not made up my mind where I shall go first. Perhaps to Martigny, perhaps only to Lausanne. I am travelling for my own amusement. Ah, oui, je comprends. Bonne chance, madame. 
and the porter backed reverently away from the wonderful english lady who had given him five francs when he had only hoped for one and left her to her own devices thereupon she went to her room locked the door and wrote the following letter to sophy lansing dearest sophy please find enclosed as business people say an english bank-note for a hundred pounds which i think clears me of my debt to you in the way of money though not of gratitude by my paying up so soon you will judge that i have fallen on my feet and that i have accepted service under dr demetrius what is more and what will please you most is that i am entirely satisfied with my situation and am likely to be better off and happier than i have been for many years the doctor does not appear to be at all an eccentric he is evidently a bona fide scientist engaged as he tells me in working out difficult problems of chemistry in which i hope and believe i may be of some use to him by attending to smaller matters of detail only he has a most beautiful place on the outskirts of geneva in which i have been allotted a charming suite of rooms with the loveliest view of the alps from the windows and last by no means least he has a perfectly delightful mother a sweet old lady with snow-white hair and the grand manner who has captivated both my heart and imagination at once so you may realize how fortunate i am everything is signed and settled and there is only one stipulation dr demetrius makes and this is that while i am working with him i may neither write nor receive letters now i have no one i really care to write to except you moreover it is impossible for me to write to any one as i am supposed to be dead so it all fits in very well as it should you of course know nothing about me save that i was unfortunately drowned and when you see pa and ma clothed in their parental mourning you will i hope manage to shed a few friendly tears with them over my sudden departure from this world Nota bene, a scrap of freshly cut onion secreted in your handkerchief would do the trick i confess i should have liked to know your impression of my bereaved parents when you see them for the first time since my death but i must wait meanwhile you can be quite easy in your mind about me for i consider myself most fortunate i have a splendid salary a thousand a year just think of it a thousand pounds not francs and a perfectly enchanting home with every comfort and luxury i am indeed dead as the poor solitary woman who devoted her soul to the service of pa and ma a new diana may has sprung from the ashes of the old spinster it is exactly as if i had really died and been born again all the world seems new i breathe the air of a delicious and intelligent freedom such as i have never known i shall think of you very often you bright kind clever little sophy and if i get the chance i will now and then send you a few flowers or a book merely as a hint to you that all is well but in any case whether you receive such a hint or not have no misgivings or fears in regard to me for years i haven't been so happy or so well off as i am now i'm more than thankful that my lonely hours of study have not been entirely wasted and that what i have learned may prove of some use at last now dear sophy au revoir your good wishes for me are being fulfilled my poor brain so long atrophied by domestic considerations of pa and ma as you put it is actually expanding and who knows your prophecy may come true cinderella may yet go to the prince's ball if i have cause to resign my present post i will write to you at once but not till then this you will understand 
I have registered this letter so that really there is no need for you to acknowledge its receipt. The post office may be relied upon to deliver it to you safely. And I think it is perhaps best you should not write. Much love and grateful thanks for all your help and kindness to your departed friend, Diana May. This letter, with its banknote enclosure, she sealed, and then, taking a leisurely walk along the Rue de Mont Blanc to the general post office, she patiently filled in the various formal items for the act of registration which the Swiss postal officials make so overwhelmingly tiresome and important, and finally got her packet safely dispatched. This done, she felt as if the last link binding her to her former life was severed. Gone was Pa. Gone was Ma. Gone were the few faded sentiments she had half unconsciously cherished concerning the man she had once loved and who had heartlessly jilted her. Gone, too, were a number of sad and solitary years, gone, as if they had been a few unimportant numerals wiped off a slate, and theirs was the strangest going of all. For she had lived through those years, most surely she had lived through them, yet now it did not seem as if they had ever been part of her existence. They had suddenly become a blank. They counted for nothing except the recollection of long hours of study. Something new and vital touched her inner consciousness. A happiness, a lightness, a fresh breathing in of strength and self-reliance. From the Rue de Mont Blanc she walked to the pont and stood there, gazing for some time at the ravishing view that bridge affords of the lake and mountains. The sun shone warmly with that mellow, golden light peculiar to early autumn, and the water was blue as a perfect sapphire, flecked by tiny occasional ripples of silver, like sudden flashing reflections of sunbeams in a mirror. One or two pleasure boats with picturesque latin sails looked like great sea-birds slowly skimming along on one uplifted wing. The scene was indescribably lovely, and a keen throb of pure joy pulsated through her whole being, moving her to devout thankfulness for simply being alive and able to comprehend such beauty. If I had been really and truly drowned, I think it would have been a pity, she thought whimsically not on account of any grief it might have caused, for I have no one to grieve for me, but solely on my own part, for I should have been senseless, sightless, and tucked away in the earth, instead of being here in the blessed sunshine. No, I shouldn't have been tucked away in the earth unless they had found my body, and had a first-class funeral, with Ma's usual wreath lying on the coffin, I should have been dashed about in the sea and eaten by the fishes. Not half so pleasant as standing on the Pont du Mont Blanc and looking at the snowy line of the Alps. When people commit suicide, they don't think, poor souls. They don't realise that there's more happiness to be got out of the daily sunshine than either money, food, houses, or friends can ever give. And one can live on very little if one tries. Here she laughed. Though I shall have no chance to try a thousand a year for a single woman with a lovely home and board thrown in does not imply much effort in managing to keep body and soul together. Of course, my work may be both puzzling and strenuous. I wonder what it will really be. And she started again on her old crusade of wonder. Yet she did not find anything particular to wonder at in the appearance, manner, or conversation of Dr. Demetrius. She had always wondered at stupidity, but never at intelligence. 
Demetrius spoke intelligently and looked intelligent. He did not pose as a wizard or a seer or a prophet. And she felt sure that his mother would not limit her conversation to the various items of domestic business. She could not fancy her as becoming excited over a recipe for jam or the pattern for a blouse. This variety of subjects were the conventional stock-in-trade of English suburban misses and matrons whose talk on all occasions is little more than a lukewarm trickle of words which mean nothing. There would be some intellectual stimulus in the Demetrius household. Of that she felt convinced. But in what branch of scientific research, or what problem of chemistry her services would be required, she could not, with all her capacity for wondering, form any idea. She walked leisurely back to the hotel, looking at the shops on her way, at the little carved wooden bears carrying pincushions, pen trays, and pipe racks, at the innumerable clocks, with chimes and without, at the souvenirs of pressed and mounted Edelweiss, inscribed with tender mottoes suitable for lovers to send to one another in absence, and before one window full of these she paused, smiling. What nonsense it all is, she said to herself. I used to keep the faded petals of any little flower I chanced to see in his buttonhole, and put them away in envelopes marked with his initials and the date. What a fool I was! As great a fool as that sublime donkey, Juliette Drouet, who raved over her little man, Victor Hugo, and the silly girls who send this Edelweiss from Switzerland to the men they are in love with, ought just to see what those men do with it. That would cure them like the professor who totaled up his butcher's bill on the back of one of Charlotte Bronte's fervent letters, nine out of ten of them are likely to use it as a wedge to keep a window or door from rattling. Amused with her thoughts, she went on, reached her hotel and had luncheon, after which she paid her bill. Madame is leaving us? said the cheery Dame du Comtois speaking very voluble French. Alas, we are sorry her stay is so short. Madame goes on to Montreux, no doubt. Madame smiled at the amiable woman's friendly inquisitiveness. No, she answered. And yet, perhaps, yes, I am taking a long holiday and hope to see all the prettiest places in Switzerland. Ah, there is much that is grand, beautiful, declared the proprietress. You will occupy much time. You will perhaps return here again? Oh, yes, that is very likely, replied Diana, with a flagrant assumption of candour. I have been very comfortable here. Madame is too good to say so. We are charmed. The luggage has gone to the station, yes? That is well. Au revoir, madame. And with many gracious nods and smiles and repeated au revoirs, Diana escaped at last and went towards the station, solely for the benefit of the hotel people, servants included, who stood at the doorway watching her departure. But once out of their sight, she turned rapidly down a side street which she had taken note of in the morning, and soon found her way to the close little alley under trees, with the steps which led to the border of the lake, but which was barred to strangers and interlopers by an iron gate, through which she had already passed, and of which she had the key. There was no difficulty in unlocking it, and locking it again behind her, and she drew a long breath of relief and satisfaction when she found herself once more in the grounds of the Chateau Fragonard. There, she said, half aloud, I have shut away the old world. Welcome to the new. I am ready for anything now, life or death. Anything but the old jog-trot, 
loveless days of monotonous commonplace there will be something different here loveless i shall always be but i'm beginning to think there's another way of happiness than love though old thomas a kempis says nothing is sweeter than love nothing more pleasant nothing fuller and better in heaven and earth but he meant the love of god not the love of man she grew serious and absorbed in thought yet not so entirely abstracted as to be unconscious of the beauty of the gardens through which she was walking the well-kept lawns the beds and borders of flowers the graceful pergolas of climbing roses and the shady paths which went winding in and out through shrubberies and under trees here and there affording glimpses of the lake glittering as with silver and blue presently at a turn in one of these paths she had a view of the front of the chateau fragonard with its fountains in full play on either side and was enchanted with the classic purity of its architectural design which seemed evidently copied from some old-world model of an athenian palace i don't think it's possible to see anything lovelier she said to herself and what luck it is for me to live here who could have guessed it it's like a dream of fairyland she gathered a rose hanging temptingly within reach and fastened it in her bodice let me see she went on thinking it's just a week since i was drowned in devon such a little while why ma hasn't had time yet to get her mourning properly fitted and pa i wonder how he really carries himself as they say under his affliction i think it will be a case of bearing up wonderfully for both of them one week and my little boat of life tied so long by a worn rope to a weedy shore has broken adrift and floated away by itself to a veritable paradise of new experience but am i counting too much on my good fortune i wonder perhaps there will be some crushing drawback some terrorizing influence who knows and yet i think not anyhow i have signed sealed and delivered myself over to my chosen destiny it is wiser to hope for the best than imagine the worst arrived at the hall door of the chateau she found it open and passed in unquestioned as an admitted member of the household she saw a neat maid busying herself with the arrangement of some flowers and of her she asked the way to her rooms the girl at once preceded her up the wide staircase and showed her the passage leading to the beautiful suite of apartments she had seen in the morning remarking madam will be quite private here this passage is shut off from the rest of the house and is an entry to these rooms only and if madam wants any service she will ring and i will come my name is rose thank you rose and diana smiled at her feeling a sense of relief to know that she could have the attention of a simple ordinary domestic such as this pleasant-looking little french femme de chambre for somehow she had connected the dumb negro who had at first admitted her to the chateau with a whole imagined retinue of mysterious persons sworn to silence in the service of demetrius i will not trouble you more than i can help hark what is that noise a low organ-like sound as of persistent thudding and humming echoed around her it suggested suppressed thunder the girl rose looked quite unconcerned oh that is the machine in the doctor's laboratory she said but it does not often make any noise we do not know quite what it is we are not permitted to see she smiled and added but madam will not long be disturbed it will soon cease and indeed the thunderous hum died slowly as she spoke 
leaving a curious sense of emptiness on the air. Diana still listened, vaguely fascinated, but the silence remained unbroken. Rose nodded brightly, in pleased affirmation of her own words, and left the room, closing the door behind her. Alone, Diana went to the window and looked out. What a glorious landscape was spread before her! What a panorama of the divine handiwork in nature! Tears sprang to her eyes, tears not of sorrow, but of joy. I hope I am grateful enough, she thought, for now I have every reason to be grateful. I tried hard to feel grateful for all my blessings at home, yet somehow I couldn't be. There seemed no way out of the daily monotony, no hope anywhere. But now, now, with all this unexpected good luck, I could sing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow, with more fervour than any salvationist. She went into the cosy bedroom which adjoined her salon to see if she looked neat and well arranged enough in her dress to go down to tea. There was a long mirror there, and in it she surveyed herself critically. Certainly that navy, model, gown, suited her slim figure to perfection. And, she said to herself, if people only look at my hair and my too, too scraggy shape, they might almost take me for young. But woe's me! And she touched the corners of her eyes with the tips of her fingers. Here are the wicked crow's feet. They won't go. And the lines from nose to chin, which the beauty specialists offer to eradicate and can't. The ugly ruts made by time's unkind plough and my own too sorrowful habit of thought, they won't go either. However, here it doesn't matter. The doctor wanted a woman of mature years, and he's got her. She smiled cheerfully at herself in the mirror, which reflected a shape that was graceful in its outline, if somewhat too thin. Distinctly willowy, as she said and then she began thinking about clothes, like any other feminine creature. She was glad Sophie had made her buy two charming tea-gowns, and one very dainty evening party frock and she was now anxious to give the number of the luggage she had left at the Salle des Bagages to Dr. Demetrius, so that it might be sent for without delay. Meanwhile, she looked at all the elegancies of her rooms, and noted the comfort and convenience with which everything was arranged. One novelty attracted and pleased her. This was a small round dial, put up against the wall, and marked with the hours at which meals were served. A silver arrow, seemingly moved by interior clockwork, just now pointed to tea five o'clock, and while she was yet looking at it, a musical little bell rang very persistently behind the dial for about a minute, and then ceased. "'Tea-time, of course,' she said, and glancing at her watch she saw it was just five o'clock. "'What a capital invention! One of these in each room saves all the ugly gong-beating and bell-ringing which is common in most houses. I had better go.' She went at once running down the broad staircase with light feet as buoyantly as a girl, and remembering her way easily to the room where she had breakfasted in the morning. Madame Demetrius was there alone, knitting placidly, and looking the very picture of contentment. She smiled a welcome as Diana entered. "'So you have come back to us,' she said. "'I am very glad.' One lady who answered my son's advertisement went to see after her luggage in the same manner as you were told to do, and ran away. Ran away? echoed Diana. 
What for? The old lady laughed. Oh, I think she got afraid at the last moment. Something my son said, or looked, scared her. But he was not surprised. He has always given every applicant a chance to run away. Not me, said Diana merrily. For he made me sign an agreement and gave me some of my salary in advance. He would hardly expect me to run away with his money. Why not? And Demetrius himself entered the room. Why not, Miss May? Many a woman and many a man has been known to make short work with an agreement. What is it but a scrap of paper? And there are any number of humans who would judge it clever to run off with money confidingly entrusted to them. You are cynical, said Diana. And I don't think you mean what you say. You know very well that honour stands first with every right-thinking man or woman. Right-thinking? Oh, yes, I grant you that. And he drew a chair up to the tea-table where his mother had just seated herself. But right-thinking is a compound word big enough to cover a whole world of ethics and morals. If right-thinking were the rule instead of the exception... We should have a real civilization instead of a sham. Diana looked at him more critically and attentively than she had yet done. His personality was undeniably attractive. Some people would have considered him handsome. He had wonderful eyes. They were his most striking feature. Dark, deep, and sparkling with a curiously brilliant intensity. He had spoken of his Russian nationality, but there was nothing of the Kalmuk about him, much more of the picturesque Jew or Arab. An indefinable grace distinguished his movements, unlike the ordinary type of lumbersome man, who, without military or other training, never seems to know what to do with his hands or his feet. He noticed Diana's intent study of him, and smiled, a charming smile, indulgent and kindly. "'I mystify you a little already,' he said. "'Yes, I am sure I do. But there are many surprises in store for you that I think you had better not begin putting all the pieces of the puzzle together till they are all out of the box. Never mind what I seem to you, or what I may turn out to be. Enjoy for the present the simple safety of the commonplace.' There's nothing so balancing to the mind as a quiet contemplation of the tea-table. By the way, did you arrange about your luggage as I told you? Diana nodded a cheerful assent. Here's the number, she said. And if you are going to send for it, would you do so quite soon? I want to change my dress for dinner. Demetrius laughed as he took the number from her hand. Of course you do, he said. Even a woman of mature years is never above looking her best. Armed with this precious slip of paper, I will send for your belongings at once. It's only a portmanteau, put in Diana, meekly. Not a Saratoga trunk. He gave her an amused look. Didn't you bring any Paris confections? I didn't wait in Paris, she replied. I came straight on. A long journey, said Madame Demetrius. Yes, but I was anxious to get here as soon as I could. In haste to rush upon destiny, observed Demetrius, rising from the tea-table. Well, perhaps it is better than waiting for destiny to rush upon you. I will send for your luggage. It will be here in half an hour. Meanwhile, when you have quite finished your tea, will you join me in the laboratory? He left the room. Madame Demetrius laid down her knitting needles and looked wistfully at Diana. I hope you will not be afraid of my son, she said, or offended at anything he may say. His brain is always working, always seeking to penetrate some new mystery, and sometimes, 
from sheer physical fatigue. He may seem brusque, but his nature is noble. She paused, with a slight trembling of the lip and sudden moisture in her kind blue eyes. Impulsively, Diana took her thin, delicate old hand and kissed it. Please don't worry, she said. I am not easily offended, and I certainly shall not be afraid. I like your son very much, and I think we shall get on splendidly together. I do indeed. I'm simply burning with impatience to be at work for him. Be quite satisfied that I shall do my best. I'm off to the laboratory now. She went with a swift, eager step, and on reaching the outer hall was unexpectedly confronted by the dumb negro who had at first admitted her to the chateau. He made her a sign to follow him, and she obeyed. Down a long, winding, rather dark passage they went, till their further progress was stopped by a huge door made of some iridescent metal which glowed as with interior fire. It was so enormously thick, and wide and lofty, and clamped with such weighty bars and mysteriously designed fastenings, that it might have been the door imagined by Dante when he wrote, All hope abandon, ye who enter here. Diana felt her heart beating a little more quickly, but she kept a good grip on her nerves and looked questioningly at her guide. His dark face gave no sign in response. He merely laid one hand on the centre panel of the door with a light pressure. Come in, said the voice of Demetrius. Don't hesitate. At that moment the whole door lifted itself, as it were, from a deep socket in the ground, and swung upwards like the portcullis of an ancient bridge, only without any noise, disclosing a vast circular space covered in by a dome of glass, or some substance clearer than glass, through which the afternoon glory of the September sunshine blazed with an almost blinding intensity. Immediately under the dome, and in the exact centre of the circular floor, was a wonderful-looking piece of mechanism, a great wheel which swept round and round, incessantly and rapidly, casting from its rim millions and millions of sparks of light or fire. "'Come in,' again called Demetrius. Why do you stand waiting there? Diana looked back for a second. The great metal door had closed behind her. The negro attendant had disappeared. And she was shut within this great, weird chamber with Demetrius and that whirling wheel. A sudden giddiness overcame her. She stretched out her hands blindly for support. They were instantly caught in a firm, kind grasp. Keep steady, that's right. This, as she rallied her forces and tried to look up. It's not easy to watch any sort of spherical motion without wanting to go with it among the dancing stars. There. Better? Indeed, yes. I'm so sorry and ashamed, she said. Such a stupid weakness, but I have never seen anything like it. No, I am sure you have not. And Demetrius released her hands and stood beside her. To give you greater relief, I would stop the wheel if I could, but I cannot. You cannot? No, not till the daylight goes. Then it will gradually cease revolving of itself. It is only a very inadequate, man-made exposition of one of the divine mysteries of creation, the force of light which generates motion and from motion, life. Moses touched the central pivot of truth in his book of Genesis when he wrote, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. From that light, the effulgence of God's own actual presence and intelligence, came the movement which dispelled darkness, Movement, once begun, 
shaped all that which before was without form, and filled all that had been void. Light is the positive exhalation and pulsation of the divine existence, the active personality of an eternal God. Light, which enters the soul and builds the body of every living organism. Therefore, light is life. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Young Diana This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli Chapter 9 Diana listened to the quiet, emphatic tones of his voice in fascinated attention. Light is life he repeated, slowly. Light, and the twin portion of light, fire. The Rosicrucians have come nearer than any other religious sect in the world to the comprehension of things divine. Darkness is chaos, not death, for there is no death, but confusion, bewilderment, and blindness, which gropes for a glory instinctively felt but unseen. In these latter days, science has discovered the beginning of the wonders of light. They have always existed, but we have not found them, loving darkness rather than light. I say the beginning of wonders, for with all our advancement we have only become dimly conscious of the first vibration of the Creator's living presence. Light, which is God walking in His garden, which is colour, sound, heat, movement, all the divine power in eternal radiation and luminance. This is life, and in this we live, in this we may live and renew our lives. Aye, and in this we may retain youth beyond age. If we only have courage, courage and the will to learn. His brilliant dark eyes turned upon her with a searching steadfastness, and her heart beat quickly for there was something in his look which suggested that it was from her he expected courage and the will to learn. But she made no comment. Suddenly, and with an abrupt movement, he pulled with both hands at a lever apparently made of steel, like one of the handles in a signal box, and with his action the level floor beneath the great revolving wheel yawned asunder, showing a round pool of water, black as ink, and seemingly very deep. Diana recoiled from it, startled. Demetrius smiled. Suppose I asked you to jump in, he said. She thought a moment. Well, I should want to take off my dress first, she answered. It's a new one. He laughed. And then? Then? Why, then I shouldn't mind she said. I can swim. You would not be afraid? She met his eyes bravely. No, I should not be afraid. Upon my word, I believe you. You're a plucky woman. But then you've nothing to lose by your daring, having lost all. So you told me. What do you mean by having lost all? I mean just what I say, she replied quietly. Father, mother, home, lover, youth, beauty, and hope. Isn't that enough to lose? And, as she spoke, she gazed almost unseeingly at the wonderful wheel as it whirled round and round, glittering with a thousand colours, which were reflected in the dark mirror of the water below it. The sun was sinking, and the light through the overarching glass dome was softer, and with each minute became more subdued, and she noted with keen interest that the revolution of the wheel was less rapid and dizzying to the eye. Enough to lose, yes, said Demetrius. But the loss is quite common. Most of us, as we get on in life, lose father and mother, home, and even lover. 
but that we should lose youth beauty and hope is quite our own affair we ought to know better she looked at him in surprise how should we know better she asked age must come and with age the wrinkling and spoiling of all beautiful faces to say nothing of the aches and pains and ailments common to the general break-up of the body cells we cannot defy the law of nature that is precisely what we are always doing said demetrius and that is why we make such trouble for ourselves we not only defy the law of nature in a bodily sense by over-eating over-drinking and over-breeding but we ignore it altogether in a spiritual sense we forget and wilfully forget that the body is only the outward manifestation of a soul creature not the soul creature itself so we starve the light and feed the shadow and then foolishly wonder that with the perishing light the shadow is absorbed in darkness he pulled at the steel lever again and the mysterious pool of water became swiftly and noiselessly covered as part of the apparently solid ground one more thing before we go he resumed and taking a key from his pocket he unlocked a tiny door no bigger than the door of a child's dollhouse come and see diana obeyed and bending down to peer into the small aperture disclosed saw therein a tube or pipe no thicker than a straw from which fell slowly drop by drop a glittering liquid into a hollow globe of crystal so brilliant and fiery was the colour of this fluid that it might have been an essence of the very sunlight she looked at demetrius in silent inquiry he said nothing and presently she ventured to ask in a half whisper what is it his expression as he turned and faced her was so rapt and transfigured as to be quite extraordinary it is life or it is death he answered it is my great experiment of which you will be the practical test ah now you look amazed indeed your eyes are almost young in wonder and yet i see no fear that is well now think and understand all this mechanism which is far more complex than you can imagine this dome of crystal above us this revolving wheel moved by light alone the deep water beneath us through which the condensed and vibrating light rushes with electric speed these million whirling atoms of fire all this i say is merely remember merely to produce these miniature drops smaller by many degrees than a drop of dew and so slowly are they distilled that it has taken me ten years to draw from these restless and opposing elements a sufficient quantity for my great purpose ten years and after all who knows all my thought and labour may be wasted i may have taken the wrong road the fiery sword turns every way and even now i may fail his face darkened the hope and radiance died out of it and left it grey and drawn almost old diana laid her hand on his arm with a soft consoling touch why should you fail she asked gently you yourself know the object of your quest and the problem you seek to solve and i am sure you have missed no point that could avail to lead you in the right direction and if as i now imagine you need a human life to risk itself in the ultimate triumph of your work you have mine entirely at your service as i have told you several times already i am not afraid he took the hand that lay upon his arm and kissed it with grave courtesy i thank you he said i feel that you are perfectly sincere and honesty always breeds courage understand my mother has never seen this workshop of mine she would be terrified the dome was built for me by my french architect ostensibly for astronomical purposes the rest of the mechanism bit by bit was sent to me from different parts of the world and i push it up myself assisted only by vasho my negro servant who is dumb so my secret is as far as possible well kept i shall not betray it said diana simply 
He smiled. I know you will not, he answered. With almost a miser's care he locked the tiny door which concealed the mystery of the fiery golden liquid dropping so slowly, almost reluctantly, into its crystal receptacle. The sun had sunk below the horizon, and shadows began to creep over the clearness of the dome above them, while the great wheel turned at a slower pace, and ever more slowly as the light grew dim. "'We will go now,' he said. "'One or two ordinary people are coming to dine, and your luggage will have arrived. I want you to live happily here, and healthfully. Your health is a most important consideration with me. You look thin and delicate.' "'I am thin, to positive scragginess,' interrupted Diana. "'But I am not delicate.' "'Well, that may be, but you must keep strong. You will need all your strength in the days to come.' They were at the closed door of the laboratory, which, by some unseen contrivance, evidently controlled by the pressure of the hand against a particular panel, swung upwards in the same way as it had done before and when they passed out, slid downwards again behind them. They were in the corridor now, dimly lit by one electric lamp. "'You are not intimidated by anything I have shown you,' said Demetrius then. "'After all, you are a woman and entitled to nerves.' "'Quite so. Nerves properly organised and well under control,' answered Diana quietly. I am full of wonder at what I have seen, but I am not intimidated. Good. And a sudden smile lit up his face, giving it a wonderful charm. Now run away and dress for dinner, and don't puzzle yourself by thinking about anything for the present. If you must think, wait till you are alone with night and the stars. He left her, and she went upstairs at once to her own rooms. Here repose and beauty were expressed in all her surroundings, and she looked about her with a sigh of comfort and appreciation. Some careful hand had set vases of exquisitely arranged flowers here and there, and the scent of roses, carnations, and autumn violets made the already sweet air sweeter. She found her modest luggage in her bedroom, and set to work unpacking and arranging her clothes. He's quite right, I mustn't think, she said to herself. It would never do, that wheel grinding out golden fire, that mysterious pool of water in which one might easily be drowned and never heard of any more, and those precious drops locked up in a tiny hole. What can all these things mean? There, I'm thinking and I mustn't think. But is he mad, I wonder? Surely not. No madman ever put up such a piece of mechanism as that wheel. I'm thinking again. I mustn't think. I mustn't think. She soon had all her garments unpacked, shaken out, and arranged in their different places, and, after some cogitation, decided to wear for the evening one of the Parisian rest or tea gowns her friend Sophie Lansing had chosen for her, a marvellous admixture of palest rose and lilac hues, with a touch or two of pearl glimmerings among lace, like moonlight on foam. She took some pains to dress her pretty hair becomingly, twisting it up high on her small, well-shaped head, and when her attire was complete, she surveyed herself in the long mirror with somewhat less dissatisfaction than she was accustomed to do. Not so bad, she inwardly commented, approving the picturesque fall and flow of the rose and lilac silk and chiffon which clung softly round her slim figure. You are not entirely repulsive yet, Diana. Not yet. But you will be. Never fear. Just wait a little. Wait till your cheeks sink in a couple of bony hollows and your throat looks like the just-wrung neck of a scrawny fowl. 
<laughs> Here she laughed, with a quaint amusement at the unpleasant picture she was making of herself in the future. Yes, my dear, not all the clouds of rosy chiffon in the world will hide your blemishes then. And your hair. Oh, your hair will be a sort of grizzled ginger, and you'll have to hide it. So you'd better enjoy this little interval. It won't last long. Suddenly, at this point in her soliloquy, some words uttered by Demetrius rang back on her memory. That we should lose youth, beauty, and hope is quite our own affair. We ought to know better. She repeated them slowly once or twice. Strange. A very strange thing to say. She mused. I wonder what he meant by it. I'm sure if it had been my own affair to keep youth, beauty, and hope, I would never have lost them. Oddly enough, I seem to have got back a little scrap of one of the losses. Hope. But I'm thinking again. I mustn't think. She curtsied playfully to her own reflection in the mirror, and seeing by the warning time dial for meals that it was nearly the dinner hour, she descended to the drawing room. Three or four people were assembled there, talking to Madame Demetrius, who introduced Diana as Miss May, an English friend of ours who is staying with us for the winter. An announcement which Diana herself tacitly accepted as being, no doubt, what Dr. Demetrius wished. The persons to whom she was thus presented were the Baroness Roussillon, a handsome Frenchwoman of possibly fifty-six or sixty, her husband, the Baron, a stout, cheerful personage, with a somewhat aggravating air of perpetual bonhomie, Professor Chauvet, a very thin little old gentleman with an aquiline nose and drooping eyelids from which small, sparkling dark eyes gleamed out occasionally like needle points, and a certain Marchese Luigi Farnese, a rather sinister-looking dark young man, with a curiously watchful expression, as of one placed on guard over some hidden secret treasure. They were all exceedingly amiable, and asked Diana the usual polite questions. Whether she had had a pleasant journey from England? Was the channel rough? Was the weather fine? Was she a good sailor? And so on. All of which she answered pleasantly, in that sweet and musical voice, which always attracted and charmed her hearers. And you come from England, said Professor Chauvet, blinking at her through his eyelids. Ah, it is a strange place. Diana smiled, but said nothing. It is a strange place, reiterated the professor with more emphasis. It is a place of violent contrasts without any intermediate tones. Stupidity and good sense, moral cowardice and physical courage, petty grudging and large generosity jostle each other in couples all through English society. Yet after, and with these drawbacks, it is very attractive. I am so glad you like it, said Diana cheerfully. I expect the same faults can be found in all countries and with all nations. We English are not the worst people in the world. By no means, conceded the professor, inclining his head courteously. You might almost claim to be the best, if it were not for France, and Italy, and Russia. The Baroness Roussillon smiled. How clever of you, Professor, she said. You are careful to include all nationalities here present in your implied compliment, and so you avoid argument. Madam, I never argue with a lady, he replied. First, because it is bad manners, and second, because it is always useless. They all laughed with the gentle tolerance of persons who know an old saying by heart. Just then, Dr. Demetrius entered and severally greeted his guests. Despite her efforts to seem otherwise entertained, 
Diana found herself watching his every movement and trying to hear every word he said. Only very few men look well in evening dress, and he was one of those few. A singular distinction marked his bearing and manner. In any assemblage of notable people, he would have been assuredly selected as one of the most attractive and remarkable. Once he caught her eyes steadfastly regarding him, and smiled encouragingly. Whereat she coloured deeply and felt ashamed of her close observation of him. He took the Baroness Roussillon into dinner, the Baron following with Madame Demetrius, and Diana was left with a choice between two men as her escort. She looked in smiling inquiry at both. Professor Chauvet settled the point. Marchese, you had better take Miss May, he said, addressing the dark Italian. I never allow myself to go in to dinner with any woman. It's my habit always to go alone. How social and independent of you, said Diana, gaily, accepting the Marchese's instantly proffered arm. You like to be original, or is it only to attract attention to yourself? The professor opened his eyes to their fullest extent under their half-shut lids. Here was an Englishwoman daring to quiz him. Or, as the English themselves would say, chaff him. He coughed, glared, and tried to look dignified, but failed, and was fain to trot, or rather shuffle, into the dining-room somewhat meekly at the trailing end of Diana's rose and lilac chiffon train. When they were all seated at table, he looked at her with what was, for him, unusual curiosity, realising that she was not quite an ordinary sort of woman. He began to wonder about her, and where she came from. It was all very well to say, from England, but up to now, all conversation had been carried on in French, and her French had no trace whatever of the British accent. She sat opposite to him, and he had good opportunity to observe her attentively, though furtively. She was talking with much animation to the Marchese Farnese. Her voice had the most enchanting modulation of tone, and, straining his ears to hear what she was saying, he found she was speaking Italian. At this he was fairly nonplussed and somewhat annoyed. He did not speak Italian himself. All his theories respecting the British female were upset. No British female. He said this inwardly. No single one of the species in his knowledge talked the French of France or the Italian of Tuscany. He watched her with an almost grudging interest. She was not young. She was not old. Some man has had the making or the marring of her, he thought crossly. No woman ever turned herself out with such aplomb and savoir-faire. Meanwhile, Diana was enjoying her dinner. She was cleverly drawing out her partner at table, young Farnese, who proved to be passionately keen on all scientific research, and particularly so on the mysterious doings of Feodor Demetrius. Happy to find himself next to a woman who spoke his native tongue with charm and fluency, he let himself go freely. I suppose you have known Dr. Demetrius for some time? he asked. Diana thought for a second, then replied promptly, Oh, yes. He's a wonderful man, said Farnese. Wonderful. I have myself witnessed his cures of cases given up by all other doctors as hopeless. I have asked him to accept me as a student under him, but he will not. He has some mystery which he will allow no one but himself to penetrate. Really? And Diana lifted her eyebrows in an arch of surprise. He has never given me that impression. Ah, no. And Farnese smiled rather darkly. 
He would not appear in that light to one of your sex. He does not care for women. His own mother is not really aware of the nature of his studies or the object of his work. Nobody has his confidence. As you are a friend of his, you must know this quite well. Oh, yes, yes, of course, murmured Diana absently. But nobody expects a very clever man to explain himself to his friends, or to the public. He must always do his work more or less alone. I agree, said the Marchese. And this is why I cannot understand the action of Demetrius in advertising for an assistant. Oh, has he done so? inquired Diana indifferently. Yes. For the last couple of months he has put a most eccentric advertisement in many of the journals, seeking the services of an elderly woman as assistant or secretary, I don't know which. It's some odd new notion of his, and I venture to think rather a mistaken one, for if he will not trust a man-student, how much less can he rely on an old woman? Echelenza, you are talking to a woman now said Diana, calmly. But never mind. Go on, and don't apologize. Farnese's dark olive skin flushed red. But I must, he stammered awkwardly. I ask a thousand pardons. You are forgiven, she said. Women are quite hardened to the ironies and satires of your sex upon us, and if we have any cleverness at all, we are more amused by them than offended, for we know you cannot do without us. But certainly it is very odd that Dr. Demetrius should advertise for an old woman. I never heard anything quite so funny. He does not, I think, advertise for an actually old woman, said Farnese, relieved to find that she had taken his clumsy remark so lightly. The advertisement when I saw it mentioned a woman of mature years. Oh, well, that's a polite way of saying an old woman, isn't it? Smiled Diana. And, do tell me, has he got her? Why, no, not yet. Probably he will not get her at all. Even let us suppose a woman offered herself, who admitted that she was of mature years, that very fact would be sufficient proof of her incapacity. Indeed? And Diana lifted her eyebrows again. Why? The Marchese smiled a superior smile. Perhaps I had better not explain, he said. But for a woman to arrive at mature years without any interest in life, except to offer her probably untrained services to a man she knows nothing of, except through the medium of an advertisement, is plain evidence that any such woman must be a fool. Diana laughed merrily, and her laughter was the prettiest ripple of music. Oh, yes, of course, I see your meaning, she said. You are quite right. But, after all, perhaps the elderly female is only wanted to add up accounts, or write down measurements, or something of that kind. Just ordinary, routine work. Some lonely old spinster with no claims upon her might be glad of such a chance. Are you discussing my advertisement? Interrupted Demetrius suddenly, sending a glance and smile at Diana from the head of the table. I have withdrawn it. Have you really? said the Marchese. That is not to say you are suited. Suited? Oh, no. I shall never be suited. It was a foolish quest, and I ought to have known better. His dark eyes sparkled mirthfully. You see, I had rather forgotten the fact that no woman cares to admit she is of mature years. I had also forgotten the well-known male formula that no woman can be trusted— However, I have only lost a few hundred francs in my advertising, so I have nothing to regret except my own folly. Had you many applications? 
inquired Professor Chauvet. Demetrius laughed. Only one, he answered gaily, and she was a poor lone lady who had lost all she thought worth living for. Of course she was impossible. Naturally, and the professor nodded sagaciously. She would be. What was she like? asked Diana, with an amused look. Like no woman I have ever seen, replied Demetrius, smiling quizzically at her. Mature and fully ripened in her opinions, fairly obstinate and difficult to get rid of. I congratulate you on having succeeded, said Farnese. Succeeded? In what way? In having got rid of her. Oh, yes, but I don't think she wanted to go. No woman ever wants to go if there's a good-looking bachelor with whom she has any chance to stay, said the Baron Roussillon, expanding his shirt-front and smiling largely all round the table. The poor lone lady must have taken your rejection of her services rather badly. That's the way most men would look at it, replied Demetrius. But, my dear Baron, I'm afraid we are rather narrow and primitive in our ideas of the fair sex, not to say conceited. It is quite our own notion that all women need us or find us desirable. Some women would much rather not be bored with us at all. One of the prettiest women I ever knew remained unmarried because, as she frankly said, she did not wish to be a housekeeper to any man or be bored by his perpetual company. And there's something in it, you know. Every man has his own particular groove in which he elects to run, and in his groove he's apt to become monotonous and tiresome. That is why, when I advertised, I asked for a woman of mature years, someone who had settled down, and who would not find it wearisome to trot tamely alongside of my special groove. But, of course, it was very absurd on my part to expect to find a woman of that sort who was at the same time well-educated and clever. You should marry, my dear Demetrius, you should marry, said the Baroness Roussillon, with a brilliant flash of her fine eyes and an encouraging smile. Never, my dear Baroness, never, he replied with emphasis. I am capable of many things, but not of that most arrant stupidity. Were I to marry, my work would be ruined. I should become immersed in the domesticities of the kitchen and the nursery, living my life at no higher grade than the life of the farmyard or rabbit warren. In my opinion, marriage is a mistake. But we must not argue such a point in the presence of a happily married couple like yourself and the Baron. Look at our excellent friend Chauvet. He has never married. Thank God! ejaculated the professor devoutly, while every one laughed. Ah, you may laugh, but it is I who laugh last, when I see the unfortunate husband going out for a slow walk with his wife and three or four screaming, jumping children who behave like savages, not knowing what they want or where they wish to go, I bless my happy fate that I can do my ten miles a day alone, revelling in the beauty of the mountains and lakes, and enjoying my own thoughts in peace. Like Ambriel, I have not married because I am afraid of disillusion." "'But have you thought of the possible woman in the case?' asked Diana, sweetly and suddenly. "'Might she not also suffer from disillusion, if you were her husband?' Laughter again rang round the table. The professor rose, glass of wine in hand, and made Diana a solemn bow. "'Madam, I stand reproved,' he said and I drink to your health and to England, your native country. And in reply to your question, I am honest enough to say that I think any woman who had been so unfortunate as to marry me would have put herself out of her misery a month after the wedding. Renewed merriment rewarded this amant honorable on the part of Chauvet, who sat down well pleased with himself, and well pleased, too, with Diana, whom he considered quick-witted and clever, and whose smile when he had made his little speech had quite won him over. Madame Demetrius, chiefly intent on the hospitable cares of the table, 
had listened to all the conversation with an old lady's placid enjoyment, only putting in a word now and then, and smiling with affectionate encouragement at Diana, and, dessert being presently served, and cigars and cigarettes handed round by the negro, Vasho, who was the sole attendant, she gave the signal for the ladies to retire. "'You do not smoke?' said the Marchese Farnese, as Diana moved from her place. "'No, indeed. You dislike it? For women, yes.' "'Then you are old-fashioned,' he commented, playfully. "'Yes, and I am very glad of it,' she answered quietly and followed Madame Demetrius and the Baroness Roussillon out of the room. As she passed Demetrius, who held open the door for their exit, he said a few low-toned words in Russian, which, owing to her own study of the language, she understood. They were, Excellent. You have kept your own counsel and mine most admirably. I thank you with all my heart. End of chapter 9 Chapter Ten of The Young Diana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter Ten. That first evening in the Chateau Fragonard taught Diana exactly what was expected of her. It was evident that both Demetrius and his mother chose to assume that she was a friend of theirs, staying with them on a visit, and she realised that she was not supposed to offer any other explanation of her presence. The famous advertisement had been withdrawn, and the doctor had plainly announced that he was not suited, and that he had resigned all further quest of the person he had sought. That he had some good reason for disguising the real facts of the case, Diana felt sure, and she was quite satisfied to fall in with his method of action. The more so, when she found herself an object of interest and curiosity to the Baroness Roussillon, who spared no effort to draw her out and gain some information as to her English home, her surroundings, and ordinary associations. The Baroness had a clever and graceful way of cross-examining strangers through an assumption of friendliness, but Diana was equally clever and graceful in the art of fence, and was not to be drawn. When the men left the dinner-table and came into the drawing-room, she was placed, as it were, between two fires, Professor Chauvet and the Marchese Farnese both of whom were undisguisedly inquisitive, Farnese especially, and Diana was not slow to discover that his chief aim in conversing with her was to find out something, anything, which could throw a light on the exact nature of the work in which Demetrius was engaged. Perceiving this, she played with him like a shuttlecock, tossing him away from his main point whenever he got near it much to his scarcely concealed irritation. Every now and again she caught a steel-like flash in the dark eyes of Demetrius, who, though engaged in casual talk with the Baron and Baroness Roussillon, glanced at her occasionally in fullest comprehension and approval. And, somehow, it became borne in upon her mind that, if Farnese only knew the way to the scientist's laboratory, he would have very little scruple about breaking into any part of it with the hope of solving its hidden problem. "'Why do you imagine there is any mystery about the doctor's works?' she asked him. "'I know of none.' "'He would never let any woman know,' replied Farnese, with conviction." but she might find out for herself if she were clever. There is a mystery without doubt. For instance, 
what is that great dome of glass which catches the sunlight on its roof and glitters in the distance when i look towards the chateau from my sailing boat on the lake oh you have a sailing boat on the lake exclaimed diana clasping her hands in well-affected ecstasy how enchanting like lord byron when he lived at the villa diodotti ah put in professor chauvet so you know your byron then you are not one of the moderns diana smiled no i do not prefer kipling to the author of child harold then you are lost irretrievably lost said the professor in england at any rate in england if you are a true lover of literature you must sneer at byron because it's academic to do so oxford and cambridge have taken to decrying genius and worshipping mediocrity byron is the only english poet known and honoured in other countries than england your modern verse writers are not understood in france italy or russia half a dozen of byron's stanzas would set up all the british latter-day rhymers with ideas only of course they would never admit it i'm glad i've met an englishwoman who has sense enough to appreciate byron thank you said diana in a small meek voice you are most kind here farnese rushed in again upon his argument that glass dome diana smothered a tiny yawn oh that's an astronomical place she said indifferently you know the kind of thing telescopes globes mathematical instruments all those sort of objects the marchese looked surprised then incredulous an astronomical place he repeated are you sure have you seen it why yes of course <laughs> and she laughed haven't you never he allows no visitors inside it ah i expect you're too inquisitive and she looked at him with a bland and compassionate tolerance you see being a woman i don't care about difficult studies such as astronomy women are not supposed to understand the sciences they never can grasp anything in the way of mathematics can they farnese hesitated chauvet interposed quickly they can but to my mind they cease to be women when they do they become indifferent to the softer emotions what emotions queried diana unfurling a little fan and waving it slowly to and fro the emotions of love of tenderness of passion ah yes you mean the emotions of love of tenderness of passion for what for man well of course the most surface knowledge of mathematics would soon put an end to that sort of thing dear english madam you are pleased to be severe said chauvet yet the soft emotions are surely woman's distinguishing charm she laughed men like to say so she replied because it flatters their vanity to rouse these soft emotions and translate them into love for themselves but have you had any experience professor if any woman had displayed soft emotions towards you would you not have been disposed to nip them in the bud most likely i am not an object for sentimental consideration i never was i should have greatly regretted it if one of your charming sex had wasted her time or herself on me just then madame demetrius spoke dear miss may will you play us something she readily acquiesced and seating herself at the grand piano which was open soon scored a triumph her playing was exquisitely finished and as her fingers glided over the keys the consciousness that she was discoursing music to at least one or two persons who understood and appreciated it gave her increased tenderness of touch and beauty of tone 
the dreary feeling of utter hopelessness which had pervaded her body and soul when playing to her father and mother ma asleep on the sofa and pa hidden behind a newspaper neither of them knowing or caring what composer's work she performed was changed to a warm happy sense of the power to give pleasure and the ability to succeed and when she had finished a delicately wild little sonata of grieg's pressing its soft half-sobbing final chord as daintily and hushfully as she would have folded a child's hands in sleep a murmur of real rapture and surprised admiration came from all her heroes but you are an artiste exclaimed the baroness roussillon you are a professional virtuoso surely spare me such an accusation laughed diana i don't think i could play to an audience for money it would seem like selling my soul ah there i can't follow you said chauvet that's much too high-flown and romantic for me why not sell anything if you can find buyers his little eyes glittered ferret-like between his secretive eyelids and diana smiled seeing that he spoke ironically this is an age of selling he went on the devil might buy souls by the bushel if he wanted them and if there were such a person and as for music why it's as good for sale and barter nowadays as a leg of mutton the professional musician is as eager for gain as any other merchant in the general market and if the spirit of sappho sang him a song from the elysian fields he'd sell it to a gramophone agency for the highest bid and you talk about selling your soul dear madam with a thousand pardons for my brusquerie you talk nonsense how do you know you have a soul to sell before she could reply demetrius interposed his face was shadowed by a stern gravity no jesting with that subject professor he said you know my opinions sacred things are not suited for ordinary talk the issues are too grave the realities too absolute chauvet coughed a little cough of embarrassment and took out a pair of spectacles from his pocket polished them and put them back again for want of something else to do the marchese farnese looked up his expression was eager and watchful he was on the alert but nothing came of his expectancy play to us again miss may continued demetrius in gentler accents you need be under no doubt as to the existence of your soul when you can express it so harmoniously she coloured with pleasure and turning again to the piano played the prelude of rachmaninoff with a verve and passion which surprised herself she could not indeed explain why she so lately conscious of little save the fact that she was a solitary spinster in the way of her would-be juvenile father and with no one to care what became of her now felt herself worthy of attention as a woman of talent and individuality capable of asserting herself as such wherever she might be the magnificent chords of the russian composer's despairing protest against all insignificance and meanness rolled out from under her skilled fingertips with all the pleading of a last appeal and every one in the room even demetrius himself sat as it were spellbound and touched by a certain awe an irresistible outburst of applause greeted her as she carried the brilliant finale to its close and she rose trembling a little with the nervous and very novel excitement of finding her musical gifts appreciated professor chauvet got up slowly from his chair and came towards her after that you may lead me where you like he said i am tame and humble i shall never disagree with a woman who can so express the pulsations of a poet's brain for that is what rachmaninoff has put in his music yes chere anglaise 
I never flatter, and you play superbly. May I call you Cher Anglaise? If it pleases you to do so, she answered, smiling. It does please me, it pleases me very much, he went on. It is a sobriquet of originality and distinction. An Englishwoman of real talent is precious, therefore rare. And being rare, it follows that she is dear, even to me. Cher Anglaise, you are charming, and if both you and I were younger, I should risk a proposal. Everyone laughed, no one more so than Diana. You must have had considerable training to be such a proficient on the piano, inquired Farnese, with his look of almost aggressive curiosity. Indeed, no, she replied at once. But I have had a good deal of time to myself, one way and the other, and, as I love music, I have always practised steadily. We really must have an afternoon in Geneva, said the Baroness Roussillon then. You must be heard, my dear Miss May. The Genovese are very intelligent. They ought to know what an acquisition they have to their musical society. Oh, no interrupted Diana, anxiously. Please, I could not play before many people. No, like everything which emanates from spirit, music of the finest quality is for the few, said Demetrius. Where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them, is the utterance of all godlike presences. Only two or three can ever understand. Diana thanked him mutely by a look, and conversation now became general. In a very short time the little party broke up, and Demetrius accompanied his guests in turn to the door. The Roussillons took Farnese with them in their automobile. Professor Chauvet, putting on a most unbecoming and very shabby greatcoat, went on his way walking. He lived but half a mile or so further up the road. In a small cottage, or chalet, he explained. A bachelor's hermitage, where I shall be happy to see you, Miss May, if you ever care to come. I have nothing to show you but books, minerals, and a few jewels, which perhaps you might like to look at. Strange jewels, with histories and qualities and characteristics. Is it not so, Demetrius? Demetrius nodded. They have their own mysteries, like everything else, he said. Diana murmured her thanks for the invitation, and bade him good-night. Then, as he went out of the room with his host, she turned to Madame Demetrius, and with a gentle, almost affectionate consideration, asked if she could do anything for her before going to bed. "'No, my dear,' answered the old lady, taking her hand and patting it caressingly. "'It's kind of you to think about me.' And if I want you, I'll ask you to come and help an old woman to be more useful than she is. But wait a few minutes. I know Feodor wishes to speak to you. I have not displeased him, I hope, in any way, Diana said, a little anxiously. I felt so at home, as it were, that I'm afraid I spoke a little too frankly as a stranger. You spoke charmingly. Madame assured her. Brightly, and with perfect independence, which we admire. And need I say how much both my son and I appreciated your quickness of perception and tact? She laid a slight emphasis on the last word. Diana smiled and understood. People are very inquisitive, went on Madame. And it is better to let them think you are a friend and guest of ours than the person for whom my son has been advertising. That advertisement of his caused a great deal of comment and curiosity, and now that he has said he has withdrawn it, and that he does not expect to be suited, the gossip will gradually die down. But if any idea had got about that you were the result of his search for an assistant, you would find yourself in an embarrassing position. 
you would be asked no end of questions, and our charming Baroness Roussillon would be one of the first to make mischief. But thanks to your admirable self-control, she is silenced. Will anything silence her? And Demetrius, entering, stood for a moment looking at his mother and Diana with a smile. I doubt it. But Miss May is not at all the kind of woman the Baroness would take as suitable for a scientific doctor's assistant. Fortunately, she is not old enough. Not old enough? And Diana laughed. Why, what age ought I to be? Sixty at least. <laughs> and he laughed with her. The Baroness is a great deal older than you are, but she still subjugates the fancy of some men. Her idea of a doctor's private secretary or assistant is a kind of Macbeth's witch, too severely schooled in the virtues of ugliness to wear rose-coloured chiffon. Diana flushed a little as he gave a meaning glance at her graceful draperies. Then he added, Come out for a moment in the loggia. Moonlight is often talked about and written about, but it seldom gives such an impression of itself as on an early autumn night in Switzerland. Come, she obeyed, and as she followed him to the marble loggia where the fountains were still playing, an irresistible soft cry of rapture broke from her lips. The scene she looked upon was one of fairy-like enchantment. The moonlight, pearly pure, was spread in long broad wings of white radiance over the lawns in front of the chateau, and reaching out through the shadows of trees, touched into silver the misty, scarcely discernible peaks of snow mountains far beyond. A deep silence reigned everywhere, that strange silence so frequently felt in the vicinity of mountains, so that when the bell of the chiming clock set in the turret of the chateau struck eleven, its sound was almost startling. This would be a night for a sail on the lake, said Demetrius. Some evening you must come. She made no reply. Her soul was in her eyes, looking, looking wistfully at the beauty of the night, while all the old, unsatisfied hunger ached at her heart, the hunger for life at its best and brightest, for the things which were worth having and holding, and absorbed in a sudden wave of thought, she hardly remembered for the moment where she was. Millions of people look at this moon tonight without seeing it, said Demetrius, after a pause during which he had watched her attentively. Millions of people live in the world without knowing anything about it. They, themselves, are to them the universe. Like insects, they grub for food and bodily satisfaction. Like insects, they die without having ever known any higher aim of existence. Yet, looking on such loveliness as this tonight, do you not feel that something more lasting, more real than the usual mode of life was and is intended for us? Does it not seem a flaw in the Creator's plan that this creation should be invested with such beauty and perfection for human beings who do not even see it? Do we make the utmost of our capabilities? She turned her eyes away from the moonlit landscape and looked at him with rather a sad smile. I cannot tell. I do not know, she answered. I am not skilled in argument. But what almost seems to me to be the hardest thing in life is that we have so little time to learn or to understand. As children and as very young people we are too brimful of animal spirits to think about anything. Then, when we arrive at mature years, we find we are shelved by our fellow men and women as old and unwanted. Women especially are sneered at for age, as if it were a crime to live beyond one's teens. Only the coarsest minds and tongues sneer at a woman's age, said Demetrius. They are the pigs of the common sty, and they must grunt, I see you have suffered from their grunting. That, of course, is because you have not put on the matrimonial yoke. You might get as old as the good Abraham's wife, Sarah, without a sneer, 
so long as you had become legitimately aged through waiting on the moods and caprices of a husband. <laughs> he laughed, half ironically. Then, drawing nearer to her by a step, went on in a lower tone. What would you say if you could win back youth? Not only the youth of your best days, but a youth transfigured to a fairness and beauty, far exceeding any that you have ever known. What would you give if, with that youth, you could secure an increased mental capacity for enjoying it? An exquisite vitality, a delight in life so keen that every beat of your heart should be one of health and joy, and that you should hold life itself. Here he paused and repeated the words slowly. That you should hold life itself, I say, in a ceaseless series of vibrations, as eternal as the making and remaking of universes. His dark eyes were fixed upon her face with an intensity of meaning, and a thrill ran through her, half of fear, half of wonderment. What would I say? What would I give? You talk like another Mephistopheles to a female Faustus. <laughs> she said, forcing a laugh. I would not give my soul, because I believe I have a soul, and that it is what God commands me to keep. But I would give everything else. Your soul is part of your life, said Demetrius, and you could not give that without giving your life as well. I speak of holding your life, that is to say, keeping it. Understand me well. The soul is the eternal and indestructible pivot round which the mechanism of the brain revolves, as the earth revolves around the sun. The soul imparts all light, all heat, all creation and fruition to the brain, though it is but a speck of radiant energy, invisible to the human eye, even through the most powerful lens. It is the immortal embryo of endless existences, and in whatsoever way it instructs the brain, the brain should be in tune to respond. That the brain seldom responds truly is the fault of the preponderating animalism of the human race. If you can follow me, still listen. She listened indeed, every sense alert and braced with interest. All ideas, all sentiments, all virtues, all sins are in the cells of the brain. He went on. The soul plays on these cells with vibrating touches of light, just as you play on the notes of the piano, or as a typist fingers the keyboard of the machine. On the quality or characteristic of the soul depends the result. Youth is in the cells of the brain. Should the cells become dry and withered, it is because the soul has ceased to charge them with its energy. But when this is the case, it is possible, I say it is possible, for science to step in. The spark can be re-energized. The cells can be recharged. Diana caught her breath. Was he mad? Or sane with a sanity that realizes a miracle? She gazed at him as though plunging her eyes into a well of mystery. He smiled strangely. Poor lady of mature years, he said. You have heard me, have you not? Well, think upon what I have said. I am not mad, be assured. I am temperate in reason and cool in blood. I am only a scientist, bent on defying that angel at the gate of Eden with the flaming sword who keeps the way of the tree of life, lest men should take and eat and live forever. It would not do for men in the aggregate to live forever, for most of them are little more than mites in a cheese. But, as the prophet Esdras was told, this present world is made for the many, but the world to come for the few. That world to come does not mean a world after death, but the world of here and now, a world for the few who know how to use it and themselves, a world where the same moonlight as this shines like a robe of woven pearls spread over all human ugliness and ignorance, leaving only God's beauty and wisdom. Look at it once more, make a picture of it in your mind, and then, good night. She raised her eyes to the dense purple of the sky, and let them wander over the lovely gardens, drenched in silver glory, then extended her hand. Thank you for all you have told me, she said. I shall remember it.
Good night. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of The Young Diana」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli Chapter Eleven The next day Diana entered upon her work, and, for a fortnight following, she was kept fully employed. But nothing mysterious, nothing alarming, or confusing to the mind, was presented for her contemplation or cooperation. Not once was she called upon to enter the laboratory where the strange wheel whirled at the bidding of the influence of light, going faster or slower, according to the ascension or declension of the sun and not once did Demetrius refer to the subject of his discourse with her on that first moonlight night of her arrival. Her knowledge of Latin and Greek stood her in good stead, for she was set to translate some musty rolls of vellum, on which were inscribed certain abstruse scientific propositions of a thousand years old, problems propounded by the Assyrians, and afterwards copied by the Latins, who, for the most part, had left out some of the original phraseology, thereby losing valuable hints and suggestions, which Demetrius was studying to discover and replace. Diana was a careful, clever, and devotedly conscientious worker. Nothing escaped her, and she shirked no pains to unravel the difficulties, which, to less interested students, might have seemed insuperable. Much as she desired to know more of Demetrius himself, and his own special line of research, she held her peace and asked no questions, merely taking his instructions and faithfully doing exactly as she was told. She worked in the great library where he had at first received her, and where the curious steel instrument she had noticed on entering swung to and fro continuously striking off a pin's point of fire as it moved. Sometimes in the pauses of her close examination of the faded and difficult Latin script on which all her energies were bent, she would lift her eyes and look at this strange object as though it were a living companion in the room, and would almost mentally ask it to disclose its meaning. And one morning, impelled by a sudden fancy, she put her watch open on the table, and measured the interval between one spark of fire and the next. She at once found that the dots of flame were struck off with precision at every second. They were, in fact, seconds of time. So that, if one had leisure to watch the thing, she mused, one would know that when sixty fire flashes have flown into air, one minute has passed, and I wonder what becomes of these glittering particles. She knew well enough that they did not perish, but were only absorbed into another elemental organism. She had observed, too, that the movement of the whole machine, delicately balanced on its crystal pedestal, was sharp and emphatic when the sun was at the meridian, and more subdued, though not less precise, in the afternoon. She had very little opportunity, however, to continue a long watching of this inexplicable and apparently meaningless contrivance after midday, as then her hours of work were considered over, and she was free to do as she liked. Sometimes she remained in her own apartments, practising her music, or reading, and more often than not she went for a drive out into the open country with Madame Demetrius, with a light victoria and pear, which was a gift from Demetrius to his mother, who could not be persuaded to drive in a motor-car. It was a charming turnout, recognised in the neighbourhood as the doctor's carriage, for, though Geneva and its environs are well supplied with many professors of medicine and surgery, 
Demetrius seemed at this period to have gained a reputation apart from the rest as the doctor par excellence. Once Diana asked him whether he had a large practice. He laughed. None at all, he replied. I tell everybody that I have retired from the profession in order to devote all my time to scientific research, and this is true, but it does not stop people from sending for me at a critical moment when all other efforts to save a life have failed. And then, of course, I do my best. And are you always successful? She went on. Not always. How can I be? If I am sent for, to rescue a man who has overfed and overdrunken himself, from his youth onwards, and who, as a natural consequence, has not a single organ in his body free from disease, all my skill is of no avail. I cannot hinder him from toppling into the unconsciousness of the next embryo, where, it is to be hoped, he will lose his diseases with his fleshy particles. I can save a child's life, generally and the lives of girls and women who have not been touched by man. The life principle is very strong in these. It has not been tampered with. He closed the conversation abruptly, and she perceived that he had no inclination to talk of his own healing power or ability. After about a month or six weeks at the Chateau Fragonard, Diana began to feel very happy, happier than she had ever been in her life. Though she sometimes thought of her parents, she knew perfectly that they were not people to grieve long about any calamity. Besides which, her death was not a calamity so far as they were concerned. They would call it such, for convention's sake, and in deference to social and civil observances. But Ma would console herself with a paid companion housekeeper, and if that companion housekeeper chanced to be in the least good-looking or youthful, Pa would blossom out into such a juvenility of white and fancy waistcoats and general conduct as frequently distinguishes elderly gentlemen who are loath to lose their reputation for gallantry. And Diana wasted no time in what would have been foolish regret, had she felt it, for her complete and fortunate severance from home, which was only home to her because her duty made her consider it so. A great affection had sprung up between her and Madame Demetrius. The handsome old lady was a most lovable personality, simple, pious, unaffected, and full of a devotion for her son, which was as touching as it was warm and deep. She had absolute confidence in him, and never worried him by any inquisitiveness concerning the labours which kept him nearly all day away from her, shut up in his laboratory, which he alone had the secret of opening or closing. Hers was the absolute reliance of the perfect love which casteth out fear. All that he did was right, and must be right in her eyes, and when she saw how whole-heartedly and eagerly Diana threw herself into the tedious and difficult work he had put before her to do, she showed towards that hitherto lonely and unloved woman a tenderness and consideration to which for years she had been unaccustomed. Very naturally, Diana responded to this kindness with impulsive warmth and gratitude, and took pleasure in performing little services— such as a daughter might do, for the sweet-natured and gentle lady, whose friendship and sympathy she appreciated more and more each day. She loved to help her in little household duties, to mend an occasional tiny hole in the fine old lace which Madame generally wore with her rich black silk gowns, to see that her armchair and footstool were placed just as she liked them to be, to wind the wool for her knitting, and to make her laugh with some quaint or witty story. Diana was an admirable raconteuse, and she had a wonderful memory. Moreover, her impressions of persons and things were tinged with the gaiety of a perceptive humour. Sometimes Demetrius himself, returning from a walk or from a drive in his small open auto-car, 
would find the two sitting together by a cheerful log fire in the drawing-room laughing and chatting like two children diana busy with her embroidery her small well-shaped white hands moving swiftly and gracefully among the fine wools from which she worked her jacobean designs and his mother knitting comforts for the poor in preparation for the winter which was beginning to make itself felt in keen airs and gusts of snow on one of these occasions he stood for some minutes on the threshold looking at them as they sat their backs turned towards him so that they were not at once aware of his presence diana's head crowned with its bright twists of hair was for the moment the chief object of his close attention he noted its compact shape and the line of the nape of the neck which carried it a singularly strong and perfect line if judged by classic methods it denoted health and power with something of pride and he studied it anatomically and physiologically with all the interest of a scholar suddenly she turned and seeing him apparently waiting at the door smiled a greeting do you want me she asked he advanced into the room ought i to want you he counter-queried these are not working hours if you were a british workman such an idea as my wanting you out of time would never enter your head as a british working woman you should stipulate for the same privileges as a british working man he drew a chair to the fire and as his mother looked at him with loving welcoming eyes he took her hand and kissed it winter is at hand he continued giving a stir with the poker to the blazing logs in the grate it is cold to-day with the cold of the glaciers and i hear that the snow blocks all the mountain passes we are at the end of october we must expect some bitter weather but in switzerland the cold is dry and bracing it strengthens the nerves and muscles and improves the health how do you stand a severe winter miss may i have never thought about it she answered all seasons have beauty for me and i have never suffered very much by either the cold or the heat i think i have been more interested in other things he looked at her intently what other things she hesitated a faint colour stole over her cheeks well i hardly know how to express it things of life and death i have always been rather a suppressed sort of creature with all my aims and wishes pent up <laughs> pressed into a bottle as it were and corked tight <laughs> she laughed and went on perhaps if the cork were drawn there might be an explosion but wrongly or rightly i have judged myself as an atom of significance made insignificant by circumstances and environment and i have longed to make my significance however small distinct and clear even though it were only a pin's point of meaning if i said this to ordinary people they would probably exclaim how dull and laugh at me for such an idea of course dull people would laugh agreed demetrius people in the aggregate laugh at most things except lack of money that makes them cry if not outwardly then inwardly but i do not laugh for if you can forget heat and cold and rough weather in the dream of seeking to discover your own significance and meaning in a universe where truly nothing exists without its set place and purpose you are a woman of originality as well as intelligence but that much of you i have already discovered she glanced at him brightly you are very kind now do you mean that seriously or ironically he queried with a slight smile i am not really very kind i consider myself very cruel to have kept you chained for more than a month to rolls of vellum inscribed with crabbed old latin characters illegible enough to bewilder the strongest eyes 
but you have done exceedingly well, and we have all three had time to know each other and to like each other, so that a harmony between us is established. Yes, you have done more than exceedingly well. I am glad you were pleased, said Diana simply, resting one hand on her embroidery frame and looking at him with somewhat tired, anxious eyes. I was rather hoping to see you this evening, though it is, as you say, after working hours, for I wanted very much to tell you that the manuscript I am now deciphering seems to call for your own particular attention. I should prefer your reading it with me before I go further. You are very conscientious, he said, fixing his eyes keenly upon her. Is she not, mother mine? She is afraid she will learn something important and necessary to my work before I have a chance to study it for myself, loyal Miss Diana. Madame Demetrius glanced wistfully from her son to Diana, and from Diana back to her son again. Yes, she is loyal, Feodor. You have found a treasure in her, she said. I am sure of it. It seems a providence that she came to us. Is it not Shakespeare who says there's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow? He queried lightly. How much more special, then, is the coming of a Diana? It was the first time he had used her Christian name without any ceremonious prefix in her presence, and she was conscious of a thrill of pleasure, for which she instantly reproached herself. I have no business to care what or how he calls me, she thought. He's my employer, nothing more. Diana, repeated Demetrius, watching her narrowly from under his now half-shut eyelids. Diana is a name fraught with beautiful associations. The Divine Huntress, the Goddess of the Moon, Diana, the Fleet of Foot, the Lady of the Silver Bow. What poet's dreams, what delicate illusions, what lovely legends are clustered round the name. She looked at him, half amused, half indifferent. Yes, it is a thousand pities I was ever given such a name, she said. If I were a Martha, a Deborah, or a Sarah, it would suit me better. But Diana, it suggests a beautiful young woman. You were young once, he suggested, meaningly. Ah, yes, once. And she sighed. Once is a long time ago. I never regret youth, said Madame Demetrius. My age has been much happier and more peaceful. I would not go back to my young days. That is because you have fulfilled your particular destiny, interposed her son. You fell in love with my father. What happy times they must have been when the first clamour of attraction drew you both to one another. You married him, and I am the result. Dearest mother, there was nothing more for you to do with your devoted and gentle nature. You became the wife of a clever man. He died having fulfilled his destiny in giving you, may I say so? A clever son, myself. What more can any woman ask of ordinary nature? <laughs> he laughed gaily, and putting his arm round his mother, fondled her as if she were a child. Yes, beloved, you have done all your duty, he went on. But you have sacrificed your own identity, the thing that Miss Diana calls her significance. You lost that willingly when you married. All women lose it when they marry, and you have never quite found it again. But you will find it. The slow process of evolution will make of you a fine spirit when the husk of material life is cast off for wider expansion. As he spoke, Diana looked at mother and son with the odd sense of being an outside spectator of two entirely unconnected identities, the one overpowering and shadowing the other, but wholly unrelated, and more or less opposed in temperament. Madame Demetrius was distinguished by an air of soft and placid dignity, 
made sympathetic by a delicate touch of lassitude indicative of age and a desire for repose while feodor demetrius himself gave the impression of a strong energy restrained and held within bounds as a spirited charger is reined and held in by his rider and above all of a man aware of his own possibilities and full of set resolve to fulfil them is that embroidery of a very pressing nature he suddenly said then with a smile or do you think you could spare a few moments away from it she at once put aside her frame and rose did i not ask you when you came in if you wanted me she queried somehow i was quite sure you did you know i am always ready to serve you if i can he still had one arm round his mother but he raised his eyes and fixed them on diana with an expression which was to her new and strange i know you are he said slowly and i shall need your service in a difficulty very soon but not just now i have only a few things to say which i think should not be put off till to-morrow we'll go into the library and talk there he bent down and kissed his mother's snowy and still luxuriant hair adding for her benefit we shall not be long dearest of women keep warm and cosy by the fire and you will not care for the significance of yourself so long as you are loved that is all some women ask for love is it not enough said diana conscious of her own asking in that direction enough no not half or quarter enough not for some women or some men they demand more than this and they have a right to demand more out of the infinite riches of the universe love or what is generally accepted under that name is a mere temporary physical attraction between two persons of opposite sex which lessens with time as it is bound to lessen because of the higher claims made on the soul a painful thing to realize but we must not shiver away from truth like a child shivering away from its first dip in the sea or be afraid of it lovers forget lovers friends forget friends husbands forget wives and vice versa the closest ties are constantly severed you are wrong feodor we do not forget said madame demetrius with tender reproach in her accents i do not forget your father he is dear to me as lover and husband still and whether god shall please to send my soul to heaven or to hell i could never forget my love for you beloved i know i feel all you say but you are an exception to the majority and we will not talk personalities i cannot <laughs> here he laughed and kissed her hand again i cannot have my theories upset by a petite mamma he left the room then and diana followed him once in the library he shut the door and locked it now you spoke of something in your translations that seemed to call for my attention he said i am ready to hear what it is diana went to the table desk where she habitually worked and took up some pages of manuscript neatly fastened together in readable form it is a curious subject she said in the assyrian originals it seems to have been called the problem of the fourth sixth and seventh culminating in the eighth whether the latin rendering truly follows the ancient script it is of course impossible to say but while deciphering the latin i came to the conclusion that the fourth sixth and seventh were named in the problem as rays or tones of light and the proposed culmination of the eighth stop exclaimed demetrius in a strained eager voice give me your papers let me see she handed them to him at once and he sat down to read while he was thus occupied her gaze constantly wandered to the small scythe-like instrument mowing off the seconds in dots of flame as a mower sweeps off the heads of daisies in the grass a curious crimson colour seemed to be diffused round the whole piece of mechanism 
an effect she had never noticed before. And then she remembered it was late in the afternoon, and that the sun had set. The rosy light emanating from the instrument, and deeply reflected in the crystal pedestal on which it was balanced, seemed like an afterglow from the sky. But the actual grey twilight outside was too pronounced and cold to admit of such an explanation. Suddenly Demetrius looked up. "'You are right,' he said. "'This ancient problem demands my closest study, and yet it is no problem at all, but only an exposition of my inmost thought.' He paused, then, "'Come here, Diana May,' he continued. "'I may as well begin with you. Come and sit close beside me.' She obeyed. With his eyes fixed upon her face, he went on. "'You, as a woman of superior intelligence, have never supposed, I am sure, that I have secured your services merely to decipher and copy out old Latin script. No, I see by your look that you have fully realised that such is not all the actual need I have of you. I have waited to find out, by a study of your character and temperament, when and how I could state plainly my demands.' I think I need not wait much longer. Now, this ancient treatise on problems, obscure and involved in wording as it is, helps me to the conviction that I am on the right track of discovery. It treats of light, the problem of the fourth, sixth, and seventh, with its ultimate culmination of the eighth, is the clue. In that ultimate culmination is the great secret. His eyes flashed, his features were transfigured by an inward fervour. Have the patience to follow me but a little, he continued. You have sense and ability, and you can decipher a meaning from an apparent chaos of words. Consider, then, that within the limitations of this rolling ball, the earth, we are permitted to recognise seven tones of music and seven tones of colour. The existing numbers of the creative sum, so far as we can count them, are seven and five, which added together make twelve, itself a creative number. Man recognises in himself five senses, touch, taste, sight, hearing, smell. But, as a matter of fact, he has seven, for he should include intuition and instinct, which are more important than all the others, as the means of communicating with his surroundings. Now, the culmination of the eighth is neither five nor seven nor twelve. It is the close or rebound of the octave, the end of the leading seven, the point where a fresh seven begins. It is enough for humanity to have arrived at this for the present, for we have not yet sounded the heights or depths of even the first seven radiations which we all agree to recognise. We admit seven tones of music and seven tones of colour, but what of our seven rays of light? We have the violet ray, the X-ray, and a newly discovered ray showing the working bodily organism of man, but there are seven rays piercing the density of ether which are intended for the use and benefit of the human being, and which are closely connected with his personality, his needs, and his life. Seven rays, and it is for us to prove and test them all, which is the very problem you have brought to my notice in this old Latin document. The fourth, sixth, and seventh, culminating in the eighth. He put the papers carefully together on the table beside him, and turned to Diana. You have understood me? She bent her head. Perfectly. You recall the incidents of the first day of your arrival here, your brief visit to my laboratory, and what you saw there? She smiled. Do you think I could ever forget? Well, that being so, I do not see why I should wait. He said, musingly, and speaking more to himself than to her. There is no reason why I should not begin at once the task which is bound to be long and difficult. My subject is at my disposal. I am free to operate. He rose and went to an iron-bound cabinet which he unlocked and took from thence a small phial containing what appeared to be a glittering globule like an unset jewel which moved restlessly to and fro in its glass prison. He held it up before her eyes. "'Suppose I ask you to swallow this,' he said. For all answer, 
she stretched out her hand to take the file. He laughed. Upon my word, you are either very brave or very reckless, he exclaimed. I hardly know what to think of you, but you shall not be deceived. This is a single drop of the liquid you saw in process of distillation within its locked-up cell. It has a potent eye, a terrific force, and may cause you to swoon. On the other hand, it may have quite the contrary effect. It should revivify. It may disintegrate, but I cannot guarantee its action. I know its composition, but mark you, I have never tested it on any human creature. I cannot try it on myself, for if it robbed me of my capacity to work, I have no one to carry on my researches, and I would not try it on my mother. She is too old, and her life is too precious to me. Well, my life is precious to nobody, said Diana, calmly. Not even to myself. Shall I take your little dram now? Demetrius looked at her in amazement that was almost admiration. If you would rather wait a few days, or even weeks longer, do so, he answered. I will not persuade you to any act of this kind in a hurry, for it is only the first test of many to come. And if I survive the first, I shall be good for the last, said Diana merrily. So come, Dr. Feodor, give me the mysterious drop of liquid fire. Her face was bright with animation and courage, but his grew pale and haggard with sudden fear. As he still hesitated, she sprang up and took the file from his hand. Diana, let me hold you, he cried in real agitation, and he caught her firmly round the waist. Believe me, there is danger, but if you will... One, two, three, and away, said she, and taking the tiny glass stopper from the phial, she swallowed its contents. One, two, three, and away, it was indeed, for she felt herself whirled off into a strange, dark, slippery vortex of murderous cold, which suddenly changed to blazing heat, then again to cold. She saw giant pinnacles of ice and enormous clouds of flame rolling upon her as from a burning sky. Then she seemed to be flying along over black chasms and striving to escape from a whirlwind which enveloped her as though she were a leaf in a storm. Till at last no thought, no personal consciousness remained to her. And, giving up all resistance, she allowed herself to fall, down, down, ever so far, when, all at once, a vital freshness and elasticity possessed her, as though she had been suddenly endowed with wings, and she came to herself standing upright as before, with Demetrius holding her in the strong grasp of one arm. Well she said, aware that she trembled violently, but otherwise not afraid. It wasn't bad, not much taste about it. She saw that he was deadly pale. His eyes were misty with something like tears in them. You brave woman, he said in a low tone. You daring soul, but are you sure you are all right? Can you stand alone? She drew away from his hold. Of course, firm as a rock. He looked at her wonderingly, almost with a kind of terror. Thank God, he murmured. Thank God I have not killed you. If I had... He dropped into a chair and buried his face in his hands. Still trembling a little as she was, she felt deeply touched by his evident emotion, and with that sudden, new and surprising sense of lightness and buoyancy upon her, she ran to him and impulsively knelt down beside him. "'Don't think of it, please,' she said entreatingly, her always sweet voice striking a soothing note on the air. "'Don't worry, all is well. I'm as alive as I can be.' If you had killed me, I quite understand you would have been very sorry. 
but it really wouldn't have mattered in the interests of science the only trouble for you would have been to get rid of my body bodies are always such a nuisance but with all your knowledge i dare say you could have ground me into a little heap of dust <laughs> and she laughed quite merrily please don't sit in such an attitude of despair you're not half cold-hearted enough for a scientist he raised his head and looked at her that's true he said and smiled but i wonder what has made you the strange woman you are no fear of the unknown no hesitation even when death might be the result of your daring surely there never was one of your sex like you oh yes i'm sure there have been and are many she answered rising from her knees and smiling in cheerful response to his happier expression women are queer things and there's a part of their queerness which men never understand when they've lost everything i mean everything which they and their particular nature and sentiment regard as precious the chief of these being love which you don't think matters much to anybody they get reckless some of them take to drink others to drugs others to preaching in the streets others to an openly bad life or to any crooked paths leading away and as far as possible from their spoilt womanhood men are to blame for it entirely to blame for treating them as toys instead of friends men are like children who break the toys they have done with and a woman who has been broken in this way has no fear of the unknown because the known is bad enough and she does not hesitate to face death being sure it cannot be worse than life at any rate that's how i feel or rather how i have felt just now i'm extraordinarily glad to be alive that is because you are conscious of a narrow escape he said with a keen glance at her isn't it so she considered for a moment no i don't believe it is she replied it's something quite different to that i'm not in the least aware that i've had a narrow escape but i do know that i feel as happy as a schoolgirl out for her first holiday that's rather an odd sensation for a woman of mature years oh i know what it is it's the globule <laughs> she laughed and clapped her hands that's it doctor you may thank your stars that your first test has succeeded here i am living and something is dancing about in my veins like a new sort of air and a new sort of sunshine it's a lovely feeling he rose from the chair where he had thrown himself in his momentary dejection and approaching her took her hand and laid his fingers on her pulse he had entirely recovered his usual air of settled and more or less grave composure yes he said after a pause your pulse is firmer and younger so far so good now obey me go and lie down in your own room for a couple of hours sleep if you can but at any rate keep in a recumbent position you have a charming view from your windows and even in a grey autumn twilight like this there is something soothing in the sight of the alpine snow line rest absolutely quiet till dinner time and afterwards you will tell me how you feel or rather i shall be able to judge for myself he released her hand but before doing so kissed it with a russian's usual courtesy i repeat you are a brave woman as brave as any philosopher that ever swallowed hemlock and if your courage holds out sufficiently to endure the whole of my experiment i shall owe you the triumph and gratitude of a lifetime End of chapter 11「12 of the Young Diana」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The Young Diana by Marie Corelli Chapter Twelve Once in her own pretty suite of rooms, Diana locked the door of the entresol so that no one might enter by chance. She wished to be alone that she might collect her thoughts and meditate on the narrow escape, which she had experienced without actually realising any danger. Her sitting-room was grey with the creeping twilight, and she went to the window and opened it, leaning out to breathe the snowy chillness of the air which came direct from the scarcely visible mountains. A single pale star twinkled through the misty atmosphere, and the stillness of approaching night had in it a certain heaviness and depression. With arms folded on the window sill, she looked as far as her eyes could see, far enough to discern the glimmering white of the Savoie Alps, which at the moment presented merely an outline, as of foam on the lip of a wave. After a few minutes, she drew back and shut the window, pulling the warm tapestry curtains across it, and pressing the button which flooded her room with softly shaded electric light. Then she remembered. She had been told to rest in a recumbent position. So, in obedience to this order, she lay down on the comfortable sofa provided for her use, stretching herself out indolently with a sense of delightful ease. She was not at all in a lazing mood, and though she tried to go to sleep, she could not. I'm broad awake, she said to herself, and I want to think. It isn't a case of mustn't think now. I feel I must think. And the first phase of her mental effort was her usual one of wonder. Why had she so much confidence in Demetrius? How was it that she was quite ready to sacrifice herself to his experiment? It seems odd, she argued, and yet it isn't, because the fact is plain that I have nothing to live for. If I had any hope of ever being a somebody, or of doing anything really useful, of course I should care for my life. But to be quite honest with myself, I know I'm of no use to anyone except to him. And I'm getting a thousand a year and food and a home, a lovely home. So why shouldn't I trust him? If, in the end, his experiment kills me, as he seemed to think it might just now, well, one can only die once, and so far as the indifferent folks at home know or believe, I'm dead already. <laughs> she laughed and nestled her head cosily back on the silken sofa cushions. Oh, I'm all right, I'm sure. Whatever happens will be for the best. I'm certainly not afraid. And I feel so well. She closed her eyes, then opened them again, like a child who has been told to go to sleep, and who gives a mischievous bright glance at its nurse to show that it is wide awake. Moving one little slim foot after the other, she looked disapprovingly at her shoes. "'Ugly things,' she said. "'They were bought in the Devonshire village. Flat and easy to get about the house with. Suitable for a housekeeping woman of mature years. I don't like them now. They don't seem to suit my feet at all. If I had really turned up my toes to the daisies when I swallowed that mysterious globule, these shoes would not have added to the grace of my exit.' Amused at herself, she let her thoughts wander as they would, and it was curious how they flew about like butterflies settling only on the brightest flowers of fancy. She had grown into a habit of never looking forward to anything, but just now she found herself keenly anticipating a promised trip to Davos during the winter, whither she was to accompany Demetrius and his mother. She was a graceful skater, and a skating costume seemed suggested, why not send her measurements to Paris and get the latest? A pleasant vision of rich, royal blue cloth trimmed with dark fur flitted before her. 
then she fancied she could hear her father's rasping voice remarking choose something strong and serviceable linsey woolsey or stuff of that kind your mother used to buy linsey woolsey for her petticoats and they never wore out you should get that sort of material never mind how it looks only very young people go in for mere fashion she indulged in a soft little giggle of mirth at this reminiscence of pa and then with another stretch out of her body and a sense of warmest deepest comfort she did fall asleep at last a sleep as sweet and dreamless as that of a child she was roused by a knocking at the door of the entresol and sprang up remembering she had locked it running to open it she found the femme de chambre rose standing outside i am so sorry to disturb madame said the girl smiling but there is only now a quarter of an hour to dinner-time and monsieur demetrius sent me to tell you this in case you were asleep i was asleep and diana twisted up a tress of her hair which had become loosened during her slumber how dreadfully lazy of me thank you rose i won't be ten minutes dressing when she spoke she noticed that rose looked at her very curiously and intently but made no remark passing into the rooms the maid performed her usual duties of drawing blinds closing shutters and turning on the electric lights in the bedroom then before going she said sleep is a great restorer madam you look so much better for an afternoon's rest with that she retired and diana hurried her toilette she was in such haste to get out of her daily working garb into a rest gown that she never looked in the mirror till she began to arrange her hair and then she became suddenly conscious of an alteration in herself that surprised her what was it it was very slight almost too subtle to be defined and she could not in the least imagine where the change had occurred but there was undoubtedly a difference between the face that had looked at her from that same mirror some hours previously and the one that looked at her now it was no more than the lightest touch given by some great painter's brush to a portrait a touch which improves and lifts the whole expression however she had no time to wait and study the mystery minutes were flying and the silver arrow of the warning dial pointed to the figure eight and its attendant word dinner even as she looked the chime struck the hour so she almost jumped into a gown of pale blue chosen because it was easy to put on and pinning a few roses from one of the vases in her room among the lace at her neck she ran downstairs just in time to see demetrius taking his mother on his arm as he always did when there were no guests into the dining-room she followed quickly with the murmured apology i'm so sorry to be late never mind my dear said madame demetrius feodor tells me you have had some hard work to do and that he wished you to rest i hope you slept but as she put the question her eyes opened widely in a sudden expression of wonderment and she gazed at diana as though she were something very strange and new yes she must have slept i think put in demetrius quietly and with marked emphasis she looks thoroughly rested but madame demetrius was still preoccupied by thoughts that bewildered her she could hardly restrain herself while the servant vasho was in the room and the moment he left it to change the courses she began feodor don't you see a great difference he made her a slight warning sign dear mother let us defer questions till after dinner miss diana to your health and he took up his glass of champagne towards her you are looking remarkably well and both my mother and i are glad that the air of switzerland agrees with you half pleased half puzzled diana smiled her recognition of the friendly toast but in her own mind wondered what it all meant 
why did dear old madame demetrius stare at her so much why did even vasho the negro servant roll the whites of his eyes at her as though she were somebody he had never seen before and taking these things into account why did demetrius himself maintain such an indifferent and uninterested demeanour nevertheless whatever the circumstances might portend she was more disposed to mirth than gravity and the delicious timbre of her voice made music at table both in speaking and laughter the music of mingled wit and eloquence rare enough in a man but still rarer in a woman very few women have the art of conversing intelligently and at a dinner nowadays the chief idea seems to be to keep on safe ground avoiding every subject of any real interest but diana was not particular in this regard she talked and talked well on this evening she seemed to throw herself with greater zest into the always for her congenial task of keeping her mysterious employer and his mother amused and demetrius himself began to feel something of the glamour of a woman's fascination against which he had always been as he boasted spirit-proof his was a curious and complex nature for years and years ever since his early boyhood he had devoted himself to the indefatigable study of such arts and sciences as are even now regarded as only possible but non-proven and he had cut himself off from all the ordinary ambitions as well as from the social customs and conventions of the world in order to follow up a certain clue which his researches had placed in his hands though his ultimate intention was to benefit humanity he was so fearful of miscalculating one line of the mathematical problem he sought to solve that for the time being humanity weighed as nothing in his scale he would admit of no obstacle in his path and though he was not a cruel man if he had found that he would need a hundred human subjects to work upon he would have killed them all without compunction had killing been necessary to the success of his experiments and yet he had a heart which occasionally gave him trouble as contending with his brain for the brain was cool and calculating and the heart was warm and impulsive he had never actually shunned women because they too as well as men were needful points of study but most of the many he had met incurred his dislike or derision because of what he considered their unsettled fancies and general vagueness his mother he adored but to no other woman had he ever accorded an atom of really deep or well-considered homage when he advertised for a woman to help him in his experimental work he did so honestly because he judged a woman especially of mature years was of no particular use to anybody or if she did happen to be of use she could easily be replaced with an almost brutal frankness he had said to himself if the experiment i make upon her should prove fatal she will be the kind of human unit that is never missed but diana was an unexpected sort of unit her independence clear perception and courage were a surprise to him her mature years did not conceal from him the fact that she had once been charming to look at and one point about her which gave him especial pleasure was her complete resignation of any idea that she could have attraction for men at her age he knew how loath even the oldest women are to let go this inborn notion of captivating or subjugating the male sex but diana was wholesomely free from any touch of the volatile spinster and unlike the immortal miss tox in dombey and son was not in the least prone to indulge in a dream of marriage with the first man who might pay her a kindly compliment and his dread of the possible result of his first experimental essay upon her was perfectly genuine while his relief at finding her none the worse for it was equally sincere looking at her now 
and listening to her bright talk and to the soft ripple of her low sweet laughter his thoughts were very busy she was his subject a living subject bound by her signed agreement to be under his command and as much at his disposal as a corpse given over for anatomical purposes to a surgeon's laboratory he did not propose to have any pity upon her even if at any time her condition should call for pity his experiment must be carried out at all costs he did not intend to have any more heart for her than the vivisector has for the poor animal whose throbbing organs he mercilessly probes but to-night he was conscious of a certain attraction about her for which he was not prepared he was in a sense relieved when dinner was over and when she and his mother left the room as soon as they had gone he addressed vasho did you see the negro inclined his head and his black lips parted in a smile it is the beginning said demetrius meditatively but the end is far off vasho made rapid signs with his fingers in the dumb alphabet his words were the master will perhaps be overmastered demetrius laughed and patted the man kindly on the shoulder vasho you are an oracle how fortunate you are dumb but your ears are keen keep them open vasho nodded emphatically and with his right hand touched his forehead and then his feet signifying that from head to foot he was faithful to duty and demetrius thereupon went into the drawing-room there to find diana seated on a low stool beside his mother's chair talking animatedly about their intended visit to davos platz madame demetrius instantly assailed him with the question she had previously started at dinner feodor you put me off just now she said but you really must tell me if you see any change in diana look at her and she put one hand under diana's chin and turned her face more up to the light isn't there a very remarkable alteration in her demetrius smiled well no not a very remarkable one he answered with affected indifference a slight one certainly for the better all doctors agree in the opinion that it is only after a month or two in a different climate that one begins to notice an improvement in health and looks nonsense interrupted his mother with a slight touch of impatience it's not that sort of thing at all it's something quite different well what is it laughed diana dear kind madame demetrius you always see something nice in me which is very flattering but which i don't deserve you are getting used to my appearance that's all you are both in league against me declared the old lady shaking her head feodor knows and you know that you are quite different i mean that you have a different expression i don't know what it is i'm sure i don't diana said still laughing i feel very well and very happy much better than i have felt for a long time and of course if one feels well one looks well did you feel as well and happy a few hours ago when you left me to go and do some work for feodor asked madame you did not look then as you look now diana glanced at demetrius questioningly mutely asking what she should say next he gave her a reassuring smile you are like a grand inquisitor mother mine he said and sharp as a needle in your scrutiny perhaps you are right miss may is a little altered in fact i think i may acknowledge and admit the fact but i'm sure it is so slight a change that she has scarcely noticed it herself and when she has retired and gone to bed you and i will have a little private talk about it will that satisfy you she looked at him trustfully and with a great tenderness i am not unsatisfied even now my son she answered gently i am only curious i am like the lady in the fairy tale of bluebeard 
i want to unlock your cupboard of mystery and you won't cut my head off for that will you he laughed i would sooner cut off my own he said gaily be sure of that you shall know all that is needful in good time meanwhile miss diana had better leave us for the present diana at once rose and came towards him to say good night i hope i am not giving you too abrupt a dismissal he added but i think under the circumstances you should get all the rest you can she bent her head in mute obedience thanking him with a smile as she turned with a softly breathed good night to madame demetrius the old lady drew her close and kissed her bless you my dear she said if you change in your looks do not change in your heart that can hardly be guaranteed said demetrius diana looked at him can it not but i will be my own guarantee she said i shall not change not in love for my friends good night as she left the room they both looked after her her figure had a supple swaying grace of movement which was new and attractive and in an impulse of something not unlike fear madame demetrius laid her hand entreatingly on her son's arm what have you done to her feodor what are you doing his eyes glittered with a kind of suppressed menace nothing he answered nothing as yet what i shall do is another matter i have begun and i cannot stop she is my subject i am like that old-world painter who in sheer devotion to his art gave a slave poison in order that he might be able to watch him die and so paint a death agony accurately Feodor! she gave a little cry of terror do not be afraid mother mine my task is an agony of birth not death the travail of a soul reconstituting the atoms of its earthly habitation recharging with energy the cells of its brain the work of a unit whose house of clay is beginning to crumble and to whom i give the material wherewith to build it up again it all depends of course on the unit's own ability if you break a spider's web the mending of it depends on the spider's industry tenacity and constructive intelligence but whatever happens mark you whatever happens i have begun my experiment and i must go on i must go on to the very end no matter what that end may be she looked at him in wonder and appeal you will not you cannot be cruel feodor she said in a voice which trembled with suppressed alarm you will not injure the poor woman who works for you so patiently and who trusts you how can i tell whether i shall or shall not injure her he demanded almost fiercely science accepts no half service the poor woman as you call her knows her risks and has accepted them so far no injury has been done if i succeed she will have cause to thank me for the secret i have wrenched from nature should i fail she will not complain very much of a little more hurried exit from a world where according to her own statement she is alone and unloved madame demetrius clasped and unclasped her delicate old hands nervously and the diamonds in a ring she wore glittered scarcely more than the bright tears which suddenly fell from her eyes moved by a pang of remorse he fell on his knees beside her why mother he murmured soothingly you should not weep can you not trust me this woman diana may is a stranger and nothing to you certainly she is a kind bright creature with a great many undeveloped gifts of brain and character which make her all the more useful to me i give her as much chance as i give myself if i let her alone that is to say if i ignore all the reasons for which i engaged her and allow her to become a mere secretary or your domestic companion she goes on in the usual way of a woman of her years withering slowly sinking deeper in the ruts of care and fading into a non-entity for whom life is scarcely worth the living on the other hand if i continue my work upon her 
but what work asked his mother anxiously what result do you expect he rose from his kneeling attitude and straightened himself to his full height lifting his head with an unconscious air of defiance and pride i expect nature to render me obedience he said i expect the surrender of the flaming sword it turns every way to keep the way of the tree of life but the hilt must be given into my hand feodor oh my son such arrogance is blasphemy blasphemy mother you wrong yourself and me by the thought blasphemy is a lie to god like the utterance of the credo by people who do not believe but there is no blasphemy in searching for a truth as part of god's mind and devoutly accepting it when found the priest who tells his congregation that god is to be pleased or pacified by sufficient money in the collection plate blasphemes but i who most humbly adore his unspeakable beneficence in placing the means of health and life in our hands and who seek to use those means intelligently do not blaspheme i praise god with all my heart i believe in him with all my soul his attitude at the moment was superb his expression as of one inspired his mother looked at him fondly but the tears were still in her eyes feodor she said at last tremulously i i have grown fond of diana i shall not be able to look on and see her suffer he bent his brows upon her almost sternly when you do see her suffer it will be time to speak he answered not before and whatever else you see having no connection with suffering in any way you must allow to pass without comment or inquiry you love me i know well you will never prove your love for me more than by consenting to this if at any moment you can tell me that diana may is unhappy or in pain i promise you i will do my best to spare her but if nothing of this sort happens i rely on your silence and discretion may i do so she inclined her head gently you may he took her hand and kissed its soft finely wrinkled whiteness that's my kind mother he said tenderly always indulgent to me and my fancies as you have been i know you will not fail me now and so whatever change you observe or think you observe in my subject you must accept it as perfectly natural for it will be and not surprising or disturbing and you must tactfully check the comments and questions of others i foresee that chauvet will be tiresome he has taken a great fancy to diana and farnese of course is a perpetual note of interrogation but these people must be kept at a distance you have grown fond of diana you say fond of this complete stranger in our house but i am glad of it for she needs some sort of tenderness in a life which seems to have been exceptionally lonely grow still fonder of her if you like indeed it is probable you will for though she is anything but a child she has all a child's affection in her which apparently has been wasted or has met with scant return you think so and madame demetrius looked up with a smile i do think so assuredly but because i think so it does not follow that any return can come from me he said you are a person of sentiment i am not you are the one to supply her with the manna which falls from the heaven of a loving heart and by doing so you will help my experiment you will not tell me what the experiment really is she asked no because if it fails i should prefer to ridicule myself rather than that you should ridicule me and if i succeed the whole value of my discovery consists in keeping it secret very well and his mother rose and put away her knitting you shall do as you will feodor you were always a spoilt boy and you will be spoilt to the end my fault i know yes your fault beloved he said 
but a fault of instinctive knowledge and wisdom, for if you had not let me follow my own way, I might not have stumbled by chance on another way, a way which leads. He broke off abruptly with a wonderful, uplifted look in his eyes. She came to him and laid her gentle hands upon his shoulders. A way which leads. Where, my Feodor? Tell me. He drew her hands down and held them warmly clasped together in his. The way to that new heaven and new earth where God is with men, he answered in a low, rapt tone, where there shall be no more death, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, and where the former things are passed away. Be patient with my dream, it may come true. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of the Young Diana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter Thirteen. Meantime, Diana, up in her own room, was engaged in what to her had, of late years, been anything but an agreeable pastime namely, looking at herself in the mirror. She was keenly curious to find out what was the change in her appearance which had apparently surprised Madame Demetrius so much that she could hardly be restrained, even by her masterful son, from expressing open wonderment. She stood before the long cheval glass, gazing deeply into it as if it were the magic mirror of the Lady of Shalott, and as if she saw the helmet and the plume of bold Sir Lancelot. Her face was serious, calmly contemplative, but to herself she could not admit any positive change. Perhaps the slightest suggestion of more softness and roundness in the outline of the cheeks, and an added brightness in the eyes might be perceived, but this kind of improvement, as she knew, happened often as a temporary effect of something in the atmosphere, or of a happier condition of mind, and was apt to vanish as rapidly as it had occurred. Still looking at herself with critical inquisitiveness, she slipped out of her pale blue gown and stood revealed in an unbecoming gauntness of petticoat and camisole, so gaunt and crude in her own opinion, that she hastened to pull the pins out of her hair, so that its waving brightness might fall over her scraggy shoulders and flat chest, and hide the unfeminine hardness of these proportions. Then, with a deep sigh, she picked up her gown from the floor where she had let it fall, shook out its folds, and hung it up in the wardrobe. It's all nonsense, she said. I'm just the same thin old thing as ever. What difference Madame Demetrius can see in me is a mystery, and he... Here, Chancing to turn her head rather quickly from the wardrobe towards the mirror again, she saw the charming profile of a pretty woman. A woman with fair skin and a sparkling eye that smiled in opposition to the gravity of rather set lip lines, and the suddenness of this apparition gave her quite a nervous start. Who is it? she half whispered to the silence. Then, as she moved her head again and the reflection vanished, why, it's me, I do believe it's me. Amazed, she sat down to think about it. Then, with a hand glass, she tried to recapture the vision, but in vain. No position in which she now turned gave just the same effect. It's enough to drive one silly, she said. I won't bother myself any more about it. The plain truth is that I'm better in health and happier in mind than I've ever been, and of course I look as I feel. Only the dear Madame Demetrius hasn't noticed it before. And he? Well, he never notices anything about me except that I do his work well, or well enough to suit him. If his mysterious globule had killed me, 
i wonder whether he would have been really sorry she considered a moment then shook her head in a playful negative and smiled incredulously she finished undressing and throwing a warm boudoir wrap about her a pretty garment of pale rose silk lined with white fur which had been a parting gift from her friend sophy lansing and which as she had declared was fit for a princess she went into her sitting-room where there was a cheerful wood fire burning and sat down to read among the several books arranged for her entertainment on a row of shelves within reach of the hand was one old one bearing the title of the delusions whereby the wisest are deluded and the date fifteen hundred and eighty four taking this down she opened it haphazard at a chapter headed of the delusion of love it was written in an old style english with many quaint forms of expression more pointed and pithy than our modern newspaper slang how many otherwise sober and sane persons are there soliloquized the ancient author who nevertheless do pitifully allow themselves to be led astray by this passion which considered truly is no more than the animal attraction of male for female and female for male no whit higher than that which prevails in the insect and brute world for call it love as they will it is naught but lust as low an instinct or habit as that of craving for strong liquor or any wherewithal to still the insatiate demands of uncontrolled appetite love hath naught to do with lust for love is a principle not a passion for this cause it is comforting to read in holy scripture that in heaven there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage for there we are as the angels and to be as the angels implieth that we shall live in the principle and not in the passion could we conceive it possible on this earth for such an understanding to be arrived at between two persons of intelligence that they should love each other in this highest sense then there would be no satiety in their tenderness for one another and the delicacies of the soul would not be outraged by the coarseness of the body it is indeed a deplorable and mournful contemplation that we should be forced to descend from the inexpressible delights of an imagined ideal to the repulsive condition of the material sty and that the fairest virgin bred up softly with no rougher composition of spirit than that of a rose or a lily should be persuaded by this delusion of love to yield her beauties to the deflowering touch which destroys all maidenly reserve grace and modesty for the familiarity of married relations doth as is well known put an end to all illusions of romance and doth abase the finest nature to the gross animal level and though it is assumed to be necessary that generations should be born without stint to fill an already overfilled world meseemeth the necessity is not so great as it appeareth wars plagues and famines are bred from the unwisdom of overpopulation for whereas the overproduction of mites in a cheese do rot the cheese so doth the overproduction of human units rot the world therefore it is apparent to the sage and profound that while the material and animal portion of the race may very suitably propagate their kind they having no higher conception of their bodies or their souls the more intelligent and cleanly minority of purer and finer temperament may possibly find the way to a nobler and more lasting love than that which is wrongfully called by such a name a love which shall satisfy without satiating and which shall bind two spirits so harmoniously in one that from their union shall be born an immortal offspring of such great thoughts and deeds as shall benefit generations unborn and lead the way back to the lost paradise here diana let the book fall in her lap and sat meditating gazing into the hollows of the wood fire love it was the thing she had longed for the one joy she had missed to be loved to be dear to some one else seemed to her the very acme of all desirable attainment for with tennyson's hero in maud she felt 
if i be dear to some one else i should be to myself more dear her thoughts went homing like doves down the air spaces of memory to the days when she had or was fooled into believing she had a lover whose love would last a bold splendid creature with broad shoulders and comely countenance and eyes which looked love to eyes that spake again and when as the betrothed bride of the splendid creature she had thanked god night and morning for giving her so much happiness when the light in the skies and the flowers in the fields apparently took part in the joyous gratitude of her spirit and when the very songs of the birds had seemed for her a special wedding chorus she went over the incidents of that far-away period of her existence and presently she began to ask herself what after all did they amount to why when they were all cruelly ended had she shed such wild tears and prayed to god in such desperate agony was it worth while to have so shaken her physical and spiritual health for any splendid creature for what had he done to merit such passionate regret such weeping and wailing he had kissed her a great deal when he was in the mood for kissing and sometimes more than she quite cared for he had embraced her in gusts of brief and eager passion tinged with a certain sensuality which roused in her reluctant repulsion he had called her by various terms of endearment such as sweetest dearest and wood nymph a name he had bestowed upon her on one occasion when he had met her by chance in a shady corner of kew gardens and which he thought poetical but which she privately considered silly but what real meaning could be attached to these expressions when all suddenly his regiment was ordered to india and she had to part from him he had sworn fidelity and with many protestations of utmost tenderness had told her that as soon as cash would allow he would send for her to join him and marry her out there and for this happy consummation she had waited lovingly and loyally seven years meanwhile his letters grew shorter and fewer till at last when his father died and he came into a large fortune he struck the final blow on the patient life that had been sacrificed to his humour he wrote a last letter telling her he was married and so everything of hope and promise fell away from her like the falling leaves of a withering flower though her friend sophie lansing in hot indignation at the callous way in which she had been treated advised her to take on another man at once but poor diana could not do this hers was a loyal and tender spirit she was unable to transfer her affections from one to another au grand galop she thought of it all now in a half-amused way as she sat in her easy-chair by the sparkling fire in the charming room which she could for the present call her own surrounded by every comfort and luxury and she looked at her ringless hand that small daintily shaped hand on which for so many wasted years her lover's engagement ring had sparkled as a sign of constancy poor little hand it was shown off with effect at the moment lying with a passive prettiness on the roseate silk of her boudoir wrap as white as the white fur which just peeped beneath the palm suddenly she clenched it i should like to punish him she said it may be small it may be spiteful but it is human i should like to see him suffer for his treachery I should have no pity on him or his fat wife here she laughed at herself how absurd i am she went on making much ado about nothing the fat wife herself is a punishment for him i'm sure he's rich and has a big house in mayfair and five very ugly children that ought to be enough for him i saw his wife by chance at a bazaar quite lately like a moving jelly rather like poor mother in the fit of her clothes and smiling the 
ghastly smile of that placid ineffable content which marks the fool if i could do nothing else i'd like to disturb that smug self-satisfied constitution of oozing oil yes i would and who knows if i mayn't do it yet she rose and the antique book of delusions fell to the floor her slim figure loosely draped in the folds of crimson silk and white fur looked wonderfully graceful and well poised and had there been a mirror in the sitting-room as there was in the bedroom she might possibly have seen something in her appearance worthy of even men's admiration but her thoughts were far away from herself she had before her eyes the picture of her old lover grown slightly broader and heavier in build with ugly furrows of commonplace care engraven on his once smooth and handsome face henpecked probably by his stout better half and submitting to this frequently inevitable fate with a more or less ill grace and again she laughed a laugh of purest unforced merriment here i am like hamlet exceeding proud and revengeful and after all i ought to be devoutly thankful she said for if i analyse myself honestly i do not really consider i have lost anything in losing a man who would certainly have been an unfaithful husband what i do feel is the slight on myself that he should have callously allowed me to wait all those years for him and then have cast me aside like an old shoe is an injury which i think i may justly resent and which if i ever get the chance i may punish here her brows clouded and she sighed what an impossible idea i talk as if i were young with all the world before me and with power to realise my dreams when really everything of that sort is over for me and i have only to see how i can best live out the remainder of life then like a faint whisper stealing through the silence came the words which demetrius had spoken on the first night of her arrival that night when the moonlight had drenched the garden in a shower of pearl and silver what would you give to be young a thrill ran through her nerves as though they had been played upon by an electric vibration had demetrius any such secret as that which he hinted at or was he only deluding himself and was his brain by overmuch study slipping off the balance she had heard of the wisest scientists who after astonishing the world by the brilliancy of their researches and discoveries had suddenly sunk from their lofty pinnacles of attained knowledge to the depth of consulting mediums who pretended to bring back the spirits of the dead that they might converse with their relatives and friends in bad grammar and worse logic might not demetrius be just as unfortunate in his own special scientific line tired at last of thinking she resolved to go to bed and in her sleeping chamber she found herself facing the long mirror again something she saw there this time appeared really to startle her for she turned abruptly away from it threw off her wrap slipped into her nightgown and brushed her hair hastily without looking at herself for another second and kneeling at her bedside as she said her prayers she included an extra petition uttered in a strangely earnest whisper from all delusions of vanity self-love and proud thinking good lord deliver me the next morning she awoke filled and fired with a new resolve she had slept well and was strong in energy and spirit and she determined as she expressed it to herself to have it out with dr demetrius so after breakfast when he was about to go to his laboratory as usual she stopped him on the way i want to speak to you she said please give me a few moments of your time now he queried with a slight uplifting of his eyebrows she bent her head now in the library then he said and thither they went together on entering the room he closed the door behind them and stood looking at her somewhat quizzically well well she echoed 
slightly smiling. Are you wondering what I want to say? You ought not to wonder at all. You ought to know. I know nothing, he answered. I may guess, but guessing is risky. I prefer to hear. So you shall hear. And she drew a little closer to him. If I express myself foolishly, you must tell me. If you think me officious or overbold, you must reprove me. There is only one thing I will not bear from you, and that is, want of confidence. He looked at her in something of surprise. Want of confidence? My dear Miss Diana, you surely cannot complain on that score. I have trusted you more than I have ever trusted any man or any woman. Yes, she interrupted him, quickly. I know that wherever it is absolutely necessary to trust me, you have done so. But where you think it is unnecessary, you have not. For example, why don't you tell me just straight what you mean to do with me? His dark, lustrous eyes flashed up under their drooping lids. What I mean to do with you? he repeated. Why, what do you imagine? I imagine nothing, she answered quietly. The things you teach are beyond all imagination. But see, I have signed myself and my services away to you for a certain time, and as you have yourself said, you did not engage me merely to copy old Latin script. What you really want of me is, as I begin to understand, just what the vivisector wants with the animal he experiments upon. If this is so, I offer no opposition. I am not afraid of death, for I am out of love with life. But I want to know your aims. I want to understand the actual thing you are striving for. I shall be better able to help you if I know. You put me through one test yesterday. You saw for yourself that I had no fear of the death or life properties of the thing I took from your hand, without any hesitation. I have not even spoken of the amazing and terrifying sensations it gave me. I am ready to take it again at any moment. You have a willing servant in me, but, as I say, I feel I could help you more if I knew the ultimate end for which you work, and you must trust me. He listened attentively to every word, charmed with the silvery softness of her voice, and its earnest yet delicate inflections. I do trust you, he said, when she had ceased speaking. If I did not, you would not be here a day. I trusted you from the moment I saw you. If I had not, I should never have engaged you. So be satisfied on that score. For the rest, well, I confess I have hesitated to tell you more than— as you put it, seemed necessary for you to know. The old fear and the narrow miscomprehension of woman is still inherent in me, as in all of my sex, though I do my best to eliminate it, and I have thought that perhaps if I told you all my intentions with regard to yourself, you might, at the crucial moment, shrink back and fail me. When I shrink from anything you wish me to do, or fail in my undertaking to serve you loyally, I give you leave to finish me off in any way you please, she said calmly, and without warning. He smiled, but his eyes were sombre with thought. Sit down, he said, and signed to her to take a chair near the window. I will tell you as much as I can, as much as I know myself. It is briefly said. He watched her closely as, in obedience to his wish, she seated herself, and he noted the new and ardent brilliance in her eyes which gave them a look of youthful and eager vitality. Then he drew up another chair and sat opposite to her. Outside the window the garden had a wintry aspect. The flower-beds were empty, the trees were leafless, and the summits of the distant Alps peered white and sharp above a thick, fleece-like fog which stretched below. "'You say you are out of love with life,' he began, "'and this only because you have been spared the common lot of women, the so-called love which would have tied you to one man to be the drudge of his coarse passions till death. Well, I admit it is the usual sort of thing life offers to the female sex, but to be out of love with the stupendous and beautiful work of God— because this commonest of commonplace destinies has been denied you, is, pardon my brusquerie, 
mere folly and unreasoning sentiment however i am taking you at your word you are out of love with life and you are not afraid of death therefore to me you are not a woman you are a subject you put it very clearly just now when you said that i need you as the vivisector needs the animal he experiments upon that is perfectly correct i repeat that for my purpose you are not a woman you are simply an electric battery she looked up amazed then laughed as gaily as a child <laughs> an electric battery she echoed oh dear oh dear i have imagined myself as many things but never that and yet that is what you really are he said unmoved by her laughter it is what we all are men and women alike our being is composed of millions of cells charged with an electric current which emanates from purely material sources we make electricity to light our houses with and when the battery is dry we say the cells need recharging a simple matter youth was the light of your house of clay but the cells of the battery are dry they must be recharged she sat silent for a moment gazing at him as though seeking to read his inmost thought his dark fine eyes met hers without flinching and you you propose to recharge them she said slowly and wonderingly i not only propose to do it i have already begun the work he answered you want me to be straightforward come then give me the same confidence can you honestly say you see no difference and feel no difference in yourself since yesterday she gave a quick sigh no i cannot she replied i do see and feel a change in myself this morning i was almost terrified at the sense of happiness which possessed me happiness for nothing but just the joy of living it overwhelmed me like a wave she stretched out her arms with a gesture of indefinable yearning oh it seemed as if i had all the world in my hands the light the air the mere facts of breathing and moving were sufficient to make me content and i was overcome by the fear of my own joy that is why i determined to ask you plainly what it means and what i am to expect from you if all goes well you may expect such gifts as only the gods of old time were able to give he said in thrilling accents those poor gods they represented the powers that have since been put into man's hands their day is done now listen i have told you that i have commenced my work upon you and you are now the centre of my supreme interest you are precisely the subject i need for understand me well if you led a rackety life such as our modern women do if you had been obsessed by rabid passions hysterical sentiments greedy sensualities or disordered health you would have been of no use to me your cells speaking of you as a battery would under such conditions have been worn out and in a worn-out state could not have been recharged the actual renewal or perpetual germination of cells is a possibility of future science but up to the present we have not arrived at the right solution of the problem now perhaps you understand why i was to some extent startled when you took that first charge from my hand yesterday it was a strong and a dangerous test for if one or any of your cells had been in a broken or diseased state it might have killed you instantly as instantly as by a flash of lightning and if it had interrupted diana with a smile what would you have done i should have disposed of your remains he answered coolly and i should have arranged things so that no one would have been any the wiser not even my mother she laughed <laughs> you really are a first-class scientist she said no pity no remorse no regret his eyes flashed up in a sort of defiance who could feel pity remorse or regret for the fate of one miserable unit he exclaimed one atom among millions sacrificed in the pursuit of a glorious discovery that may fill with hope and renewed power the whole of the human race tens of thousands of men are slain in war and the useless holocaust is called a roll of honour but if one superfluous woman were killed in the aid of science it would be called murder 
senseless hypocrisy the only thing to regret would be failure failure to achieve result horrible but success what matter if a hundred thousand women perished so long as we possess the flaming sword he spoke with an almost wild excitation and diana began to think he must be mad mad with a dream of science mad with the overpowering force and flow of ideas too vast for the human brain why she asked in purposely cold and even tones have you chosen a woman as your subject why not a man a man would attempt to become my rival he answered at once and he would not submit to coercion without a struggle it is woman's nature instinctively to bend under the male influence one cannot controvert natural law woman does not naturally resist she yields i told you i wanted obedience and loyalty from you i knew you would give them you have done so and now that you partially know my aims i know you will do so still i shall not fail you said diana quietly but if i may know as much suppose you succeed in your idea of recharging the cells which make up me what will be the result to myself the result to yourself he repeated little can you imagine it little will you believe it even if i attempt to describe it what will it mean to you i wonder to feel the warmth and vigour of early youth once more tingling in your veins the elasticity and suppleness of youth in your limbs to watch the delicate and heavenly magic of a perfect beauty transfiguring your face to such fairness that it shall enchant all beholders stop stop cried diana almost angrily springing up from her chair and putting her hands to her ears this is mere folly dr demetrius you talk wildly and unreasonably you must be mad of course i am mad he answered rising at the same moment and confronting her as mad as all original discoverers are as mad as galileo newton george stevenson or madame curie and i am one with them in the madness that makes for a world's higher sanity come look at me and he took both her hands firmly in his own honestly can you say i am mad his eyes dark and luminous were steadfast and frank as the eyes of a faithful animal his expression serious even noble as she met his calm gaze the colour flushed her cheeks suddenly then as quickly faded leaving her very pale no i cannot she said swiftly and humbly forgive me but you deal with the impossible he loosened her hands nothing is impossible he said whatsoever the brain of man conceives in thought can be born indeed otherwise there would be a flaw in the mathematics of the universe which is a thing utterly inconceivable he paused then went on i have told you all that you wish to know are you satisfied she looked at him and a faint smile lifted the corners of her mouth if you are satisfied i am she replied what i seem to understand is this if you succeed in your experiment i shall feel and look younger than i do now we will leave the beauty part out of it and if you fail the cells you have begun to charge with your mysterious compound will disintegrate and there will be an end of me you have put the case with perfect accuracy he said that is so very well i am prepared and she went to the table desk where she usually worked and now i'll go on deciphering latin script she seated herself and turning over the papers she had left began to write an odd sense of compunction came over him as he looked at her and realized her courage patience and entire submission to his will and yet his careful and vigilant eye noted the improved outlines of cheek and chin the delicate almost imperceptible softening of the lately thin and angular profile and the foretaste of a coming scientific triumph was stronger in him than any other human feeling nevertheless she was a woman and moved by a sudden impulse he approached and bent over her as she worked diana he said very softly and kindly 
you will forgive me if i have seemed to you callous or cruel her heart beat quickly she was annoyed with herself at the nervous tremor which ran through her from head to foot i have nothing to forgive she answered simply i am your paid subject not a woman at all in your eyes and being so i am content to live or die in your service he hesitated another moment then possessing himself of the small hand that moved steadily across the paper on which she was writing he dexterously drew the pen from it and raised it to his lips with a grave and courteous gentleness then releasing it without look or word he went from the room treading softly and closing the door behind him end of chapter 13「Fourteen of the Young Diana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter Fourteen. So she knew. She knew that, as usual, she was, personally, a valueless commodity. So far as herself, her own life and feelings were concerned, her fate continued to follow her. No one was kindly or vitally interested in her. She was just a subject for experiment. She had suspected this all along, yet now that she had heard the fact stated coldly and dispassionately, she was more or less resentful. She waited a few minutes, her heart beating quickly and the vexed blood rising to her brows and making her cheeks burn, waited till she was sure Demetrius would not re-enter. Then, suddenly flinging down her pen, she rose and paced the room hurriedly, to and fro, scarce knowing what she did. Was it not hard, hard, she said to herself, with an involuntary clenching of her hands as she walked up and down, that she should never be considered more than a passive thing, to be used for other folk's advantage or convenience? How had it happened that no one in all the world had ever thought of putting himself, or herself, to use for her sake? The calm calculations of Theodore Demetrius on her possible death under his treatment had, though she would not admit it to herself, inwardly hurt her, yet after all, what had she any right to expect? She had answered a strange, very strange, advertisement, and through that action had come into association with the personality of a more than strange man of whose character and reputation she knew little or nothing. And, so far, she had fallen on her feet. That is to say, she had secured a comfortable home and handsome competence for the services she had pledged herself to render. Then, as she had taken the whole thing on trust, had she any cause to complain of the nature of those services? No, and in truth she did not complain. She only felt, felt to the core of her soul the callous indifference which Demetrius had plainly expressed as to her fate in the dangerous experiment he had already commenced upon her. Hot tears sprang to her eyes. She struggled with them, ashamed and humiliated. Children and girls cry, she said with self-contempt. I, being a woman of mature years, ought to know better. But, oh, it is hard, hard. Her thoughts flew to Madame Demetrius. Had she followed her first feminine impulse, she would have run to that kind old lady and asked for a little pity, sympathy, and affection. But she knew such an act would seem weak and absurd. Still walking up and down, her steps gradually became more measured and even. With one hand against her eyes, she pressed away the teardrops that hung on her lashes. Then, pausing, looked again, 
as she so often looked at the never-stopping steel instrument that struck off its little fiery sparks with an almost wearisome exactitude and monotony. Stretching out her hand, she tried to catch one of the flying dots of flame as one would catch a midge or a moth. She at last succeeded, and the glowing moat shone on her open palm like a ruby for about half a minute, then vanished leaving no trace but a slight tingling sensation on the flesh it had touched. "'A mystery,' she said, "'as involved and difficult to understand as my master himself.' She looked through the window at the grey, cold winter landscape, and let her eyes travel along the distant peaks of the alpine ranges, where, just now, the faintest gleam of sunshine fell. "'The world,' The natural world was beautiful, but how much more beautiful it would seem if one had the full heart and vigour to enjoy its beauty, if, with youth to buoy up the senses, one had the trained eye and mind to perceive and appreciate the lovely things of life. Could one ask for greater happiness? When we are quite young we hardly see nature, she mused. It is only in later years that we begin to find out how much we have missed. Now, if I, with my love of beauty, were young... Here her meditations came to an abrupt halt. Had not Demetrius promised that if he succeeded in his experiment, youth would be hers again? Youth united to experience? But would that be a desirable result? She wondered... The old, old story, she sighed. The old legend of Faust and the Devil, the thirst of mankind for a longer extension of youth and life. Only in my case I have not asked for these things, nor have I tried to summon up the devil. I am just an unwanted woman. Unwanted so far as the world is concerned, but useful just now as a subject for the recharging of cells. She gave a half-weary, half-scornful gesture, and resumed her work, and for an hour or more sat patiently translating and writing. But her thoughts were rebels, and went breaking into all manner of unfamiliar places. Moreover, she herself felt more or less rebellious and disposed to fight against destiny. At midday, the sun, which had been teasing the earth with shy glimpses of glory all the morning, shone out superbly, and set such a coronal of light on her hair as she sat at her desk, that if she could have seen herself she might have been flattered at the effect. But she was only conscious of the brightness that filled the room, a brightness that equally took possession of her mind, and filled her with cheerfulness. She even allowed herself a little run into the realms of fancy. Suppose he should succeed in his perfectly impossible task, she said. I, his subject, shall have him in my power. I never thought of that. Yet it's worth thinking about. I shall have given him the triumph of his life. He will set some value upon me then, and he'll never be able to forget me. Uh, more than that, according to his own assertion, I shall be young. Uh, and he spoke of beauty, too. All nonsense, of course, but if... If... If he makes me the crowning success of all his studies, I shall hold him in the hollow of my hand. Stimulated by this thought, she sprang up and stood proudly erect, a smile on her lips and radiance in her eyes. With all his learning, his calculations, and his cold-blooded science, yes, I shall hold him in the hollow of my hand. Recalling herself to her duties, she put all her papers and writing materials neatly away in order for the next morning's work, and leaving the library, went out in the garden for a turn in the fresh air before luncheon. The noonday sunshine was at the full, and her whole being responded to its warmth and brightness. A new outlook had presented itself to her view, and all hesitation, vexation, fear and depression vanished like a mist blown aside by the wind. She was entirely resolved now to go through with whatsoever strange ordeals Demetrius might ordain, no matter how much physical or mental suffering she might have to endure. 
the die is cast she said gaily addressing herself to a group of pine trees stiff with frost i'm all for youth and beauty or death on on diana that afternoon she went off for a walk by herself as it was frequently her custom to do she was allowed perfect freedom of action after the morning working hours she could go and come as she liked and both dr demetrius and his mother made it plainly evident that they trusted her implicitly she avoided geneva she instinctively felt that it would be wiser not to be seen there as the people of the hotel where she had stayed might recognize her one of her favourite walks was along the Morneau Road to a quaint little villa occupied by Professor Chauvet. This somewhat grim and ironical man of much learning had taken a great fancy to her, and she always made herself charming in his company, partly out of real liking for him, and partly out of compassion for his loneliness, for, apparently, he had no one in the world to care whether he lived or died, the only person to attend upon him being a wrinkled, toothless old woman from the canton grisson whose cooking was execrable while her excessive cleanliness was beyond reproach diana loved to hear the professor's half cynical half kindly talk she laughingly encouraged him to lay down the law as he delighted to do on all things human and divine and she was never tired of turning over his really unique and wonderful collection of unset gems of which he had enough to excite the cupidity of any american wife of a millionaire enough certainly to make him rich though he lived in the style of an exceedingly poor man you have the saddest fire i ever saw she said on this particular afternoon as she entered his study without warning as she was now quite accustomed to do and found him sitting absorbed over a book regardless of the smouldering wood in the grate which threatened to become altogether extinguished. Let me make it cheerful for you. She set to work, while he pushed his spectacles up from his eyes to his forehead, and regarded her with unassisted vision. What have you been doing to yourself? he asked. Then, are you sure you are quite well? She looked up from the logs she was piling dexterously together, surprised and smiling. Quite well? of course i am never felt better do i look ill professor chauvet got up and stretched his legs not ill he replied no but feverish singularly so eyes too bright lips too red spiteful women would say you had put belladonna in the one and carmine on the other let me feel your pulse she laughed and gave him her hand he pressed his fingers on the cool firm wrist no nothing the matter there he said wrinkling his fuzzy brows in a puzzled line it is the pulse of youth and strong heart action well what is it what is what queried diana merrily as she settled the logs to her satisfaction and kindled them into sparkling flame i know of nothing in myself that is or isn't he smiled a wry smile there you express the sum and substance of all philosophy he said plato himself could go no further all the same there is an is about you that wasn't what do you make of that and if you haven't been doing anything to yourself what has our friend feodor demetrius been doing to you the question though put suddenly did not throw her off her guard she met it with clear, upraised eyes and a look of wonder. Why, what on earth should he do? she asked, lightly. He's giving me quite a pleasant time in Switzerland. That's all. Oh, that's all, eh? repeated Chauvet, baffled for the moment. Well, I'm glad you are having a pleasant time. Judging by your looks, Switzerland agrees with you. But Demetrius is a queer fellow. It's no use falling in love with him, you know she laughed very merrily <laughs> my dear professor you talk as if i were a girl likely to moon and sentimentalize over the first man that comes in my way i'm not young enough for that sort of thing 
The professor stuck his hands deep in his pockets and appeared to meditate. No, perhaps not, he said. But experience has taught me that people fall in love at the most unexpected ages. I have seen a child of four, a girl, coquetting with a boy of seven. And I have also seen an old gentleman of seventy-odd making himself exceedingly unpleasant by his too rabid admiration of a married lady of forty. These things will occur. <laughs> but that's not love, laughed Diana seating herself in a deep easy chair opposite to him. Come, come, Professor, you know it isn't, it's nonsense, and in the case of the old gentleman, very distressing nonsense. Now, show me that jewel you spoke of the other day, one that I've never seen. It's called the Eye of Something or Somebody. The Eye of Rajuna, said Chauvet, solemnly. A jewel with the history of a perished world behind it, now, Miss May, you must not look at this remarkable stone in a spirit of trifling. It carries, compressed within its lustre, the soul's despair of a great queen. He paused, as if thinking, then went to an iron-bound safe which stood in one corner of the room, and unlocked it. Fumbling for a minute or two in its interior recesses, he presently produced a curious case made of rough hide, and fastened with a band of gold. Opening it, a sudden flash of light sparkled from within, and Diana raised herself in her chair to look, with a little exclamation of wonderment. The extraordinary brilliancy of the jewel disclosed was like nothing she had ever seen. The stone appeared to be of a deep rose colour, but in its centre there was a moving point, as of blood-red liquid. This floating drop glittered with an unearthly lustre, and now and again seemed to emit rays as of living light. "'What a marvellous gem!' Diana murmured. "'And how beautiful! What do you call it? A ruby or a coloured diamond?' "'Neither,' answered Chauvet. "'It does not belong to any class of known gems. It is the Eye of Rajuna, and in ages past it was set in the centre of the forehead of the statue of an Assyrian queen.' She was a strange person in her day, of strong and imperious primitive passions, and she had rather a violent way of revenging herself for a wrong. She had a lover. All good-looking queens have lovers. It is only the ugly ones who are virtuous. And he grew tired of her in due course, as lovers generally tire. Do they? put in Diana. Of course they do. That's why the bond of marriage was invented to tie a man fast up to family duties so that he should not wander where he listeth, though he wanders just as much. But marriage is the only safeguard for his children. Rajuna, the queen, however, did not approve of her lover's wandering, and being, in her day, a great ruler, she could, of course, do as she liked with him. So she had him brought before her in chains, and slowly hacked to pieces in her presence, a little bit here and a little bit there, keeping him alive as long as possible so that he might see himself cut up. And finally, when the psychological moment came, she had herself robed and crowned in full imperial style, and, taking a sharp knife in her own fair hands, cut out his heart herself and threw it to her dogs in the palace courtyard below. This was one of the many jewels she wore on that historic occasion, and it was afterwards placed in the forehead of the statue which her people erected to the memory of their good and great Queen Rajuna. Diana listened with fascinated interest. Her eyes fastened on the weird jewel, and her whole expression, one of complete absorption in the horror of the story she had heard. She was silent so long that Chauvet grew impatient. Well, what do you think of it all? he demanded. I think she... That Assyrian queen was quite right, she answered slowly. She gave her false lover, physically, what he had given her morally. He had hacked her to pieces, bit by bit. He had taken her ideals, her hopes, and confidences, and cut them all to shreds. And he had torn her heart out from its place. Yes, 
she was quite right a traitor deserves a traitor's death i would have done the same myself he stared and glowered frowningly you you a gentle englishwoman you would have done the same she took the jewel from its case and held it up to the light its red brilliance making her slender fingers rosy tipped yes i would and she smiled strangely i think women are all made in much the same mould whether english or assyrian there is nothing they resent so deeply as treachery in love yet they are treacherous themselves pretty often said the professor when they are they are not real women declared diana they are pussy-cats toys a true woman loves once and loves always he looked at her askance i think you have been bitten my dear lady he said your eloquence is the result of sad experience you are right she answered quietly still holding the eye of rajuna and dangling it against the light perfectly so i have been bitten as you put it but it is long ago yet you cherish the idea of vengeance she laughed a little <laughs> i don't know i cannot say but when one has had life spoilt for one all undeservedly one may wish to see the spoiler morally hung drawn and quartered in a sort of good old tudor way yet my story is quite a common one i was engaged to a man who threw me over after i had waited for him seven years lots of women could tell the same tale i dare say he's married and has a very fat wife and five hideous children and are you not sufficiently avenged exclaimed chauvet melodramatically with uplifted hands a fat wife and five hideous children surely far worse than the eye of rajuna her face was clear and radiant now as she put the jewel back in its case yes possibly but i sometimes fancy i should like to make sure that it is worse i'm wickedly human enough to wish to see him suffer and yet he's not worth such an expenditure of nerve force said chauvet smiling kindly why not spare yourself for somebody else she looked at him with something of pathos in her eyes somebody else my dear professor there's not a soul in all the world that cares for me you are wrong i care he replied with an emphasis that startled her i care so much that i'll marry you to-morrow if you'll have me she was so amazed that for the moment she could not speak he perfectly calm and collected continued with a kind of oratorical fervour i will marry you i say i find you charming and intelligent charm in woman is common intelligence is rare you are a happy combination of the two you are not a girl neither am i a boy but if you take me you will not take a poor man i am rich much richer than anybody knows i have become interested in you more than this i have grown fond of you i would try my best for the rest of my life which cannot be very long to make you happy i would give you a pretty house in paris and all the luxuries which dainty women appreciate and i promise i would not bore you and at my death i would leave you all i possess even the eye of rajuna stop now before you speak think it over i wish to give you plenty of time here his voice trembled a little for it will be a great blow yes a very great blow to me if you refuse taken by surprise as she was diana could not but appreciate the quiet and chivalrous manner of the professor as after having made his declaration and proposal he stood at attention as it were waiting for her first word she rose from her chair and laid one hand on his arm dear professor she began hesitatingly yes that's good he said dear professor is very good and after that what next after that just this said diana that i thank you for your kind and generous offer with all my heart still more do i thank you for saying you have grown fond of me nobody has said that for years but i will not do you such wrong as to take advantage of your goodness to a woman you know nothing of 
not at any rate till you know something more and to be quite honest with you i don't think i have it in my heart to love any man now the professor took the hand that rested on his arm and patted it encouragingly my dear lady i am not asking for love he said i would not do such an absurd thing for the world love is the great delusion of the ages one of the springes to catch woodcocks as your shakespeare says i don't want it i never had it and don't expect it i merely ask for permission to take care of you and make you as happy as i can for the rest of my life i should like to do that i should indeed the stupid and conventional world will not allow me to do it without scandal unless i marry you therefore i ask you to go through this form with me i would not be selfish i would respect you in every way he broke off and to close an embarrassing sentence gently kissed the hand he held tears stood in diana's eyes oh you are good you are good she murmured and i feel so ungrateful because i cannot please you by at once saying yes but i should feel worse than ungrateful if i did because it would be unfair to you it would really and yet don't say an absolute no my dear interrupted the professor hastily take time i'll give you as long as you like and live in hope she smiled though her eyes were wet her thoughts were all in a whirl how had it chanced that she so long content to be considered an old maid should now receive an offer of marriage had she a right to refuse it professor chauvet was a distinguished man of science well known in paris his wife would occupy a position of dignity and distinction her salon would be filled with men of mark and women of high social standing and he had grown fond of her he said that was the best and most wonderful thing of all that any one should be fond of her seemed to poor lonely diana the opening of the gates of paradise may i may i she faltered presently you may do anything replied chauvet soothingly you may even box my ears if it will relieve your feelings she laughed and looked up at him it was a kind rugged clever face she saw plain but shrewd and though marked like a map with lines of thought and care not without character and impressiveness i was rude to you the first night we met she said irrelevantly so was i to you he responded and you got the better of me that's probably why i like you she hesitated again then may i wait of course he said any time not too long i want to settle it before i die will it do when i have finished my visit to madame demetrius she asked she wishes me to stay with her for some months she likes my company i should think she does interposed chauvet so should i she laughed again you really are very nice she said you ought to have married long ago that's neither here nor there he answered i'm glad i didn't i might have had a fat wife and five hideous children like your old lover and my life wouldn't have been worth a sou wouldn't it she was quite playful by this time and taking a knot of violets from her own dress pinned them in his buttonhole much to his delight of course not with a fat wife and five children what would have become of my work i should never have done anything as it is the world may have to thank me for a few useful discoveries though i dare say it will have to thank feodor demetrius more her heart gave a quick throb do you think him very clever she asked clever clever as the devil there never was such a man for bold experiment i wonder he hasn't killed himself before now with his exploits in chemistry however let us keep to the point as i understand it you give me a little hope you will not say yes or no till your time with madame demetrius is expired till your visit to the chateau fragonard is ended is that so she bent her head and may i walk on air buoyed up by hope till then she looked a little troubled dear professor i cannot promise anything she said 
you see i am taken altogether by surprise and and gratitude give me time to think i will he said kindly and meanwhile we will keep our own confidence and the subject shall be closed till you yourself reopen it there you can rely upon me but think it all over well reasonably and clearly a husband who would care much for you ten thousand a year a house in paris and every comfort and luxury you could wish for is not an absolutely melancholy prospect bless you my dear and now i'll lock up the eye of rajuna it has looked upon us and has seen nothing of falsehood or treachery to warrant the shedding of blood he moved away from her to place the jewel in his safe and as he did so said i have an aquamarine here which is the colour of a sicilian sea in full summer and i should like to give it to you now i intend it for you but the hawk eye of demetrius would notice it if you wore it and you would suffer the cross-examination of a torquemada however you shall have it very soon as soon as i can invent a little fable to give cover to its presentation and let me see here he turned round smiling well upon my word you have made up the fire capitally quite bright and cheery and full of hope End of chapter 14chapter 15 of the young diana this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the young diana by marie corelli chapter 15 that evening diana for the first time saw demetrius in a somewhat irritable mood he was sharp and peremptory of speech and impatient in manner where have you been all afternoon he demanded at dinner fixing his eyes upon her with a piercing intensity with professor chauvet she answered i wanted to see a famous assyrian jewel he has it is called the eye of rajuna demetrius shrugged his shoulders are you interested in that kind of thing he queried with a touch of disdain a stolen gem and therefore an unlucky one looted by a french officer from the forehead of a mutilated statue somewhere in the east it's not a thing i should care to have nor i agreed diana amicably but it's worth seeing the professor is a great authority on precious stones said madame demetrius you know feodor you have always credited him with very exceptional knowledge on the subject of course he replied but i was not aware that miss may had any hankerings after jewels diana laughed she was amused to see him more or less in a kind of suppressed temper <laughs> i haven't she declared gaily it would be no use if i had jewels are and always have been beyond my reach but i like to know positively from the professor that they are living things feeling heat and cold just as we do and that some of them shrink from diseased persons and lose their lustre and are brilliant and happy with healthy ones it is very fascinating the professor is not remarked demetrius ironically she raised her eyes smilingly no he is a very worthy man put in madame demetrius gently and very distinguished in his way he is certainly not handsome no men are nowadays said demetrius the greed of money has written itself all over human physiognomy beauty is at a discount there were never so many downright ugly human beings as there are to-day the mark of the beast is on every forehead i don't see it anywhere on yours said diana sweetly a reluctant half smile brightened his features for a moment then he gave a disdainful gesture i dare say it's there all the same he replied shortly or it may be branded too deeply for you to see he paused and with an abrupt change of tone said mother can you be ready to go to davos this week she looked up placidly smiling certainly i shall be very glad to go diana will like it too 
I'm sure. Good. Then we'll start the day after tomorrow. I have engaged rooms. There are one or two things I must settle before leaving, not very important. Here he rose from the table, dinner being concluded, and addressed Diana. I want you for a few moments, he said, rather peremptorily. Join me, please, in the laboratory. He left the room. His mother and Diana looked at one another in smiling perplexity. Diana laughed. He's cross, she declared. Cher madame, he's cross. It's a positive miracle. The cool scientist and calm philosopher is in a bit of a temper. Madame Demetrius gave a rather regretful and unwilling assent. Truth to tell, the gentle old lady was more bewildered than satisfied with certain things that were happening, and which perplexed and puzzled her. As, for example, when Diana took her arm and affectionately escorted her from the dining-room to the drawing-room, she could not refrain from wondering at the singular grace and elegance of the once plain and angular woman. She might almost be another person, so different was she to the one who had arrived at the Chateau Fragonard in answer to her son's advertisement. But she had promised to say nothing, and she kept her word, though she thought none the less of the flaming sword and the terrific problem her son had apparently determined to solve. Meanwhile, Diana, having settled her cosily by the fire with her knitting, ran quickly off to obey the command of Demetrius. She had never been asked to go near the laboratory since her first visit there, and she hardly knew how to find the corridor leading to it. She looked for the negro, Vasho, but, though he had waited upon them at dinner, he was now nowhere to be seen. So, trusting to memory and chance, she groped her way down a long passage so dark that she had to feel the walls on both sides to steady her steps as she went, and she was beginning to think she had taken an entirely wrong direction, when a dull, coppery glitter struck a shaft of light through the gloom, and she knew she was near her goal. A few more cautious steps, and she stood opposite the great door, which glowed mysteriously red and golden, as though secret fire were mixing living flame with its metal. It was shut. How could she open it, or make her presence outside it known? Recollecting that Vasho had merely laid his hand upon it, she presently ventured to do the same, and soon had the rather terrifying satisfaction of seeing the huge portal swing upwards yawningly, disclosing the interior of the vast dome and the monstrous wheel. But what a different scene was now presented to her eyes! When first she had entered this mysterious laboratory, it had been in broad daylight, and the sun had poured its full glory through the overarching roof of crystal. But now it was night, and instead of sunshine there was a cloud of fire. Or, rather, it might be described as a luminous mist of the deep, rich hue of a damask rose. Through this vaporous veil could be seen the revolving wheel, which now had the appearance of a rainbow circle. Every inch of space was full of the radiant rose haze, and it was so dazzling and confusing to the sight that, for a moment, Diana could not move. With a vague sense of terror, she dimly felt that the door had closed behind her. But, studying her nerves, she waited, confident that Demetrius would soon appear. And she was right. He stepped suddenly out of the rosy mist, with a casual air, as if there were nothing unusual in the surroundings. Well, he said, courageous as ever. Is there anything to be afraid of? she asked. To me it looks wonderful, beautiful. Yes, it is the essence of all wonder and all beauty, he answered. It is a form of condensed light, the condensation which, when imprisoned by natural forces within a mine under certain conditions, gives you rubies, diamonds, and other precious stones, and in the water beneath, which you cannot see just now, owing to the vapour, there is sufficient radium to make me ten times a millionaire. And you will not part with any of it? I do part with some of it when I find it useful to do so, he said, but very seldom. I am gradually testing its real properties, 
the scientists will perhaps be five hundred years at work discussing and questioning what i may prove in a single day but i do not wish to enter upon these matters with you you are my subject as you know and i want to prepare you the time has come when you must be ready for anything i am she interrupted quickly you respond eagerly and he fixed his eyes upon her with a strange piercing look but that is because you are strong and defiant of fate you are beginning to experience that saving vanity which deems itself indestructible she made no answer she lifted her eyes to the highest point of the slowly turning wheel and its opaline flare falling through the rose mist gave her face an unearthly lustre we are going to davos platz he continued because it will not do to remain here through the winter i want the finest cleanest air rarefied and purified by the constant presence of ice and snow to aid me in my experiment moreover certain changes in you will soon become too apparent to escape notice and people will talk already baroness roussillon is beginning to ask questions about me asked diana amused about you tell me have you looked in your mirror lately only just to do my hair she answered i avoid looking at my own face as much as possible why she hesitated well i don't want to be deluded into imagining myself good-looking when i'm not he smiled resolute woman now listen from this day forward i shall give you one measure of what you call my golden fire every fortnight you have experienced its first effect what future effects it may have i cannot tell you but as the subject of my experiment you must submit to the test if you suffer bodily pain or mental confusion from its action tell me at once and i will do my best to spare you unnecessary suffering you understand she had grown very pale even to the lips but she answered quietly i understand you have never asked me exactly what i did feel the first time i took it i may as well confess now that i thought i was dying you will think so again and yet again he said coolly and you may die that's all i have to say about it she stood immovable bathed as it were in the rosy radiance exhaled by the slow and now almost solemn movement of the great wheel she thought of the kindliness of professor chauvet his plain and unadorned proposal of marriage his simple admission that he had grown fond of her his offer of his name and position united to a house in paris and ten thousand a year and contrasted all this with the deliberate calculating callousness of the man beside her lost to every consideration but the success or failure of his experiment and a passionate resentment began to burn in her soul but she said nothing she had rushed upon her own fate there was no way out of it now he moved away from her to unlock the tiny fairy-like shrine which concealed the slow dropping of the precious liquid mysteriously distilled by the unknown process which apparently involved so much vast mechanism and placing a small phial under the delicate tube from which the drops fell at long slow intervals waited till one glittering like a rare jewel was imprisoned within it she watched him with more disdain than fear and her eyes were brilliant and almost scornful as he raised himself from his stooping position and faced her the pale blue dress she wore was transformed by the rosy light around her into a rich purple and as she stood fixedly regarding him there was something so proud and regal in her aspect that he paused vaguely astonished what is the matter with you he asked are you angry who am i that i should be angry she retorted i am only a slave he frowned are you going to play the capricious woman at this late hour and show temper he said impatiently i am in no humour for reproaches you promised loyalty have i broken my promise she demanded no not yet but you look as if you might break it she gave a slight yet expressive gesture of contempt what a poor thing you are as a man after all she exclaimed 
here in the presence of the vast forces you have bent to your use here with your subject a mere woman entirely at your disposal you doubt you disbelieve in my sworn word which is as strong as all your science perhaps stronger come you look like a conspirator who has extracted poison from some mysterious substance and who is longing to try it on a victim do you want me to take it now he gazed at her with a sudden sense of fear almost her courage overmastered his will there was something austere and angelic in that slight figure with the rosy waves of vapour playing about it and turning its azure draperies to royal purple and for the first time he wondered whether there was not something deliberately brutal in his treatment of her rallying his self-possession he answered when we are outside this place you can take it if you will why not inside she asked here where the vapours of your witch's cauldron simmer and steam where i can feel your melting fires pricking every vein and nerve and she stretched out her arms towards the wheel of strange opalescent light which now revolved almost at a snail's pace make short work of me dr demetrius this is the place for it on a sudden impulse he sprang to her side and seized her hand diana you think me a pitiless murderer she looked straight into his eyes no i don't i think you simply a man without any feeling except for yourself and your own aims there are thousands ay millions of your sex like you you are not extraordinary if i succeed you will have cause to thank me possibly she answered with a slight smile but you know gratitude sometimes takes curious and unexpected forms one of the commonest is hatred of the person who has done you a kindness come give me that fire drop it is restless in its prison we are fighting a strange duel you and i you are all for self and your own ultimate triumph i am selfless having nothing to lose or to win nothing he repeated foolish woman you cannot foresee you cannot project yourself into the future suppose i gave you youth suppose with youth i gave you beauty would you then call me selfish why yes of course she answered composedly you would not give such gifts to me because you had any desire to make me happy nor would you give them if you could secure them for yourself without endangering your life if you succeed in your attempts they would fall to my lot naturally as part of your experiment and would prove your triumph but as far as my personality is concerned you would not care what became of me though with youth and beauty i might turn the tables on you <laughs> she laughed then said again give me my dose i told you before that it would be better to take it when we go outside the laboratory he answered suppose you became insensible i could not leave you here why not she demanded recklessly it would not matter to you please give it to me whether i live or die i like doing things quickly with a certain sense of mingled compassion admiration and reluctance he handed her the phial she looked with intent interest at the shining drop pent within which glowed like a fine topaz now fiery orange now red now pale amber and moved up and down as rapidly and restlessly as quicksilver how pretty it is she said if it would only condense and harden into a gem one would like to wear it in a ring it would outshine all professor chauvet's jewels well dr demetrius good night if i fall into your dark pool don't trouble to fish me out but if not don't leave me here till morning and smiling she put the phial to her lips and swallowed its contents demetrius stood silently watching would she swoon as she almost did the last time or would she be convulsed no she remained erect unswerving but as if by some automatic movement she lifted her arms slowly and clasped her hands above her head in an attitude of prayer her eyes closed her breathing was scarcely perceptible and so she remained as though frozen into stone moved beyond his usual calm by wonderment at this unexpected transformation of a living woman into a statue he called her 
but she gave no answer and then another remarkable thing happened an aureole of white light began to form round her figure beginning from the head and falling in brilliant rays to the feet her dress seemed a woven tissue of marvellous colours such as one finds painted for the robes of saints in antique missals and her features outlined against the roseate mist that filled the laboratory were pure and almost transparent as alabaster thrilled with excitement he could not speak he dared not move he could only look look as though all his forces were concentrated in his eyes how many minutes passed he could not determine but he presently saw the light begin to pale one ray after another disappeared quite slowly and as though each one were absorbed by some mysterious means into the motionless figure which had seemingly projected them then with equal slowness diana's upraised hands relaxed and her arms dropped to her sides her eyes opened brilliant and inquiring he went to her side diana he said in carefully hushed tones diana why did you wake me she asked plaintively in a voice of melting sweetness why take me away from the garden i had found it was all mine and there were many friends they said they had not seen me for centuries i should have liked to stay with them a little longer he listened in something of alarm had she lost her senses he knew it was possible that the potent force of his mysterious distillation might so attack the centres of the brain as to reverse their normal condition he touched her hand it was warm and soft as velvet still dreaming diana he said as gently as he could will you not come with me now she turned her eyes upon him there was no sign of brain trouble in those clear orbs of vision they were calm mirrors of sweet expression oh it is you she said in more natural tones i really thought i had gone away from you altogether it was a delightful experience he was a trifle vexed he hardly cared to hear that going away from him altogether was a delightful experience she was rapidly recovering from her trance-like condition and swept back her hair from her brows with a relieved yet puzzled gesture so it's all over she said i'm here just the same as ever i was sure i had gone away where he asked oh ever so far she answered i was carried off by people i couldn't see but they were kind and careful and it was quite easy going and then i came to a garden oh such an exquisite place full of the loveliest flowers somebody said it was mine i wish it were you were dreaming he said impatiently there's nothing in dreams the chief point to me is that you have not suffered any pain you have nothing to complain of she thought a minute trying to recall her sensations no she answered truthfully nothing good then i can proceed without fear he said enough for to-night we will go her eyes were fixed on the revolving wheel it goes slowly because the sunshine has gone i suppose she asked and all the light it produces now is from the interior stores it has gathered up in the day he was surprised at the quickness of her perception yes that is so he said then it never stops absolutely dead never she smiled wonderful demetrius you have built up a little mechanical universe of your own and you are the god of it you must be very pleased with yourself i am equally pleased with you he said you surpass all my expectations thanks so much and she curtsied to him playfully may i say good-night will not your mother wonder where we are my mother is too sensible a woman to question my movements he replied come you are sure you feel quite strong and well quite sure she said then paused surprised at the intense way he looked at her have you ever heard these lines he asked suddenly oh she doth teach the torches to burn bright her beauty hangs upon the cheek of night like a rich jewel in an ethiop's ear beauty too rich for youth for earth too dear 
Diana smiled happily. Of course, Shakespeare's utterance. Who else has ever written or could write such lines? I'm glad you know them, he said, musingly. They occurred to me just now, when... He broke off abruptly. Come, he repeated. We shall not see this place again for a couple of months, perhaps longer. And the sooner we get away, the better. Why? asked Diana, surprised. Why? And a curious, half-frowning expression darkened his brows. You must wait to know why. You will not have to wait long. He signed to her to keep close behind him, and together they moved like phantom figures through the rosy mist that enveloped them, till, at the touch of his wizard hand, the door swung upwards to give them egress, and descended again noiselessly as they passed out. The corridor, previously dark, was now dimly lit, but it was more a matter of groping than seeing, and Diana was glad when they reached the pleasantly warm and well-illumined hall of the house. There he turned and faced her. Now, not a word, he said, with imperative sharpness. Not a word of what you have seen, or dreamed, to my mother. Say good night to her, and go. She lifted her eyes to his in something of wonder and protest, but obeyed his gesture and went straight into the drawing-room, where Madame Demetrius sat as usual, quietly knitting. "'I am to bid you good-night,' she said, smiling, as she knelt down for a moment by the old lady's chair. "'Dear, your son is very cross, and I'm going to bed.' Madame Demetrius gazed upon her in utter amazement and something of fear. The face uplifted to hers was so radiant and fair that for a moment she was speechless, and the old hands that held the knitting trembled. Remembering her son's command in good time, she made a strong effort to control herself and forced a smile. "'That's right, my dear,' she said. "'Bed is the best place when you're tired. I don't think Feodor means to be cross.' "'Oh, no,' agreed Diana, springing up from her kneeling attitude and kissing Madame's pale cheek. He doesn't mean to be anything, but he is. Good night, dearest lady. You are always kind and sweet to me, and I'm grateful. With those words and an affectionate wave of her hand, she went, and the moment she had left the room, Demetrius entered it. His mother rose from her chair and made a gesture with her hands as though she were afraid and sought to repel him. He took those nervous, wavering hands and held them tenderly in his own. "'What's the matter, mother mine?' he asked, playfully. "'You have seen her?' "'Feodor, Feodor, you are dealing with strange powers, perhaps powers of evil. Oh, my son, be careful, be careful what you do,' she implored, almost tearfully. "'You may not go too far.' "'Too far, too far,' he echoed lightly there is no too far or farthest where nature and science lead the flaming sword it turns every way to keep the tree of life but i see the blossom under the blade she looked up at his dark strong face in mingled fondness and terror you cannot recreate life feodor she said why not he demanded Today our surgeons graft new flesh on old and succeed in their design. Why should not fresh cells of life be formed through nature's own germinating processes to take the place of those that perish? It is not an impossible theory. I do not waste my time on problems that can never be solved. Come, come, mother. Put your superstitious terrors aside, and if you have the faith in God that I have— you will realise that there are no powers of evil save man's own uncontrolled passions, which he inherits from the brute creation, and which it is his business to master. No mere brute beast foraging the world for prey can be an astronomer, a scientist, a thinker, or a ruler of the powers of life. But a man, with self-control, reason, and devout faith, with humility, can... For is not the evolvement of his being only a little lower than the angels? She sighed, half incredulous. But beauty, she said, actual beauty. Beauty is a thing of health, form, and atmosphere, 
he answered. Easy enough to attain with these forces suitably combined, and no malign environment. Now, dearest mother, puzzle yourself no more over my mysteries. You have seen Diana, and you can guess my reason for wishing to get away to Davosplatz as soon as possible. People here will talk and wonder. At Davos no one has seen her. Not as she was when she first arrived here, and no questions are likely to be asked. Besides, the experiment is not half completed. It has only just begun. When will it be finished? His mother asked. He smiled, and stooping, kissed her forehead. Not till the summer solstice, he said, when light and heat are at their best and strongest. Then I may reach my goal and win my victory. And then? And then, he echoed, smiling. Ah, who knows what then? Possibly a happier world. And yet, did not the angel Uriel say to the prophet Esdras, The Most High hath made this world for the many, but the world to come for the few. My secret is a part of the world to come. End of chapter 15、Chapter、16 Chapter of the Young Diana For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli Chapter sixteen. Two or three days later, the Chateau Fragonard was closed. Its windows were shuttered and its gates locked. The servants were dismissed, all save Vasho, who, with his black face, white teeth, rolling eyes and dumb lips, remained as sole custodian. The usual callers called in vain, and even the Baroness Roussillon, A notable and persistent inquirer into all matters of small social interest could learn nothing beyond the fact, written neatly on a card which Vasho handed to all visitors, that Dr. and Madame Demetrius had left home for several weeks. Of Diana May, no information was given. Among those who were the most surprised and deeply chagrined at this turn of events was the Marchese Farnese. Who had himself been compelled to be away for some time on business in Paris, but who had returned as soon as he could to Geneva, in the hope of improving his acquaintance with Diana sufficiently to procure some sort of reliable information as to the problems and projects of Demetrius. His disappointment was keen and bitter, for not only did he find her gone, but he could obtain no clue as to her whereabouts. And even Professor Chauvet had been left very much in the dark, for Diana had only written to him the briefest note, running thus Dear kind friend, I am going away for a little while with Madame Demetrius, who needs change of air and scene, but I will let you know directly I come back. I shall think of you very often while absent. Affectionately yours, Diana. Chauvet put by these brief lines very preciously in the safe where he kept his jewels. Affectionately yours was a great consolation, he thought. They almost touched the verge of tenderness. There was surely hope for him, and he amused himself in his solitary hours with the drawing of an exquisite design for a small corona to be worn in Diana's hair, wherein he purposed having some of his rarest jewels set in a fashion of his own. Meanwhile, the frozen stillness of an exceptionally dreary and bitter winter enveloped the Chateau Fragonard and its beautiful gardens, and no one was ever seen to go to it or come from it, though there were certain residents on the opposite side of the lake who could perceive its roof and chimneys through the leafless trees, and who declared that its great glass dome was always more or less illumined, as though a light were constantly kept burning within. Rumour was busy at first with all sorts of suggestions and contradictions, but as there appeared to be no foundation for any one of them, the talk gradually wore itself out, most people being always too much interested in themselves to keep up any interest in others for long. But had rumour a million eyes, as it is said to have a million tongues, 
it might well have had occasion to use them all during the full swing of that particular season at davos platz where in the winter sports and gaieties of the time diana was an admired belle and universal favourite she who only three or four months previously had been distinctly on the shelf or in the way was now flattered and sought after by a whole train of male admirers who apparently could never have enough of her society she conversed brilliantly danced exquisitely and skated perfectly so perfectly indeed that one fatuous elderly gentleman nicknamed her the ice queen and another younger but not less enterprising addressed her as boule de neige conceiving the title prettier in french than in rough english as snowball she accepted the attentions lavished upon her with amused indifference which made her still more attractive to men whose sporting tendencies are invariably sharpened by obstacles in the way of securing their game and much to her own interest found herself the centre of all sorts of rivalries and jealousies if they only knew my age she thought one day if they only knew but they did not know and it would have been quite impossible for them to guess thus much diana herself was now forced to concede every day her mirror showed her a fair unworn face with the softly rounded outline of youth and the clear eyes which betoken the unconscious joy of perfect health and vitality and the change in her was so marked and manifest that she no longer hesitated to speak to madame demetrius about it when they were alone together at first the old lady was very nervous of the subject and fearful lest she should in some way displease her masterful son but diana reassured her promising that he should never know the nature or extent of their confidences it was a great relief to them both when they entered into closer mutual relations and decided to talk to each other freely especially to madame demetrius who was anxious to be made certain that diana was not in any physical suffering or mental distress through the exercise of feodor's extraordinary and as she imagined almost supernatural powers she was soon satisfied on that score for diana could assure her with truth that she had never felt better or brighter it's like a new life she said one day as she sat at the window of their private sitting-room in the hotel which commanded a fine view of the snowy mountain summits i feel as if i had somehow been born again all my past years seem rolled away like so much rubbish i've often thought of those words except ye be born again ye shall not enter into the kingdom of god they used to be a mystery to me but they're not so mysterious now and it is just like entering the kingdom of god to look out on this glorious beauty of the mountains the snow and the pine trees and to feel alive to it all grateful for it all loving it all as i do madame demetrius regarded her earnestly you do not think then she suggested that my son is guilty of any offence against the almighty by his dealings with these strange unknown forces dear madam interrupted diana quickly do not for a moment entertain such an idea it belongs to those foolish times when the church was afraid to know the truth and tortured people for telling it what offence can there be in exerting to the utmost the intelligent faculties god has given us and in studying to find out the wonderful advantages and benefits which may be possessed by those who cultivate reason and knowledge i think it is a far greater offence against god to wilfully remain in ignorance of his goodness to us all perhaps and the old lady sighed then smiled i am afraid i am one of those who darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge but after all the great thing for me is that i see you well and happy 
and greatest marvel of all growing younger every day you see that for yourself don't you and you feel it yes and as she spoke a strange far-away look came into diana's eyes but there is one thing i wish i could explain even to myself i feel well happy keenly alive to all i see and hear and yet there is an odd sensation back of it all a feeling that i have no feeling my dear diana and madame demetrius's pale blue eyes opened a little wider what a strange thing to say you are full of feeling diana shook her head decisively no i'm not it's all put on it is really that is so far as human beings and human events are concerned i feel nothing whatever about them the only feeling i have is a sort of suppressed ecstasy of delight in beauty the beauty of the skies the effects of sunlight on the hills and plains the loveliness of a flower or a bit of exquisite natural scenery but i have somehow lost the sense of all association with humanity but my dear girl began madame in perplexity diana laughed <laughs> now you call me a girl too she exclaimed merrily just as they all do here in this hotel i'm not a girl at all i'm a woman of mature years but nobody would believe it even dr feodor himself is getting puzzled for he addressed me as dear child this very morning <laughs> she laughed again her pretty laugh which was like a musical cadence yes dear madam it's a fact with my renewal of youth i'm developing youth's happy-go-lucky indifference to emotions people the creatures that walk about on two legs and eat and talk have absolutely no interest for me unless they do something absurd which they imagine to be clever and that makes me laugh sometimes not always even your wonderful son with his amazing powers and his magnetic eyes which used to send a thrill right down my spine fails to move me now to any concern as to my ultimate fate in his hands i know that he is so far succeeding in his experiment but what the final result may be i don't know and i don't care you don't care echoed madame in bewilderment really and truly you don't care no not a bit that's just the worst of it see here you dear kind woman here i am a bought subject for dr feodor to try his skill upon he told me plainly enough on one occasion that it wouldn't matter and couldn't be helped if i died under his treatment and i quite agreed with him up to the present i'm not dead and don't feel like dying but i'm hardening yes that's it steadily slowly hardening not in my muscles not in my arteries no but in my sentiments and emotions which are becoming positively nil <laughs> her merry laugh rang out again and her eyes sparkled with amusement but what a good thing it is after all men are so fond of telling one that they hate emotions so it's just as well to be without them now for instance i'm having a splendid time here i love all the exercise in the open air the skating tobogganing and dancing in the evening it's all great fun but i don't feel that it is as splendid as it seems men flatter me every day they say how well you skate or how well you dance how well you play or even how charming you look and if such things had been said to me in england six months ago i should have been so happy and at ease that i should never have been afraid and awkward as i generally was in society but now why now i simply don't care i only think what fools men are but you must remember said madame demetrius gently you were very different in appearance six months ago to what you are now exactly that's just it and diana gave an expressive gesture of utter disdain that's what i hate and despise one is judged by looks only i'm just the same woman as ever 
Six months ago I danced as well, skated as well, and played the piano as well as I do now. But no one ever gave me the smallest encouragement. Now everything I do is made the subject of exaggerated compliment, by the men, of course. Not by the women. They always hate a successful rival of their own sex. Ah, how petty and contemptible it all is. You see, I'm growing young looks with old experience. Rather a dangerous combination of forces, I think. However, if our souls become angels when we die, they will have a vast experience to look back upon, dating from the beginning of creation. And looking back so far, they will understand all, said Madame Demetrius. As one of our great writers has said, to know all is to pardon all. Diana shrugged her shoulders. Perhaps, she carelessly conceded. But that's just where I should fail as an angel. I cannot pardon all. I hold a standing grudge against injustice, callousness, cruelty, and cowardice. I forgive none of these things. I loathe a hypocrite, especially a pious one. I should take pleasure in revenge of some sort on any such loathsome creature. I would rather save a fly from drowning in the milk jug than a treacherous human being from the gallows. Dear me, and Madame smiled, you speak very strongly, Diana, especially when you assure me that you cannot feel. Oh, I can feel hatred, said Diana. That sort of feeling seems to have a good grip of me. But love, interest, sympathy for other folks? No, ten thousand times no. One might love a man with all the ardour and passion of a lifetime, and yet he may be capable of boasting of your interest in him at his club, and damaging your reputation. You know some clubs are like old washerwomen's corners where they meet to talk scandal, and you may waste half your time in interest and sympathy for other folks, and they'll only ask dubiously, what is it all for? And round on you at the first opportunity, never crediting you with either honesty or unselfishness in your words or actions. No, no, it's best to play the world's puppets, never to become one of them. You are bitter, my dear, commented Madame. I think it is because you have missed a man's true love. Diana laughed and sprang up from her chair. <laughs> Maybe, she replied, but a man's true love, as I see it, seems hardly worth the missing. You are a dear sentimental darling. You have lived in the early Victorian manner, finding an agreeable lover who gave you his heart, after the fashion of an antique valentine, and whom you married in the proper and conventional style, and in due course gave him a baby. That's it. And oh, such a baby. Theodore Demetrius, doctor of sciences and master of innumerable secrets of nature. Yet, after all, only your baby. It is a miracle. But I wonder if it was worth while. Don't mind my nonsense, dearest lady. Just think of me as hardening and shining. Like bits of the glacier we saw the other day, which only move about an inch in a thousand years. There's a sports ball on the ice tonight. A full moon, too. And your wonderful son has agreed to skate with me. I wish you would come and look at us. I'm too old, said Madame Demetrius, with a slight sigh. I wish Feodor would make me young as he is making you. He's afraid. And Diana stood, looking at her for a moment. He's afraid of killing you, but he's not afraid of killing me. With that she went, and Madame, laying down her work, folded her hands and prayed silently that no evil might come to her beloved son through the strange mysteries which he was seeking to solve, and which, to her simple and uninstructed mind, appeared connected with the powers of darkness rather than the powers of light. That evening, Diana scored a triumph as Belle of the Sports Ball, attired in a becoming skating costume of black velvet trimmed with white fur, with a charming little toque hat to match, set jauntily on her bright hair, 
and a bunch of edelweiss at her throat she figured as an extremely pretty girl and her admirers were many when demetrius came to claim his promised glissade by her side she welcomed him smilingly yet with an indifference which piqued him are you tired he asked would you rather not skate any more just now she gave him an amused look i am never tired she said i could skate for ever if it were not like all things certain to become monotonous and i'm sure it's very good of you to skate with a woman of mature years when there are so many nice girls about you are the prettiest girl here he answered with a smile every one says so and what do you say to every one she demanded i agree naturally he took her hand and together they started skimming easily over the ice now shining like polished crystal in the radiance of the moon and the light thrown from the torches set round the expanse of the skating ground by the hotel purveyors of pleasure for their visitors diana's lightness and grace of movement had from the first been the subject of admiring comment in the little world of humanity gathered for the season on those swiss mountain heights but this evening she seemed to surpass herself and with demetrius executed wonderful steps and figures at flying speed with the ease of a bird on the wing men looked on in glum annoyance that demetrius should have so much of her company and women eyed her with scarcely concealed jealousy but at the end of an hour she said she had had enough of it and pulling off her skates she walked with a kind of sedate submissiveness beside demetrius away from the gay scene on the ice back to the hotel their way led through an avenue of pine trees which stiffly uplifting their spear-like points to the frosty skies and bright moon looked like fantastic giant sentinels on guard for the night stopping abruptly in the midst of the eerie winter stillness she said suddenly dr feodor do you know i've had three proposals of marriage since i've been here he smiled indulgently ay indeed i'm not surprised and you have refused them all of course what's the good of them his dark eyes glittered questioningly upon her through their veiling sleepy lids the good of them well really that is for you to decide if you want a husband i don't she said emphatically with a decisive little stamp of her foot on the frozen ground i should hate him unhappy wretch why oh because she hesitated then laughed because he would be always about he'd have the right to go with me everywhere such a bore love began demetrius sententiously <laughs> love she flashed a look of utter scorn upon him you don't believe in it neither do i what have we to do with love nothing he agreed quietly but you are really rewarding my studies diana you are growing very pretty she turned from him with a gesture of offended impatience and walked on he caught up to her you don't like my telling you that he said no because the prettiness is your forced product it's not my natural output he seized her hand somewhat roughly and held it as in a vice you talk foolishly he said in a low stern voice my forced product as you call it is not mine except in so far that i have found and made use of the forces of regenerative life which are in god's life and air and which enter into the work of all creation your prettiness is god's work lift up your eyes to the almighty power which maketh all things new awed and startled by the impassioned tone of his voice and his impressive manner she stood inert her hand remaining passively in his firm grasp men propose to you he went on because they find you attractive and because your face and figure excite their passions there is no real love in the case any more than there is in most proposals the magnetism of sex is the thing that pulls but you you my subject have no sex that's what nobody outside ourselves is likely to understand the love which is purely physical the mating which has for its object the breeding of children is not for you any more than it would be for an angel 
you are removed from its material and sensual contact. But the love which should touch your soul to immortal issues, by which its very character is expressed through youth and beauty, that may come to you. That may be yours in due time. Meanwhile, beware how you talk of my forced product, for behind all the powers I am permitted to use is the greatest power of all, to whom I am but the poorest of servants. <sighs> A deep sigh broke from him, and he released her hand as suddenly as he had grasped it. You have felt no ill effects from the treatment, he then asked, in a matter-of-fact tone. No, she answered. None at all, except... Except what? Oh, well, no very great matter. Only that I seem to have lost something out of myself. I have no interest in persons or events. No sympathy with humankind. It's curious, isn't it? I feel that I belong more to the atmosphere than to the earth, and that I love trees, grass, flowers, birds, and what is called the world of nature more than the world of men. Of course, I always loved nature, but what was once a preference has now become a passion, and perhaps, when you've done with me, if I live, I shall go and be a sort of hermit in the woods, away altogether from people. I don't like flesh and blood. There's a kind of coarseness in it. She concluded carelessly as she resumed her walk towards the hotel. He was puzzled and perplexed. He watched her as she moved, and noted, as he had done several times that evening, the exquisite lightness of her step. Well, at any rate, you are not, physically speaking, any the worse for receiving my treatment once a fortnight? He asked. Oh, no, I am very well indeed, she replied at once. I can truthfully assure you I never felt better. Your strange fire drop never gives me any uncanny sensations now. I don't mind it at all. It seems to fill me with a sort of brightness and buoyancy, but I have no actual feeling about it. Neither pleasure nor pain. That's rather odd, isn't it? They were at the entrance door of the hotel, and stood on the steps before going in. The moonlight fell slantwise on Diana's face, and showed it wonderfully fair and calm like that of a sculptured angel in some niche of a cathedral. Yes, perhaps it is odd, he answered. As I have already told you, I am not cognizant of the possible action of the commingled elements I have distilled. I can only test them and watch their effect upon you, in order to gain the necessary knowledge. But that you have no feeling seems to me an exaggerated statement. For instance, you must have felt a good deal of pleasure in your skating tonight. Not the least in the world. And the smile she gave him was as chill as a moonbeam on snow. I skated on the ice with the same volition as a bubble floats along the air. As unconscious as the bubble, and as indifferent. The bubble does not care when it breaks. Nor do I. Good night. She pushed open the swing door of the hotel, and passed in. He remained outside in the moonlight, vexed with himself and her, though he could not have told why. He lit a cigar and strolled slowly backwards and forwards in the front of the hotel, trying to soothe his inward irritation by smoking. But the effect was rather futile. She is wonderfully pretty and attractive now, he mused. If all succeeds, she will be beautiful. And what then? I wonder. With every process of age stopped and reversed, and with all the stimulating forces of creative regeneration working in every cell of her body, it is impossible to tell how she may develop. And yet, her mentality may remain the same. This is easily accounted for, because all one's experiences of life from childhood, make permanent impressions on the brain and stay there. Like the negatives stored in a photographer's darkroom, one cannot alter them. And the puzzle to me is, how will her mentality carry with her new personality? 
will she know how to hold the balance between them i can see already that men are quite likely to lose their heads about her but what does that matter it is not the first time they have maddened themselves for women who are set beyond the pale of mere sex he looked up at the still sky the frostily sparkling stars the snowy peaks of the mountains and the bright moon thank god i have never loved any woman save my mother he said for so i have been spared both idleness and worry to lose one's time and peace because a woman smiles or frowns is to prove oneself a fool or a madman and going into the hotel he finished his cigar in the lounge where other men were smoking all unaware that several of them detested the sight of his handsome face and figure for no other reason than that he seemed ostensibly to be the guardian as his mother was the chaperone of the prettiest girl of that season at davos diana may and therefore nothing was more likely than that she should fall in love with him and he with her it is always in this sort of fashion that the goose-gabble of society arranges persons and events to its own satisfaction never realising that being only geese they cannot see beyond the circle of their own restricted farmyard end of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of The Young Diana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter Seventeen. It was quite the end of the season at Davos before Demetrius quitted it and took his mother and Diana on to the Riviera here in the warm sunshine of the early southern spring he began to study with keener and closer interest the progress of his subject whose manner towards him and general bearing became more and more perplexing as time went on she was perfectly docile and amiable cheerful and full of thoughtful care and attention for madame demetrius and every fortnight took his mysterious potion in his presence without hesitation or question so that he had nothing to complain of but there was a new individuality about her which held her aloof in a way that he was at a loss to account for wherever she went she was admired men stared talked and sought introductions and she received all the social attention of an acknowledged belle without seeking or desiring it one evening at a hotel in Cannes, she was somewhat perturbed by seeing a portly elderly man whom she recognised as a club friend of her father's, and one who had been a frequent weekend visitor at Rose Lee. She hoped he would not hear her name, but she was too much the observed of all observers to escape notice, and it was with some trepidation that she saw him coming towards her with the rolling gait suggestive of lifelong whisky sodas a man about town manner she knew and detested pardon me he said with an openly admiring glance but i have just been wondering whether you are any relation of some friends of mine in england named may curiously enough they had a daughter called diana really and diana smiled a little cold haughty smile which was becoming habitual with her i'm afraid i cannot claim the honour of their acquaintance she spoke in a purposely repellent manner whereat the bold intruder was rendered awkward and abashed i know i it should not address you without an introduction he said stammeringly i hope you will excuse me but my old friend polly your old friend what 
drawled diana carelessly unfurling a fan and waving it idly to and fro polly we call him polly for fun he explained his full name is james polydore may and his daughter diana was drowned last summer drowned while bathing dear me how very sad and diana concealed a slight yawn behind her fan poor girl oh she wasn't a girl sniggered her informant she was quite an old maid over forty by a good way but it was rather an unfortunate affair why asked diana i don't see it at all women over forty who have failed to get married shouldn't live don't you agree he sniggered again well perhaps i do perhaps i do but we mustn't be severe we mustn't be severe we shall get old ourselves some day we shall indeed diana responded ironically even you must have passed your twentieth birthday he got up a spasmodic laugh at this but looked very foolish all the same did you in these psychic days think i might be the drowned old maid reincarnated she continued lazily still playing with her fan this time his laugh was unforced and genuine <laughs> you my dear young lady the miss may i knew might be your mother no it was only the curious coincidence of names that made me wonder if you were any relative there are many people in the world of the same name remarked diana quite so you will excuse me i'm sure and accept my apologies she bent her head carelessly and he moved away a few minutes later demetrius approached her come out on the terrace he said it's quite warm and there's a fine moon come and tell me all about it she looked at him in surprise all about it what do you mean all about the little podgy man who was talking to you you've met him before haven't you yes come along let's hear the little tale of woe his manner was so gentle and playful that she hardly understood it it was something quite new she obeyed his smiling gesture and throwing a light scarf about her shoulders went out with him on the terrace which dominated the smooth sloping lawn in front of the hotel where palms lifted their fringed heads to the almost violet sky and the scent of mimosa filled every channel of the moonlit air i heard all he said to you went on demetrius i was sitting behind you hidden by a big orange tree in a tub not purposely hidden i assure you and so you were drowned <laughs> he laughed then as he saw she was about to speak held up his hand hush i can guess it all not wanted at home except as a household drudge unloved and alone in the world you made an exit not a real exit just a stage one and came to me excellently managed for now being drowned and dead as the old diana you can live in your own way as the young one and you are quite safe your own father wouldn't know you she was silent looking gravely out to sea and the scarcely visible line of the esterel mountains you mustn't resent my quickness in guessing he continued i can always put two and two together and make four our podgy friend has been unconsciously a very good test of the change in you she turned her head and looked fixedly at him yes of the outward change but of the inward even you know nothing do i not and will you not tell me she smiled strangely it will be difficult but as your subject i suppose i am bound to tell he made a slight deprecatory gesture not unless you wish i have no wishes she replied the matter is like everything else quite indifferent to me you have guessed rightly as to the causes of my coming to you 
my father and mother were much disappointed at my losing all my chances as the world puts it and failing to establish myself in a respectable married position i was a drag on their wheel though they are both quite old people so i relieved them of my presence in the only way i could think of to make them sure they were rid of me for ever then on the faith of your advertisement i came to you you know all the rest and you also know that the experiment for which you wanted a woman of mature years is so far successful but there are no buts interrupted demetrius it is more than fulfilling my hopes and dreams and i foresee an ultimate triumph a discovery which shall revivify and regenerate the human race you too surely you must enjoy the sense of youth the delight of seeing your own face in the mirror diana shrugged her shoulders it leaves me cold she said it's a pretty face quite charming in fact but it seems to me to be the face of somebody else I don't feel in myself that I possess it. And the sense of youth you speak of has the same impression. It is somebody else's sense of youth. Her eyes glittered in the moonlight, and her voice, low and intensely musical, had a curious appealing note in it. Feodor Demetrius, it is not human. He was vaguely startled by her look and manner. Not human? he repeated, wonderingly. No, not human this beauty this youth which you have recreated in me are not human they are a portion of the air and the sunlight of the natural elements they make my body buoyant my spirit restless i long for some means to lift myself altogether from the gross earth away from heavy and cloddish humanity for which i have not a remnant of sympathy i am not of it i am changed and it is you that have changed me understand me well if you can you have filled me with a strange force which in its process of action is beyond your knowledge and by its means i have risen so far above you that i hardly know you she uttered these strange words calmly and deliberately in an even tone of perfect sweetness a sudden and uncontrollable impulse of anger seized him that is not true he said almost fiercely you know me for your master she bent her head showing no offence possibly for the present and again she looked lingeringly gravely out towards the sea shall we go in now one moment he said his voice vibrating with suppressed passion what you feel or imagine you feel is no actual business of mine i have set myself to force a secret of nature from the darkness in which it has been concealed for ages a secret only dimly guessed at by the sect of the rosicrucians and i know myself to be on the brink of a vast scientific discovery if you fail me now all is lost i shall not fail you she interposed quietly you may you may and he gave a gesture half of wrath half of appeal who knows what you will do when the final ordeal comes with these strange ideas of yours born of feminine hysteria i suppose who can foretell the folly of your actions or the obedience and yet you promised you promised she turned to him with a smile i promised and i shall fulfil she said what a shaken spirit is yours you cannot trust you cannot believe i have told you and i repeat it that i place my life in your hands to do what you will with it to end it even if so you decide but if it continues to be a life that lives on its present line of change it will be a life above you and beyond you that is what i wish you to understand she drew her scarf about her and moved along the terrace to re-enter the lounge of the hotel the outline of her figure was the embodiment of grace and the ease of her step suggested an assured dignity he followed her perplexed and in a manner ashamed at having shown anger gently she bade him good night and went at once to her room madame demetrius had retired quite an hour previously 
Once alone, she sat down to consider herself and the position in which she was placed. Before her was her mirror, and she saw reflected therein a young face, and the lustre of young eyes darkly blue and brilliant, which gave light to the features, as the sun gives light to the petals of a flower. She saw a dazzlingly clear skin as fair as the cup of a lily, and she studied each point of perfection with the critical care of an analyst or dissector. Every line of age or worry had vanished, and the bright hair of which she had always been pardonably proud had gained a deeper sheen, a richer hue, while it had grown much more luxuriant and beautiful. And now, she mused, now, how is it that, when I can attract love, I no longer want it? That I do not care if I never saw a human being again? That human beings bore and disgust me? That something else fills me, desires to which I can give no name? She rose from her chair and went to the window. It opened out to a small private balcony facing the Mediterranean, and she stood there as in a dream, looking at the deep splendour of the southern sky. One great star, bright as the moon itself, shone just opposite to her, like a splendid jewel set on dark velvet. She drew a deep breath. To this I belong, she said softly. To this, and only this. She made an exquisite picture, had she known it, and had any one of her numerous admirers been there to see her, he might have become as ecstatic as Shakespeare's Romeo. But for herself she had no thought, so far as her appearance was concerned. Something weird and mystical had entered into her being, and it was this new self of hers that occupied all her thoughts and swayed all her emotions. Just before they left Cannes to return to Geneva, Demetrius asked her to an interview with himself and his mother alone. They had serious matters to discuss, he said, and important details to decide upon. She found Madame Demetrius pale and nervous, with trembling hands and tearful eyes, while Demetrius himself had a hard, inflexible bearing as of one who had a disagreeable duty to perform, but who, nevertheless, was determined to see it through. Now, Miss May, he said, we have come to a point of action in which it is necessary to explain a few things to you, so that there shall be no misunderstanding or confusion. My mother is now, to a very great extent, in my confidence, as her assistance and cooperation will be necessary. It is nearing the end of April, and we propose to return to the Chateau Fragonard immediately. We shall open the house and admit our neighbours and acquaintances to visit us, as usual, but, for reasons which must be quite apparent to you, you are not to be seen. It is to be supposed that you have returned to England. You follow me. He spoke with a business-like formality, and Diana, smiling, nodded a cheerful acquiescence. Then, seeing that Madame Demetrius looked troubled, went and sat down by her, taking her hand and holding it affectionately in her own. You will keep to your suite of apartments. Demetrius continued, and Vasho will be your sole attendant, with the exception of my mother and myself. Here a sudden smile lightened his rather stern expression. I shall give myself the pleasure of taking you out every day in the fresh air. Fortunately, from our gardens, one can see without being seen. Diana, still caressing Madame Demetrius's fragile old hand, sat placidly silent. You are quite agreeable to this arrangement? went on Demetrius. You have nothing to suggest on your own behalf? Nothing whatever, she answered. Only, how long is it to last? He raised his eyes and fixed them upon her with a strange expression. On the 21st of June, he said, I make my final test upon you, the conclusion of my experiment. After the 24th you will be free, free to go where you please, to do as you like. Like Shakespeare's Prospero, I will give my fine sprite her liberty. Thank you. <laughs> and she laughed a little, bending her head towards Madame Demetrius. Do you hear that, dear lady? Think of it. What good times there are in store for me, if I can only feel that they are good, or even bad. It would be quite a sensation. And she flashed a bright look at Demetrius as he stood watching her almost morosely. 
Well, she said, addressing him, after the twenty-fourth of June, if I live, and if you permit it, I want to go back to England. Can that be arranged? Assuredly, I will find you a chaperone. A chaperone? Her eyes opened widely in surprise and amusement. Oh, no, I'm quite old enough to travel alone. That will not be apparent to the world. And he smiled again in his dark, reluctant way. But we shall see. In any case, if you wish to go to England, you shall be properly escorted. And if you go, will you not come back to us? Asked Madame Demetrius, rather wistfully. I do not want to part with you altogether. You shall not, dear madam. I will come back. And she gently kissed the hand she held. Even Professor Chauvet may want to see me again. Demetrius gave her a sharp glance. That old man is fond of you? He said tentatively. Of course he is. <laughs> and she laughed again. Who would not be fond of me? Excellent, Dr. Demetrius. Few men are so impervious to women as yourself. You think me impervious? I think a rock by the sea or block of stone more impressionable, she replied merrily. But that is as it should be. Men of science must be men without feeling. They could not do their work if they felt things. I disagree, said Demetrius quickly. It is just because men of science feel the brevity and misery of human life so keenly that they study to alleviate some of its pangs and spare some of its waste. They seek to prove the why and the wherefore of the apparent uselessness of existence. Nothing is useless, surely, put in Diana. Not even a grain of dust. Where is the dust of Carthage? he retorted. Of Babylon, of Nineveh. With what elements has it commingled to make more men as wise, as foolish, as sane, or as mad as the generations passed away? The splendour, the riches, the conquests, the glories of these cities were as great or greater than any that modern civilization can boast of. And yet, what remains? Dust? And is the dust necessary and valuable? Who can tell? Who knows? And with all the mystery and uncertainty... Is it not better to trust in God? said Madame Demetrius gently. Perhaps the little child who says our father is nearer to divine truth than all the science of the world. Sweetly thought and sweetly said my mother, answered Demetrius. But believe me, I can say our father with a more perfect and exalted faith now than I did when I was a child at your knee. And why? because I know surely that there is our Father which is in heaven, and because he permits us to use reason, judgment, and a sane comprehension of nature. Even so I seek to learn what I am confident. He wishes us to know. At all risks? his mother hinted in a low tone. At all risks, he answered. A political government risks millions of human lives to settle a temporary national dispute. I risk one life to make millions happier, and, here he looked steadily at Diana, with a certain grave kindness in his eyes, she is brave enough to take the risk. Diana met his look with equal steadiness. I do not even think about it, she said. It does not seem worth while. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of the Young Diana This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli Chapter Eighteen The strange spirit of complete indifference, and the attitude of finding nothing, apparently, worth the trouble of thinking about, stood Diana in such good stead that she found no unpleasantness or restriction in being more or less a prisoner in her own rooms on her return to the Chateau Fragonard. The lovely house was thrown open to the usual callers and neighbours. People came and went. The gardens, glorious now with a wealth of blossom, were the favourite resort of many visitors to Madame Demetrius and her son. And Diana, Looking from her pretty salon, through one of the windows which had so deep an embrasure that she could see everything, without any fear of herself being discovered, 
often watched groups of men and smartly attired women strolling over the velvety lawns or down the carefully kept paths among the flowers though always with a curious lack of interest they seemed to have no connection with her own existence true to his promise dr demetrius came every day to take her out when no other persons were in the house or grounds and these walks were a vague source of pleasure to her though she felt she would have been happier and more at ease had she been allowed to take them quite alone madame demetrius was unwearying in her affectionate regard and attention and always spent the greater part of each day with her displaying a tenderness and consideration for her which six months previously would have moved her to passionate gratitude but which now only stirred in her mind a, a faint sense of surprise all her sensations were as of one who by some mysterious means had been removed from the comprehension of human contact though her intimacy with what the world is pleased to consider the non-reasoning things of creation had become keenly intensified and more closely sympathetic there was unconcealed disappointment among the few who during the past autumn had met her at the chateau when they were told she had gone back to england baroness roussillon was in particular much annoyed for she had made a compact with the marchese farnese to enter into close and friendly relations with diana and to find out from her if at all possible the sort of work which went on in the huge domed laboratory wherein demetrius appeared to pass so much of his time farnese himself said little of his vexation but he left geneva almost immediately on hearing the news and without informing demetrius of his intention went straight to london resolved to probe what he considered a mystery to its centre as for professor chauvet no words could describe his surprise and deep chagrin at diana's departure he could not bring himself to believe that she had left geneva without saying good-bye to him so troubled and perplexed was he that with his usual bluntness he made a clean confession to demetrius of his proposal of marriage demetrius heard him with grave patience and a slight supercilious uplifting of his dark eyebrows i imagined as much he said coldly when he had heard all but miss may is not young and i should have thought she would have been glad of the chance of marriage you offered her did she give you any hope chauvet looked doubtfully reflective she did and she didn't he at last answered rather ruefully and yet she's not capricious and i trust her as you say she's not young good heavens what a heap of nonsense is talked about young women frequently the most useless and stupid creatures only thinking of themselves from morning till night miss may is a fine intelligent creature i should like to pass the few remaining years of my life in her company demetrius glanced him over with an air of disdainful compassion i dare say she'll write to you he said she's the kind of woman who might prefer to settle that sort of thing by letter can you give me her address at once asked the professor eagerly not at the moment replied demetrius composedly she has no fixed abode at present she's travelling with friends as soon as i hear from her i will let you know chauvet though always a trifle suspicious of other men's meanings was disarmed by the open frankness with which this promise was given and though more or less uneasy in his own mind allowed the matter to drop demetrius was unkindly amused at his discomfiture imagine it he thought that exquisite creation of mine wedded to so unsatisfactory a product of ill-assorted elements meanwhile diana imprisoned in her luxurious suite of rooms had nothing to complain of she read many books practised her music worked at her tapestry and last not least studied herself she had begun to be worth studying looking in her mirror she saw a loveliness delicate and well-nigh unearthly bathing her in its growing lustre as in a mysteriously brilliant atmosphere her eyes shone with a melting lustre 
like the eyes of a child appealing to be told some strange, sweet fairy legend. Her complexion was so fair as to be almost dazzling. The pure ivory white of her skin, showing soft flushes of pale rose, with the healthful pulsing of her blood. Her lips were of a dewy crimson tint, such as one might see on a red flower bud newly opened. And, as she gazed at herself and reluctantly smiled at her own reflection, she had the curious impression that she was seeing the picture of somebody else in the glass, somebody else who was young and enchantingly pretty, while she herself remained plain and elderly. And yet, this was not the right view to take of her own personality, for apart altogether from her outward appearance, she was conscious of a new vitality, an abounding ecstasy of life, a joy and strength which were well-nigh incomprehensible. For, though these sensations dominated every fibre of her being, they were not, as formerly, connected with any positive human interest. For one thing, she scarcely thought of Demetrius at all except that she had come to regard him as a sort of extraneous being, an upper servant told off to wait upon her after the fashion of Vasho. And when she went out with him, she went merely because she needed the fresh air and loved the open skies, not because she cared for his company, for she hardly spoke to him. Her strange behaviour completely puzzled him, but his deepening anxiety for the ultimate success of his experiment deterred him from pressing her too far with questions. One evening during the first week in June, when the moon was showing a half-crescent in the sky, a light wind ruffled the hundreds of roses on bush and stem that made the gardens fragrant. He went to her rooms to propose a sail on the lake. He heard her playing the piano, the music she drew from the keys was wild and beautiful and new. But as he entered, she stopped abruptly and rose at once, her eyes glancing him over carelessly as though he were more of an insect than a man. He paused, hesitating. You want me? she asked. For your own pleasure, at least, I hope so, he replied, almost humbly. It's such a beautiful evening. Would you come for a sail on the lake? The wind is just right for it, and the boat is ready. She made no reply, but at once threw a white serge cloak across her shoulders, pulling its silk-lined hood over her head, and accompanied him along a private passage which led from the upper floor of the house to the garden. You like the idea? he said, looking at her somewhat appealingly. She lifted her eyes, bright and cold as stars on a frosty night. What idea? This little trip on the lake? Certainly, she answered. It has been very warm all day. It will be cool on the water. Demetrius bethought himself of one of the teachings of the Rosicrucians. Whoso is indifferent obtains all good. The more indifferent you are, the purer you are. For to the indifferent all things are one. Some unusual influence there was, radiating from her presence like a fine air filled with suggestions of snow. It was cold, yet bracing, and he drew a long breath as of a man who had scaled some perilous mountain height, and now found himself in a new atmosphere. She walked beside him with a light swiftness that was almost aerial. His own movements seemed to him, by comparison, abnormally heavy and clumsy. Seeking about in his mind for some ordinary subject on which to hang a conversation, he could find nothing. His wits had become as clumsy as his feet. Pushing her hood a little aside, she looked at him. You had a garden party today, she queried. Yes, if a few people to tea in the gardens is a garden party, he answered. That's what it is usually called, said Diana carelessly. They are generally very dull affairs. I thought so when I watched your guests from my window. They did not seem amused. You cannot amuse people if they have no sense of amusement, he rejoined. Nor can you interest them if they have no brains. They walked among miracles of beauty, I mean the roses and other flowers, without looking at them. 
the sunset over the alpine range was gorgeous but they never saw it their objective was food that is to say tea coffee cakes and ices anything to put down the ever open maw of appetite what would you they are as they are made she offered no comment and you he continued in a voice that grew suddenly eager and impassioned you are as you are made as i have made you she let her hood fall back and turned her face fully upon him its fairness with the moonlight illumining it was of spiritual delicacy and yet there was something austere in it as in the face of a sculptured angel as i have made you he repeated with triumphant emphasis the majority of men and women are governed chiefly by two passions appetite and sex you have neither appetite nor sex therefore you are on a higher plane than yours she asked the question stung him a little but he answered at once possibly she smiled a little cold smile like the flicker of a sunray on ice they had arrived at the border of the lake and a boat with the picturesque latine sail of geneva awaited them with vasho in charge diana stepped in and seated herself among a pile of cushions arranged for her comfort demetrius took the helm and vasho settled himself down to the management of the ropes the graceful craft was soon skimming easily along the water with a fair light wind and diana in a half reclining attitude looking up at the sky found herself wishing that she could sail on thus away from all things present to all things future all things past seemed so long past she scarcely thought of them and all things future what would they be demetrius seated close beside her at the stern suddenly addressed her in a low cautious tone you know that this is the first week in june yes your time is drawing very near he went on on the evening of the twentieth you will come to me in the laboratory and you will be ready for anything she heard him apparently uninterested her face still upturned to the stars for anything she repeated dreamily for an end or a new beginning yes i quite understand i shall be ready without hesitation or fear have i shown either he ventured to touch the small hand that lay passively outside the folds of her cloak no you have been brave docile patient obedient he answered all four things rare qualities in a woman or so men say you would have made a good wife only your husband would have crushed you she smiled i quite agree but what crowds of women have been so crushed since the world began they have been useful as the mothers of the race said demetrius the mothers of what race she asked the human race of course <laughs> yes but which section of it <laughs> she persisted with a cold little laugh for instance the mothers of the assyrian race seem to have rather wasted their energies what has become of that race which they bore bred and fostered where is the glory of those past peoples what was the use of them they have left nothing but burnt bricks and doubtful records true but destiny has strange methods and their existence may have been necessary she shrugged her shoulders i fail to see it she said to me it all seems waste wanton wicked waste man lives in some wrong mistaken way the real joy of life must be to dwell on earth like a ray of light warming and fructifying all things unconsciously coming from the sun and returning again to the sun never losing a moment of perfect splendour but to have no consciousness is death said demetrius a ray of light is indifferent to joy consciousness with intelligence makes happiness she was silent you are well he asked gently perfectly and happy i suppose so you cannot do more than suppose people will hardly understand you if you can only suppose you are happy she flashed a look upon him of disdain which he felt rather than saw do i expect people to understand me she demanded do i wish them to do so i am as indifferent to people and their opinions as you are that is saying a great deal 
he rejoined. But I am a man. You are a woman. Women must study conventions. I need not, she interrupted him. Nor should you speak of my sex, since you yourself say I am sexless. He was silent. She had given him a straight answer. Some words of a great scientist from whom he had gained much of his knowledge came back to his memory. To attain true and lasting life, all passions must be subjugated, all animosities of nature destroyed. Attraction draws not only its own to itself, but the aura or spirit of other things which it appropriates, so far as it is able. And this appropriation or fusion of elements is either life-giving or destructive. He repeated the words, this appropriation or fusion of elements is either life-giving or destructive, to himself, finding a new force in their meaning and application. Diana, he said presently, I am beginning to find you rather a difficult puzzle. I have found myself so for some time, she answered, but it does not matter. Nothing really matters. Nothing? he queried. Not even love? That used to be a great matter with you. She laughed, coldly. <laughs> love is a delusion, she said, and no doubt I used to think the delusion a reality. I know better now. He turned the helm about, and their boat began to run homeward, its lateen sail glistening like the uplifted wing of a seagull. Above them the snowy alpine range showed white as the tips of frozen waves. Beneath, the water rippled blue-black, breaking now and again into streaks of silver. I'm afraid you have imbibed some of my cynicism, he said, slowly. It is, perhaps, a pity. For now, when you have come to think love a delusion, you will be greatly loved. It is always the way. If you have nothing to give to men, it is then they clamour for everything. He looked at her as he spoke and saw her smile. A cruel little smile. You are lovely now he went on, and you will be lovelier. For all I can tell, you may attain an almost maddening beauty, and a sexless beauty is like that of a goddess, slaying its votaries as with lightning. Supposing this to be so with you, you should learn to love, if only out of pity for those whom your indifference might destroy. She raised herself on her elbow and looked at him curiously. The moonlight showed his dark, inscrutable face, and the glitter of the steely eyes under the black lashes, and there was a shadow of melancholy upon his features. You forget, she said, you forget that I am old. I am not really young in the sense you expect me to be. I know myself. Deep in my brain the marks of lonely years and griefs are imprinted, of disappointed hopes and cruelties inflicted on me for no other cause than too much love and constancy. Those marks are ineffaceable. So it happens that beneath the covering of youth which your science gives me, and under the mark of this outward loveliness, I, the same Diana, live with a world's experience as one in prison, knowing that whatever admiration or liking I may awaken, it is for my outward seeming, not for my real self. And you can talk of love. Love is a divinity of the soul, not of the body. And how many human beings have soul, do you think? He queried ironically. Not one in ten million. The boat ran into shore and they landed. Diana looked back wistfully at the rippling light on the water. It was a beautiful sail, she said, more naturally than she had expressed herself for many days. Thank you for taking me. She smiled frankly up into his eyes as she spoke, and her spiritualized loveliness thrilled him with sudden surprise. It is I who must thank you for coming he answered, very gently. I know how keenly you are now attuned to nature. You have the light of the sun in your blood, and force of the air in your veins, and whether you admit it or not, you enjoy your life without consciousness of joy. Strange, but true. Yet, Diana, believe me, I want you to be happy, not only to suppose yourself happy, your whole being must radiate like the sunlight, of which it is now in part composed. She made no reply, but walked in her floating, graceful way beside him to the house, where he took her to the door of her own apartments, and there left her with a kindly, 
Good night. I shall not see very much of you now till the evening of the twentieth, he said, and then I hope you will not only pray for yourself, but for me. End of chapter 18「came in a soft splendour of misty violet skies and dimly glittering stars, after lovely hours of light and warmth which had bathed all nature in radiant summer glory, from earliest dawn till sunset. Diana had risen with the sun itself in the brightest of humours, without any forebodings of evil or danger, resulting from the trial to which she was ready to be subjected, and when Madame Demetrius came up to spend the afternoon with her as usual, she was gayer and more conversational than she had been for many a day. It was Madame who seemed depressed and anxious, and Diana, looking quite charming in her simple gown of white batiste, with a bunch of heliotrope at her bosom, rather rallied her on her low spirits. "'Ah, oh, my dear,' sighed the old lady, if I could only understand Feodor, but I cannot. He does not seem to be my son. He grows harsh and impatient. This wicked science of his has robbed him of nature. He is altogether unlike what he used to be when he first began these studies, and today the reason I am sad is that he tells me I am not to come to you any more till the afternoon of the twenty-fifth. Five days. It seems so strange. It frightens me. Dear, why be frightened? And Diana smiled encouragingly. You know now what he is trying to do, and you can see for yourself that he has partially succeeded. I'm quite pleased to hear that you are coming to see me again in five days. That shows he thinks I shall be alive to receive you. Madame Demetrius looked at her in a scared way. Alive? But of course, surely, oh, surely, you have never thought it possible that science may kill me, Diana finished carelessly. Very naturally, I have thought it possible. Science sometimes kills more than it saves, owing to our fumbling ignorance. And I wonder, supposing Dr. Feodor makes sure of his discovery, supposing he can give youth and beauty to those who are willing to go through his experiment, I wonder whether it is worth while to possess these attractions without any emotional satisfaction. Then you are not satisfied? asked Madame, a little sorrowfully. You are not happy? Diana moved to the open window, and with an expressive gesture, pointed to the fair landscape of lake and mountain. "'With this I am happy,' she answered. "'With this I am satisfied. I feel that all this is a part of me. It is one with me, and I with it. My own blood cannot be closer to me than this air and light. But the pleasure a woman is supposed to take in her looks if she is beautiful, the delight in pretty things for oneself, this does not touch me. I have lost all such sensations. When I was a girl, I rather liked to look at myself in the glass, to try contrasts of colour or wear a dainty jewelled trinket. But now when I see in the mirror a lovely face that does not belong to me, I am not even interested. But, my dear Diana, the lovely face does belong to you, exclaimed Madame Demetrius. You are yourself and no other. Diana looked at her rather wistfully. I am not so sure of that, she said. Now, please, don't think I am losing my senses, for I'm not. I'm perfectly sane and my thoughts are particularly clear. But science is a terrible thing. It is a realization, more or less, 
of the Egyptian sphinx, a sort of monster with the face of a spirit and the body of an animal. Science, dear madam, please don't look so frightened, has lately taught men more about killing each other than curing. It also tells us that nothing is or can be lost. All sights and sounds are garnered up in the treasure houses of air and space. The forms and faces of human creatures long dead are about us. The aura of their personalities remain, so their bodies have perished. Now I feel just as if I had unconsciously absorbed somebody else's outward personality. And here I am, making use of it as a sort of cover to my own. My own interior self admires my outward appearance without any closer connection than that felt by anyone looking at a picture. I live within the picture, and no one seeing the picture could think it was I. Poor Madame Demetrius listened to Diana's strange analysis of herself, with feelings of mingled bewilderment and terror. In her own mind, she began to be convinced that her son's experiment would destroy his subject's mentality. It all seems very dreadful, she murmured tremblingly, and I think, dear Diana, you should say something of this to Feodor, for I am afraid he is making you suffer, and that you are unhappy. No, that is not so, and Diana smiled reassuringly. I do not suffer, I have forgotten what suffering is like, and I am not unhappy, because what is called happiness has no special meaning for me. I exist, that is all. I am conscious of the principal things of existence, air, light, movement. These keep me living, without any real effort or desire on my own part to live. She spoke in a dreamy way, with a far-off look in her eyes. Then, perceiving that Madame Demetrius looked nervously distressed, she brought herself back from her dreamland, as it were with an effort, and went on, "'You must not worry about me in the least, dear madam. After all, it may be an excellent thing for me that I appear to have done with emotions. One has only to think how people constantly distress themselves for nothing. People who imagine themselves in love, for instance. How they torment themselves, night and day, if they fail to get letters from each other.' If they quarrel, if they think themselves neglected, why, it is a perpetual turbulence. Then the parents who spend all their time looking after their children, and the children grow up and go their own way. They grow from pretty little angels into great awkward men and women, and it is as if one had played with charming dolls, and then saw them suddenly changed into clothes props. Well, I am free from all these tiresome trivialities. I have what I think the gods must have indifference. Madame Demetrius sighed. Ah, Diana, it is a pity you were never made a happy wife and mother, she said softly. I thought so too, once. <laughs> and Diana laughed carelessly. But I'm sure I'm much better off as I am. Now, dear, we'll part for the present. I want to rest a little, and to say my prayers, before Dr. Feodor sends for me. Madame at once rose to leave the room, but before doing so, she took Diana in her arms and kissed her tenderly. God bless and guard thee, dear child, she murmured. Thou art brave and loyal, and I have grown to love thee. If Feodor should bring thee to harm, he is no son of mine. For a moment the solitary-hearted, unloved woman felt a thrill of pleasure in this simple expression of affection. The real sensation of youth filled her veins as if she were a confiding girl with her mother's arms about her, and something like tears sprang to her eyes. But she suppressed the emotion quickly. Smiling and apparently unmoved, she let the gentle old lady go from her and watched her to the last as she moved with the careful step of age along the entresol and out through the entrance to the head of the staircase, where she disappeared. Once alone, Diana stood for a few moments lost in thought. She knew instinctively that her life was at stake. Demetrius had reached the final test of his mysterious dealings with the innermost secrets of nature, and he had passed the 
problem of the fourth, sixth, and seventh, which, according to his theories, meant certain refractions and comminglings of light. Now he had arrived at the ultimate culmination of the eighth, or, as he described it, the close or the rebound of the octave, and in this rebound, or culmination, his subject, Diana, was to take part as a moat within a sun-ray. She did not disguise from herself the danger in which she stood, but she had thought out every argument for and against the ordeal which she had voluntarily accepted. She measured the value of her life from each standpoint and found it nil, except in so far as her love for natural beauty was concerned. She would be sorry, she said inwardly, to leave the trees, the flowers, the birds, the beautiful things of sky and sea, but she would not be sorry at all to see the last of human beings. With all her indifference, which even to her own consciousness enshrined her as within barriers of ice, her memory was keen. She looked back to the few months of distance and time which separated her from the old life of the dutiful daughter to inconsiderate and selfish parents, and beyond that, she went still further and saw herself as a young girl full of hope and joy, given up heart and soul to the illusion of love, from which she was torn by the rough hand of the very man to whom she had consecrated her every thought. In all this there was nothing enviable or regrettable that she should now be sorry or afraid to die, and in her life to come, if she lived, what would there be? Her eyes turned almost without her own consent towards the mirror, and there she read the answer. She would possess the power to rule and sway the hearts of all men, if she cared, but now it had so happened that she did not care. Smouldering in her soul like the last spent ashes of a once fierce fire, there was just one passion left, the strong desire of vengeance on all the forces that had spoilt and embittered her natural woman's life. She was no longer capable of loving, but she knew she could hate. A woman seldom loves deeply and truly more than once in her life. She stakes her all on the one chance and hope of happiness, and the man who takes advantage of that love and ruthlessly betrays it may well beware. His every moment of existence is fraught with danger, for there is no destructive power more active and intense than love transformed to hate through falsehood and injustice. And Diana admitted to herself, albeit reluctantly, that she could hate deeply and purposefully. She hated herself for the fact that it was so, but she was too honest not to acknowledge it. Her spirit had been wounded and maltreated by all on whom she had set her affections, and as her way of life had been innocent and harmless, she resented the unfairness of her fate. Wrong or right, she longed to retaliate in some way, on the petty slights, the meannesses, the hypocrisies and neglect of those who had assisted in spoiling her youth and misjudging her character and though she was willing to love her enemies in a broad and general sense, she was not ready to condone the easy callousness and cruelty of the persons and circumstances which had robbed her of the natural satisfaction and peace of happy womanhood. For a long time she sat at the open window, lost in a reverie, till she saw the sun beginning to sink in a splendid panoply of crimson and gold, the streaming clouds of fleecy white and pale amber, spreading from east to west, from north to south, like the unfurling flags of some great fairy's victorious army, and then a sudden thrill ran through her blood, which made her heart beat and her face grow pale. It was close upon the destined hour when, ah, she would not stop to think of the when or the where, Instinctively she knelt down, and with folded hands said her prayers simply as a child, though with more than a child's fervour. She had scarcely breathed the last amen when a light tap came on her door, and on her calling, Come in, Basho entered, carrying a small parcel with a note from Demetrius. Handing it to her, 
he signified by his usual expressive signs that he would wait outside for the answer. As soon as he had retired, she opened the note and read as follows. You will please disrobe yourself completely and wear only this garment which I send. No other material must touch any part of your body. Let your hair be undone and quite free. No hairpins must remain in it, and no metal of any sort must be upon your person. No ring bracelet or anything whatsoever. When you are ready, Vasha will bring you to me in the laboratory. Having mastered these instructions, she undid the packet which accompanied them, and unfolded a plain, long, white robe of the most exquisitely beautiful texture woven, apparently, of many double strands of silk. It was perfectly opaque. Not the slightest glimmer of the light itself could be seen through it, yet it shone with a curious luminance, as though it had been dipped in frosted silver. For a moment she hesitated. A tremor of natural dread shook her nerves. Then, with a determined effort, mastering herself, she hurried into her bedroom, and there undressing, laid all her clothes neatly folded up on the bed. The action reminded her of the way she had folded up her clothes with similar neatness, and left them on the rocks above the sea, on the morning she had decided to effect a lasting disappearance by drowning. And now, she thought, now comes a far greater plunge into the unknown than ever I could have imagined possible. In a few minutes she was attired for the sacrifice, as she said, addressing these words to herself in the mirror, and a very fair victim she looked. The strange, white, sheeny garment in which she was clothed from neck to feet gave her the appearance of an angel in a picture, and the youthful outline of her face, the delicacy of her skin, the deep brilliancy of her eyes, all set off against a background of glorious amber-brown hair, which rippled in plentiful waves over her shoulders and far below her waist, made her look more of a vision than a reality. "'Good-bye, you poor, lonely Diana,' she said softly. "'If you never come back, I am glad I saw you just like this, for once.' She kissed her hand to her own reflection, then turned and went swiftly through the rooms, not looking back. Vasho, waiting for her in the outer hall, could not altogether disguise his wonderment at sight of her, but he saluted in his usual passively humble eastern manner, and led the way, signing to her to follow. The house was very quiet. They met no one, and very soon arrived at the ponderous door of the laboratory, which swung noiselessly upwards to give them entrance. Within there seemed to be a glowing furnace of fire. The great wheel emitted such ceaseless and brilliant showers of flame in its rotations that the whole place was filled with light that almost blinded the eyes, and Diana could scarcely see Demetrius. When, like a black speck detaching itself from the surrounding sea of crimson vapour, he advanced to meet her. He was exceedingly pale, and his eyes were feverishly brilliant. "'So you have come,' he said. "'I am such a sceptic that at this last moment I doubted whether you would.' She looked at him steadfastly, but answered nothing. "'You are brave, you are magnificent,' he went on, his voice sinking to a lower tone. "'But, Diana, I want you to say one thing before I enter on this final task, and that is—' "'I forgive you.' "'I will say it if you like,' she answered. "'But why should I? I have nothing to forgive.' "'Ah, oh, you will not see. You, you cannot understand.' "'I see and understand perfectly,' she said quickly. "'But if I live, my life remains my own. If I die, it will be your affair. But there can be no cause for grudge either way.' "'Diana,' he repeated earnestly, "'say just this. Feodor, I forgive you.' She smiled. A strange little smile of pity and pride commingled, and stretched out both hands to him. To her surprise he knelt before her and kissed them. Feodor, I forgive you, she said, very sweetly, in the penetrating accents which were so exclusively her own. Now, magician, get to your work quickly. Apollonius of Tiana and Paracelsus were only children, playing on the shores of science compared to you. When you are ready, I am. 
he sprang up from his kneeling attitude and for a moment looked about him as one half afraid and uncertain his amazing piece of mechanism the great wheel was revolving slowly and ever more slowly for outside in the heavens the sun had sunk and the massed light within the laboratory's crystal dome was becoming less and less dazzling astonishing reflections of prismatic colour were gathered in the dark water below the wheel as though millions of broken rainbows had been mixed with its mysterious blackness quietly diana waited her white robed figure contrasting singularly with all the fire-glow which enveloped her in its burning lustre and her heart beat scarcely one pulse the quicker when demetrius approached her holding with extreme care a small but massive crystal cup it was he who trembled not she as she looked at him inquiringly he spoke striving to steady his voice to its usual even tone of composure this cup he said if it contains anything contains the true elixir for which all scientists have searched through countless ages they failed because they never prepared the cells of the human body to receive it i have done all this preparatory work with you and i have done it more successfully than i ever hoped even the tiniest cell or group of cells that goes to form your composition as a human entity is now ready to absorb this distillation of the particles which generate and shape existence this is the sacramental cup of life it is what early mystics dreamed of as the holy grail do not think that i blaspheme no i seek to show the world what science can give it of true and positive communion with the mind of god the elements that commingle to make this universe and all that is therein are the real bread and wine of god's love and whoever can and will absorb such food may well preserve body and soul unto everlasting life such is the great union of spirit with matter such is the truth after which churches have been blindly groping in their symbolic holy communion feebly materialized in bread and wine as god's body and blood but the actual body and blood of the divine are the ever-changing but never destructible elements of all positive life and consciousness and you are prepared to receive them a thrill of strange awe ran through diana as she heard his reasoning was profound yet lucid it was true enough she thought that god that is to say the everlasting spirit of creative power is everywhere and in every thing yet to the average mind it never occurs to inquire deeply as to the subtle elements wherewith divine intelligence causes this everywhere and everything to be made she remained silent her eyes fixed on the crystal cup knowing that for her it held destiny you are prepared resumed demetrius i have left nothing undone and yet you are but woman not weaker than man she interrupted him quickly though men have sought to make her so in order to crush her more easily give me the cup he looked at her in undisguised admiration wait he said you shall not lose yourself in the infinite profound without knowing something of the means whereby you are moved this cup as you see is of purest crystal hewn rough from rocks that may have been fused in the fires of the world's foundation within it are all the known discoverable particles of life's essence and when i say discoverable i wish you to understand that many of these particles were not discovered or discoverable at all till i set my soul to the work of a spy on the secrets of nature i have already told you that this test may be life or death to you if it should be death then i have failed utterly for by all the closest and most minute mathematical measurements it should be life smiling she stretched out her hand give me the cup she repeated if it should be death he went on speaking more to himself than to her i think it will be more your fault than mine not voluntarily your fault except that perhaps you may have concealed from me details of your personality and experience which i ought to have known and yet i believe you to be entirely honest success as i have told you 
depends on the perfect health and purity of the cells, so that if you were an unprincipled woman, or if you had led a tainted life, if you were a glutton, or one who drank and took drugs for imaginary ailments, the contents of this cup would kill you instantly, because the cells, having been weakened and lacerated, could not stand the inrush of new force. But had you been thus self-injured, you would have shown signs of it during these months of preparation, and so far I have seen nothing that should hinder complete victory. Then why delay any longer? And Diana gave a gesture of visible impatience. It is more trying to me to wait here in suspense on your words than to die outright. He looked at her half pleadingly, then turned his eyes towards the great wheel, which was now, after sunset, going round with an almost sleepy slowness. One moment more of hesitation, and then with a firm hand, he held out the cup. Take it, he said, and may God be with you. With a smile she accepted it, and, putting her lips to the crystal rim, drained its contents to the last drop. For half or quarter of a second she stood upright. Then, as though struck by a flash of lightning, she fell senseless. Quickly Demetrius sprang to her side, picked up the empty cup as it rolled from her hand, and called, Vasho! Instantly the tall Ethiopian appeared, and obeying his master's instructions, assisted him to lift the prone figure, and lay it on a bench near at hand. Then they both set to work to move a number of ropes and pulleys which, noiselessly manipulated, proved to be an ingenious device for lowering a sort of stretcher or couch, canopied in tent-like fashion, and made entirely of the same sort of double-stranded silk material, in which Diana had clothed herself for her, sacrifice. This stretcher was lowered from the very centre of the dome of the laboratory, and upon it the two men, Demetrius and his servant, carefully and almost religiously placed the passive form, which now had an appearance of extreme rigidity, like that of a corpse. Demetrius looked anxiously at the closed eyes, the waxen pallor of the features, and the evident tension of the muscles of the neck and throat. Then, with a kind of reckless swiftness and determination, he began to bind the apparently lifeless body round and round, with broad strips of the same luminous, sheeny stuff which composed the seeming funeral couch of his subject, in the fashion of an Egyptian mummy. Vasho, acting under orders, assisted him as before, and very soon Diana's form was closely swathed from head to foot, only the eyes, mouth, and ears being left uncovered. The laboratory was now illumined only by its own mysterious fires. Outside was a dark summer sky, powdered with faint stars, and every lingering reflex of the sunset had completely vanished. With the utmost care and minutest attention, Demetrius now looked to every detail of the strange canopied bier on which the insensible subject of his experiment was laid. Then, giving a sign to Vasho, the ropes and pulleys by which it was suspended were once more set in motion, and slowly, aerially, and without a sound, it swung away and across the dark pool of water to a position just under the great wheel. The wheel, revolving slowly and casting out lambent rays of fire, illumined it as a white tent might be illumined on the night blackness of a bare field. It rested just about four feet above the level of the water, and four feet below the turning rim of the wheel. When safely and accurately lodged in this position, Demetrius and his servant fastened the ropes and pulleys to a projection in the wall, attaching them to a padlock of which Demetrius himself took the key. Then, pausing, they looked at each other. Vasho's glittering eyes, rolling like dark moonstones under his jetty brows, asked mutely a thousand questions. 
he was stricken with awe and terror and gazed at his master as beseechingly as one might fancy an erring mortal might look at an incarnate devil sent to punish him but in the set white face of demetrius there was no sign of response or reassurance two or three minutes passed and going to the edge of the pool demetrius looked steadily across it at the white pavilion with its hidden burden swung between fire and water then slowly but resolutely turned away as he did so vasho suddenly fell on his knees and catching at his master's hand implored him by eloquent signs of fear pity and distress not to abandon the hapless woman thus bound and senseless to a fate more strange and perhaps more terrible than any human being had yet devised to torture his fellow human being demetrius shook off his touch impatiently and bade him rise from his knees do not pray to me he said harshly pray to your god if you have one i have a god whose intelligence is so measureless and so true that i know he will not punish me for spending the brain with which he has endowed me in an effort to find out one of his myriad secrets there was a time in this world when men knew nothing of the solar system now god has permitted them to know it in the same way we know nothing of the secret of life but shall we dare to say that god will never permit us to know that would be blasphemy indeed we suffer fools gladly we allow tricksters such as mediums fortune-tellers and the like to flourish on their frauds but we give little help to the man of spiritual or psychological science whose learning might help us to conquer disease and death no vasho your fears have no persuasion for me i am thankful you are dumb there is no more to do we may go vasho's moonstone eyes still turned lingeringly and compassionately on the white pavilion under the wheel of fire he made expressive signs with his fingers to which his master answered almost kindly she will die you think if so my toil is wasted my supreme experiment is a failure she must live and i have sufficient faith in the accuracies of god and nature as to be almost sure she will come he took the reluctant vasho by the arm and led him to the mysterious door which swung up in its usual mysterious way at his touch they passed out and as the portal swung down again behind them demetrius released a heavy copper bar from one side and clamped it across the whole door fastening it with lock and key i do this in case you should be tempted to look in he said with a stern smile to his astonished attendant you have been faithful and obedient so far but you know the secret of opening this door when no bar is placed across it but with it ah my vasho the devil himself may fumble in vain vasho essayed a feeble grin but his black skin looked a shade less black as he heard his master's words and saw his resolute action gone was the faint hope the poor blackamoor had entertained of being of some use or rescue to the victim prisoned in the laboratory she was evidently doomed to abide her fate and demetrius walked with an unfaltering step through the long corridor from the laboratory into the hall of his house and then sent vasho about his usual household business while he himself went into the garden and looked at the still beauty of the evening everywhere there was fragrance and peace innumerable stars clustered in the sky and the faint outline of the snowy alps was dimly perceptible from the lawn he could see the subdued glitter of the glass dome of the laboratory at that moment it had the effect of a crystal sphere with the palest of radiance filtering through and to-morrow is the longest day he said with a kind of rapt exultation pray heaven the sun may shine with all its strongest force and utmost splendour from its rising to its setting so shall we imprison the eternal fire end of chapter nineteen
Chapter Twenty of The Young Diana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter Twenty. The next morning dawned cloudlessly, and a burning sun blazed intense summer heat through all the hours of the longest and loveliest day. Such persistent warmth brought its own languor and oppression, and though all the doors and windows of the Chateau Fragonard were left open, Madame Demetrius found herself quite overwhelmed by the almost airless stillness, notwithstanding a certain underwave of freshness, which always flowed from the mountains like a breathing of the snow. "'How is Diana?' she asked of her son, as, clad in a suit of cool white linen, he sauntered in from the garden to luncheon. "'I believe she is very well,' he answered, composedly. "'She has not complained.' "'I hope she has nothing to complain of,' said the old lady, nervously. "'You promised me, Feodor, that you would not let her suffer.' "'I promised you that if she was unhappy or in pain, I would do my best to spare her as much as possible,' he replied. "'But up to the present she is neither unhappy nor in pain.' You are sure? Sure. Vasho, who was in attendance, stared at him in something of questioning terror, and his mother watched him with a mute fondness of appeal in her eyes, which, however, he did not, or would not, see. She could not but feel a certain pride in him as she looked at his fine, intellectual face, rendered just now finer and more attractive by the tension of his inward thought. Presently he met her searching, loving gaze with a smile. "'Do you not think, mother mine,' he said, "'that I merit some of the compassion you extend so lavishly to Miss May, who is, after all, a stranger in her house? Can you not imagine it possible that I, too, may suffer? Permit yourself to remember that it is now twenty-five years since I started on this quest, and that during that time I have not rested day or night without having my brain at work, puzzling out my problem. Now that I have done all which seems to me humanly possible, have you no thought of me in my utter despair if I fail? But you will not fail. In every science for one success there are a million failures, he replied. And dare I complain if I am one of the million? I have been fortunate in finding a subject who is obedient, tractable, and eminently courageous. Sometimes, indeed, I have wondered whether her courage will not prove too much for me. She is a woman of character, of strong yet firmly suppressed emotions, and she has entered a characterless household. Characterless? repeated Madame Demetrius in surprised tones. Can you say that? Of course. What play of character can be expected from people who are as self-centred as you and I? You have no thought in life beyond me, your erratic and unworthy son. I have no thought beyond my scientific work and its results. Neither you nor I take interest in human affairs or human beings generally. Any writer of books venturing to describe us would find nothing to relate, because we form no associations. We let people come and go, but we do not really care for them, and if they stayed away altogether we should not mind. Well, as far as that goes, Diana tells me she is equally indifferent, said Madame. Yes, but her indifference is hardly of her own making, he replied. She is not aware of its source or meaning. Her actual character and temperament are deep as a deep lake over which a sudden and unusual frost has spread a temporary coating of ice. She has emotions and passions, rigidly and closely controlled. She cares for things without knowing she cares, and at any moment she may learn her own power. A power which you have given her, interposed his mother. True, and it may be a case of putting a sword into the hand that is eager to kill he answered. However, her strength will be of the psychological type, which gross material men laugh at. I do not laugh, knowing the terrific force hidden within each one of us behind the veil of flesh and blood. Heavens, what a world it would be if we all lived according to the spirit rather than the body, if we all ceased to be coarse feeders and animal sensualists, and chose only the purest necessaries for existence and health and sanity. It would be paradise regained." If your experiment succeeds, as you hope, said Madame Demetrius, what will happen then? 
you will let diana go she will go whether i let her or not he replied she will have done all i require of her his mother was silent and he as though weary of the conversation presently rose and left the room stepping out on the lawn in the full blaze of noonday he looked towards the dome of the laboratory but could scarcely fix his eyes upon its extreme brilliancy which was blinding at every point he felt very keenly that it was indeed the longest day of the year never had hours moved so slowly and despite the summer glory of the day so drearily his thoughts dwelt persistently on the bound and imprisoned form swung in solitude under the great wheel which he knew must now be revolving at almost lightning speed churning the water beneath it into prismatic spray and every now and then a strong temptation beset him to go and unlock the door of the prison-house and see whether his victim had wakened to the consciousness of her condition but he restrained this impulse with evening the slender curve of the new moon glided into the sky looking like the pale vision of a silver sickle and a delicious calm pervaded the air his thoughts gradually took on a more human tendency he allowed himself to pity his subject after all what an arid sort of fate had been hers the only child of one of those painfully respectable british couples who never move out of the conventional rut and for whom the smallest expression of honest opinion is bad form and herself endowed by some freak of nature with exceptional qualities of brain what a neutral and sad-coloured existence hers had been when love and the hope of marriage had deserted her no wonder she had resolved to break away and seek some outlet for her cramped and imprisoned mentality though marriage is drab-coloured enough he mused unless husband and wife are prudent and agree to live apart from each other for so many months in the year and now if my experiment succeeds she will make a fool or a lunatic of every man her eyes rest upon except myself the days wore away slowly as each one passed madame demetrius grew more and more uneasy and more and more her eyes questioned the unresponsive face of her son vasho too could not forbear gazing with a kind of appealing terror at his master's composed features and easy demeanour it was more than devilish he thought that a man could comport himself thus indifferently when he had a poor human victim shut up within a laboratory where the two devouring elements of fire and water held the chief sway however there was nothing to be done a figure of stone or iron was not more immovable than demetrius when once bent to the resolved execution of a task no matter how difficult such task might be looking at the cold indomitable expression of the man one felt that he would care nothing for the loss of a thousand lives if by such sacrifice he could attain the end in view but though his outward equanimity remained undisturbed he was inwardly disquieted and restless he saw two alternatives to his possible success his victim might die in which case her body would crumble to ashes in the process to which it was being subjected or she might lose her senses death would be kinder than the latter fate but he was powerless to determine either and even at the back of his mind there lurked a dim suggestion of some other result which he could not formulate or reckon with the longest waiting must have an end but never to his thought did a longer period of time stretch itself out between the evening of the twentieth of june and that of the twenty-fourth midsummer day the weather remained perfect intensely warm bright and still not a cloud crossed the burning blue of the daylight and at evening the young moon slightly broadening from a slender sickle to the curve of a coracle boat floating whitely in the deep ether shed fairy silver over the lake and the alpine snows above it during these days many people of note and scientific distinction called at the chateau fragonard feodor demetrius was a personage to be reckoned with 
in many departments of knowledge, and his exquisite gardens afforded coolness and shade to those wanderers from various lands who were touring Switzerland in search of health and change of scene. Near neighbours and acquaintances also came and went, but such is the generally vague attitude of mind assumed by ordinary folk to other than themselves, that scarcely any among the few who had met Diana, and accepted her as a chance visitor to Madame Demetrius, now remembered her, except the Baron and Baroness Roussillon, who still kept up a slight show of interest as to her whereabouts, though their questions were lightly evaded, and never fully answered. Professor Chauvet, irritated and unhappy at receiving no news whatever, of the woman for whom he had conceived a singular but sincere affection, had taken it into his head to go suddenly to Paris, to see after his house and garden there, which had long been unoccupied. A fancy possessed him that if, or when, Diana did write to him, he would answer her from Paris, so that they might meet there, or in London, without the surveillance or comment of Demetrius. Meanwhile, Demetrius himself, a figure of impenetrable reserve and cold courtesy, let his visitors come and go as they listed, apparently living the life of a scientist absorbed in studies too profound to allow himself to be troubled or distracted by the opinions of the outer world. Midsummer Day, the Feast of St. John, and a day of poetic and superstitious observance, came at last and drifted along in a stream of gold and azure radiance, the sun sinking round as a rose in a sky without a cloud. To the last moment of its setting Demetrius waited, watch in hand. All day long he had wandered aimlessly in the garden among his flowers, talking now and then to his gardeners, and stopping at every point where he could see the crystal dome of his laboratory shine clear like the uplifted minaret of some palace of the east and it was with the greatest difficulty that he compelled himself to walk with a slow and indifferent mien when the moment arrived for him to return to the chateau. His heart galloped like a runaway racehorse, while he forced his feet into a sauntering and languid pace, as though he were more than oppressed by the heat of the day. And he stopped for a moment to speak to his mother, whose reclining chair was in the loggia where she could enjoy the view of the gardens and the fountains in full play. I am, he said, and paused, then went on. I am going to the laboratory for an hour or two. If I am late for dinner, do not wait for me. Madame Demetrius, busy with some delicate lacework, looked up at him inquiringly. Are you seeing Diana this evening? she asked. He nodded assent. Give her my love, and tell her how glad I am that her days of solitude are over, and that I shall come to her tomorrow, as soon as you will allow me. He nodded again, and with a tender hand stroked the silver brando of the old lady's pretty hair. After all, old age is quite a beautiful thing, he said, and stooping, he kissed her on the brow. It is perhaps wrong that we should wish to be always young? He passed on then, and, entering his library, rang a bell. Vasho appeared. Vasho, the hour has come, he said, whereat Vasho, the dumb, uttered an inarticulate animal sound of terror. Either I have succeeded or I have failed. Let us go and see. He paused for a moment, his eyes resting on the mysterious steel instrument, which always working in its accustomed place, on its block of crystal, struck off its tiny sparks of fire with unceasing regularity. You gave me the first clue, he said, addressing it. You were a fluke, a chance, a stray hint from the unseen. And you will go on forever if nothing disturbs your balance, if nothing shakes your exact mathematical poise. So will the universe similarly go on forever, if similarly undisturbed. All a matter of calculation, equality of distribution, and exact poise, designed by a faultless intelligence, an intelligence which we are prone to deny, a divinity we dare to doubt. Man perplexes himself with a million forms of dogma which he calls religions, when there is truly only one religion possible for all the world, 
and that is the intelligent reasoning devout worship of the true god has made manifest in his works these works none but the few will study preferring to delude themselves with the fantastic spectres of their own imaginations yet when we have learned what in time we must know the words of the evangelist may be fulfilled i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first earth and the first heaven were passed away and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain so we may have a joyous world where youth and life are eternal and where never a heart-throb of passion or grief breaks the halcyon calm shall we care for it i wonder will it not prove monotonous and when all is smooth sailing shall we not long for a storm a quick sigh escaped him then remembering vasho's presence he shook off his temporary abstraction come vasho he said i must go and find this marvel of my science living or dead and don't look so terrified one would think you were the victim whatever happens you are safe vasho made expressive signs of apologetic humility and appeal to which demetrius gave no response save an indulgent smile come he repeated they left the library demetrius leading the way and walked through the long corridor to the door of the laboratory gleams of gold and silver shone from the mysterious substance of which it was composed and curious iridescent rays flashed suddenly across their eyes as if part of it had become transparent the sun's flames have had power here remarked demetrius almost they have pierced the metal answering to pressure in the usual manner the portal opened and closed behind them as they entered for a moment it was impossible to see anything owing to the overwhelming brilliancy of the light which filled every part of the domed space a light streaked here and there with gold and deep rose colour the enormous wheel was revolving slowly and beneath its rim the canopied white stretcher was suspended over the dark water below as it had been left four days previously the prisoned victim had not stirred for two or three minutes demetrius stood looking eagerly his eyes peering through the waves of light that played upon his sense of vision almost as drowningly as the waves of the sea might have played upon his power of breathing vasho shaken to pieces by his uncontrollable inward terrors had fallen on his knees and hidden his face in his hands demetrius roused him from this abject attitude get up vasho don't play the fool he said sternly what ails you are you afraid look before you man there is no change in the outline of that figure it is merely in a condition of suspended animation if she were dead understand me she would not be there at all the stretcher would be empty come i want your help with these pulleys vasho striving to steady his trembling limbs went to his imperious master's assistance as the pulleys were unlocked and released now gently said demetrius let the ropes go easy and pull evenly they worked together and gradually with a smooth swaying noiseless movement the canopied couch with its motionless occupant was swung away from the wheel across the water and laid at their feet the canopy itself sparkled all over as with millions of small diamonds and as they raised and turned it back curled in their hands and twisted like a live thing a still brighter luminance shone from end to end of the closely bound and swathed figure beneath it a figure rigid as stone yet though so rigid uncannily expressive of hidden life demetrius knelt down beside it and began to unfasten the close wrappings in which it was so fast imprisoned from the feet upwards signing to vasho to assist him each one of the glistening white silken bands was hot to the touch and as it was unwound cast out little sparks and pellets of fire the widest of these was folded over and over across the breast binding in the arms and hands and as this was undone the faintest stir of the body was perceptible at last demetrius uncovered the face and head and then both he and vasho sprang up and started back amazed and awestruck 
never a lovelier thing could be found on earth than the creature which lay so passively before them a young girl of beauty so exquisite that it hardly seemed human the goddess of a poet's dream might be so imagined but never a mere thing of flesh and blood and as they stood staring at the marvel the alabaster whiteness of the flesh began to soften and flush with roseate hues a faint sigh parted the reddening lips the small childlike hands hitherto lying limp on either side were raised as though searching for something in the air and then slowly easefully and with no start of surprise or fear diana awoke from her long trance and stretched herself lazily smiled sat up for a moment her hair falling about her in an amber shower and finally stepped from her couch and stood erect a vision of such ethereal fairness and youthful queenliness that all unconscious of his own action demetrius sank on his knees in a transport of admiration whispering my triumph my work my wonder of the world she meanwhile with the questioning air of one whose surroundings are utterly unfamiliar surveyed him in his kneeling attitude as though he were a stranger drawing herself up and pushing back the wealth of hair that fell about her she spoke in the exquisitely musical voice that was all her own though it seemed to have gained a richer sweetness why do you kneel she asked are you my servant for one flashing second he was tempted to answer your master but there was something in the stateliness of her attitude and the dignity of her bearing that checked this bold utterance on his lips and he replied your slave if so you will it a smile of vague surprise crossed her features remind me how i came here she said there is something i cannot recall i have been so much in the light and this place is very dark you are a friend i suppose are you not a chilly touch of dread overcame him his experiment had failed if despite its perfection of physical result the brain organization was injured or destroyed she talked at random and with a lost air as if she had no recollection of any previous happenings surely i am your friend he said rising from his knees and approaching her more nearly you remember me feodor demetrius she passed one hand across her brow demetrius feodor demetrius <laughs> she repeated then suddenly she laughed a clear bright laugh like that of a happy child of course i know you now and i know myself i am diana may diana may who was the poor unloved old spinster with wrinkles round her eyes and feelings in her stupidly warm heart but she is dead i live she lifted her arms the silver sheen of her mysterious gleaming garment falling back like unfurled wings i live she repeated i am the young diana the old diana is dead her arms dropped to her sides again and she turned to demetrius with a bewitching smile and you love me she said you love me as all men must love me even he loves me and she pointed playfully to vasho cowering in fear as far back in a shadowy corner as he could out of the arrowy glances of her lovely eyes then laughing softly again she gathered her robe about her with a queenly air <laughs> come dr feodor demetrius let us go i see by the way you look at me that you think your experiment has been too much for my brain but you are mistaken i am quite clear in memory and consciousness you are the scientist who advertised for a woman of mature years i am diana may who was mature enough to answer you and came from london to geneva on the chance of suiting you i have submitted to all your commands and here i am 
A success for you, I suppose, but a still greater success for myself. I do not know what has happened since I came into this laboratory a while ago, nor am I at all curious. That was my coffin. She indicated the stretcher with its white canopy from which she had arisen. He was about to answer her when she stopped him. No, tell me nothing. Say it is my chrysalis from which I have broken out. A butterfly, she smiled. Look at poor Vasho. How frightened he seems. Let us leave this place. Surely we have had enough of it? Come, Dr. Demetrius. It's all over. You have done with me and I with you. Take me to my rooms. Her air and tone of command were not to be gainsaid. Amazed and angry at his own sudden sense of inferiority in an efficiency, Demetrius signed to the trembling Vasho to open the door of the laboratory and held out his hand to Diana to guide her. She looked at him questioningly. Must I? she asked. You are quite enough in love with me already. But if you take my hand... Her eyes, brilliant and provocative, flashed disdainfully into his. He strove to sustain his composure. You are talking very foolishly, he said with studied harshness. If you wish to convince me that you are the same Diana May who has shown such resolute courage and modesty and, and such obedience to my will, you must express yourself more reasonably. Her light laugh rippled out again. Oh, but I am not the same Diana May, she answered. You have altered all that. I was old and a woman. Now I am young and a goddess. He started back, amazed at her voice and attitude. A goddess. A goddess, she repeated triumphantly. Young with a youth that shall not change. Alive with a life that shall not die. Out of the fire and the air I have absorbed the essence of all beauty and power. What shall trouble me? Not the little things of this querulous world. Not its peevish men and women. I am above them all. Feodor Demetrius, your science has gathered strange fruit from the tree of life. But remember, the flaming sword turns every way. He gazed at her in speechless wonderment. She had spoken with extraordinary force and passion, and now stood confronting him as an angel might have stood in the garden of paradise. Her beauty was overwhelming, almost maddening in its irresistible attraction, and his brain whirled like a moat in a ring of fire. He stretched out his hands appealingly. Diana, he half whispered. Diana, you are mine, my sole creation. Not so, she replied. You blaspheme. Nothing is yours. You have used the forces of nature to make me what I am, but I am nature's product, and nature is not always kind. Let us go. She moved towards the door. Vasho stood ready to open it, his eyes cast down, and his limbs trembling. As she approached, she smiled kindly at him, but the poor negro was too scared to look at her. He swung the portal upward, and she passed through the opening. Demetrius followed, not venturing to offer his hand a second time. He merely gave instructions to Vasho to set the laboratory in order and remove every trace of his experiment, then kept close beside the erect, slight, graceful figure in the shining garment that glided along with unerring steps through the corridor into the familiar hall, where, for a moment, Diana paused. Is your mother well? she asked. Quite well. I am glad. You will prepare her to see me tomorrow? I will. She passed on, up the staircase and went straight to her own rooms. It was plain she had forgotten nothing, and that she had all her senses about her. As Demetrius threw open the door of her little salon, she turned on the threshold and fully confronted him. Thank you, she said. I hope you are satisfied that your experiment has succeeded. He was pale to the lips, and his eyes glowed with suppressed fire. But he answered calmly, I am more than satisfied if, if you are well. I am very well, she replied, smiling. I shall never be ill. You ought to know that if you believe in your own discovery. You ought to know that I am no longer made of mortal clay, subject to all the ills that flesh is heir to. Your science has filled me with another and more lasting form of life. 
He was silent, standing before her with head bent, like some disgraced schoolboy. Good night, she said, then, in a gentler tone, I do not know how long I have been the companion of your ordeal by fire. I suppose I ought to be hungry and thirsty, but I am not. To breathe has been to me sufficient nourishment. Yet, for the sake of appearances, you had better let Vasho, poor frightened Vasho, bring me food as usual. I shall be ready for him in an hour. She motioned him away and closed the door. As she disappeared, a light seemed to vanish with her, and the dark entresol grew even darker. He went downstairs in a maze of bewilderment, dazzled by her beauty and conscious of her utter indifference, and stood for a moment at the open door of the loggia, looking out at the still, dark loveliness of the summer evening. And so it is finished, he said to himself, all over, a completed triumph and a marvel of science. But what have I made of her? She is not a woman. Then what is she? End of chapter 20Chapter Twenty One of The Young Diana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter Twenty One. While Demetrius thus perplexed himself with a psychological question for which he could find no satisfactory answer, Diana was happily free from doubts and fears of any kind whatsoever. When she found herself alone in her rooms, she was conscious of a strange sense of sovereignty and supremacy, which, though it was in a manner new to her, yet did not seem unnatural. She was not in the least conscious of having passed four days, practically, in a state of suspended animation. No more, perhaps, then is the Indian fakir who suffers himself to be buried in the earth for a sufficient time to allow the corn to grow over him. She looked about her, recognising certain familiar objects which were her own, and others which belonged to the Demetrius household. She touched the piano lightly as she passed it, glanced through the open window at the dusky, starlit skies, and then went into her bedroom, where, turning on the electric burner, she confronted herself in the mirror with a smile. Beauty smiled back at her in every line and curve, in every movement, and she criticised her own appearance as she might have criticised a picture, admiring the sheeny softness and sparkle of the mysterious garment in which she was arrayed. But after a few moments of this quiet self-contemplation, she recollected more mundane things, and, going to the wardrobe, took out the rose-pink wrap Sophy Lansing had given her. "'I wonder,' she said, half laughing, "'what Sophy would say to me now. "'But after all, what a far-away person Sophy seems!' Standing before the mirror, she deliberately let the shining robe of ordeal slip from her body to the floor. Nude as a pearl, she remained for a moment, gazing, as she knew, at the loveliest model of feminine perfection ever seen since the sculptor of the Venus de Medici wrought his marble divinity. Yet she was not surprised or elated. No touch of vanity or self-complacency moved her. The astonishing part of the whole matter was that it seemed quite natural to her to be thus beautiful. Beauty had become part of her existence, like the simple act of breathing, and called for no special personal notice. She slipped on a few garments, covering all with her rose-silk wrapper, and twisted up her hair. And so she was clothed again as Diana May. But what a different Diana May! She heard Vasho moving in the sitting-room, and looking, saw that he was setting out a dainty little table with game and fruit and wine. He caught sight of her fair face watching him from the half-open door, which divided bedroom from sitting-room, and paused abashed 
then made a sort of eastern salutation, full of the most abject humility. "'Poor Vasho,' she said, advancing. "'How strange that you should be so afraid of me. What do you take me for? You must not be afraid.' no goddess suddenly descending from the skies to earth could have looked more royally beneficent than she and vasho made rapid signs of entire devotion to her service no she said you are your master's man he will need your help when i am gone the negro's countenance expressed a sudden dismay and she laughed <laughs> yes when i am gone she repeated and that will be very soon I am made for all the world now. His eyes rolled despairingly. He made eloquent and beseeching signs of appeal. You will be sorry, she said. Yes, I dare say you will. Now go along. They want you downstairs. It is foolish to be sorry for anything. She smiled at him as he backed from her presence, looking utterly miserable, and disappeared. Left alone, she touched a glass of wine with her lips, but quickly set it down. What a curious taste, she said. I used to like it. I don't like it at all now. I'm not thirsty and I'm not hungry. I want nothing. It's enough for me to breathe. She moved slowly up and down with an exquisite floating grace, a perfect vision of imperial beauty, her rose-red rest gown, with its white fur lining trailing about her, and presently, Sitting down by the open window, she inhaled the warm summer air, and after a while watched the moon rise through a foam of white cloud, which seemed to have sprayed itself sheer down from the alpine snows. Her thoughts were clear, her consciousness particularly active, and, with a kind of new self-possession and intellectuality, she took herself, as it were, mentally to pieces, and examined each section of herself as under a psychological microscope. Let me be quite sure of my own identity, she said, half aloud. I am Diana May, and yet I am not Diana May. I have lost the worn old shell of my former personality, and I have found another personality which is not my own, and yet, somehow, is the real me. The me for whom I have been searching and crying, ever since I could search and cry. The me I have dreamed of as rising in the shape of a soul from my dead body. I am clothed with a life vesture made of strange and imperishable stuff. I cannot begin to describe or understand it, except as an organization free from all pain and grossness, and, what is more positive still, free from all feeling. She paused here, interested in the puzzle of her thoughts. Raising her eyes, she looked out at the divine beauty of the night. Yes, she went on, musing. That is the strangest part of it. I have no feeling. This is the work of science. Therefore, my condition will be within reach of all who care to accept it. I look out at the garden, the moonlight, but not as I used to look. They have no feeling and seem just a natural part of myself. They do not move me to any more sensation than the recognition that they live, as I do, with me and for me. If I can get hold of myself at all, surely, I think my chief consciousness is that of power. Power, with no regard for its exercise or result. She waited again, disentangling her mind from all clinging or vague recollections. This man, Theodore Demetrius, interested me at one time, she said. His utter selfishness and callous absorption in his own studies moved me almost to pain. Now he does not interest me at all. His mother is kind, very simple, very stupid and well-meaning, but I could not stay with her for long. Who else must I remember? Suddenly she laughed. <laughs> pa and Ma, she exclaimed. I must not forget them, those dear, respectable parents of mine, who only cared for me as long as I was an interesting object to themselves, and found me in the way when their interest ceased. Flighty Pa, wouldn't he just love to be rejuvenated, and turned out as a sort of new Faustus, amorous and reckless of everybody's feelings, but his own? 
Oh, yes, I mustn't forget Pa. I'm young enough to wear white now. I'll go and see him as soon as I get back to England, before Ma's best morning gown grows rusty. <laughs> she laughed again, the most enchanting dimples lightening her face, as mirth radiated from her lips and eyes. Then all at once she became serious, almost stern, and stood up as though lifted erect by some thought which impelled action. One hand clenched involuntarily. Captain the Honourable Reginald Cleeve, she said, in slow tones of emphatic scorn, especially the Honourable. I must not forget him, or his fat wife, or his appallingly hideous and stupid children. I must look at them all, and not only must I look at them, they must look at me. Her hand relaxed, her eyes, limpid and lustrous, turned again towards the open window in moonlit summer night. Yet, is vengeance worth while? she mused. Vengeance on a moat, a worm, a low soul such as that of the man I once almost worshipped? Yes, the gods know it is worth while to punish a liar and traitor. When the world becomes unclean and full of falsehood, a great war is sent to purge its foulness, when a man destroys a life's happiness, it is just that his own happiness should also be destroyed. She had come to the conclusion of her meditations, and seeing the hour was ten o'clock, she opened her door and put the untouched little supper-table, with all its delicacies, outside, in the entresol, to be cleared away, then, locking herself in for the night, prepared to go to bed. It was now that a sudden thrill of doubt quivered through her beautiful new organization. The nervous idea that perhaps she would not be able to pray. She took herself severely to task for this thought. All things are of God, she said aloud. Whatever science has made of me, I can be nothing without his will. To him belong the sun and air, the light and fire. To him also I belong, and to him I may render thanks without fear. She knelt down and uttered the familiar, Our Father, in slow, soft tones of humility and devotion. To anyone who could have watched her praying thus, she would have seemed a splendid angel newly dressed, save wings, for heaven. And when she laid her head on her pillow, she fell asleep as sweetly as a young child. Her breathing is light, her dreamless, unconsciousness as perfect. The morning found her refreshed by her slumber, stronger and more self-possessed than before, and when clad in her ordinary little white batiste gown she looked, as indeed she was bodily, if not mentally, a mere slip of a girl, a lovely girl, slender as a rod and fair as a lily, radiating in every expression and movement with an altogether extraordinary beauty. After the breakfast hour came Madame Demetrius, eager, curious, affectionate, but at first sight of her stood as though rooted to the floor, and began to tremble so violently that Diana put an arm about her to save her from falling. But, with a white, scared face and repelling hand, the old woman pushed her aside. "'Do not touch me, please,' she said in feeble, quavering tones. "'I... I did not expect this. I was prepared for much, but not this. This is devil's work.' Oh, my son, my son, he is possessed by the powers of evil. May God deliver him. No, no. This, as Diana, with her beautiful smile of uplifted sweetness and tolerance, strove to speak. Nothing you can say will alter it. It is impossible that such a thing could be done without rebellion against the laws of God. You, you are not Diana May. You are some other creature not made of flesh and blood. Diana heard her with a gentle patience. Very possibly you are right, she said, quietly. But whatever I am made of must be some of God's own material, since there is nothing existent without him. Why, even if there is a devil, the devil himself cannot exist, apart from God. Madame Demetrius uttered a pained cry, and then began to sob hysterically. Oh, do not speak to me, do not speak to me she wailed. 
My son, my son, my Feodor, his soul is the prey of some evil spirit, and it seems to me as if you are that spirit's form and voice. You are beautiful, but not with merely a woman's beauty. His science has called some strange power to him. You are that power. You will be his doom. She wrung her hands nervously and moaning, Let me go, let me go, turned to leave the room. Diana stood apart, making no effort to detain her. A look of wondering compassion filled her lovely eyes. Poor woman, she breathed softly. Poor, weak, worn soul. Then suddenly she spoke aloud in clear, sweet, decisive terms. Dear madam, she said, you distress yourself without cause. You need not be afraid of me. I will do you no harm. As for your son, his fate is in his own hands. He assumes to be master of it. I shall not interfere with him or with you, for now I shall leave you both for ever. I have submitted myself to his orders. I have been his paid subject, and he cannot complain of any want of obedience on my part. His experiment has succeeded. Nothing therefore now remains for me to do here, and he has no further need of me. I promise you I will go as quickly as I can, and if, as you say, I am not human, why, so much the worse for humanity. She smiled, and her attitude and expression were royally triumphant. Madame Demetrius had reached the door of the apartment, and with her hand leaning against it, turned back to look at her in evident terror. Then she essayed to speak again. I am sorry, she faltered, if I seem strange and harsh, but, but you are not Diana May, not the woman I knew. She had grown younger and prettier under my son's treatment, but you, you are a mere girl, and I feel... I know you are not, you cannot be human. A light of something like scorn flashed from Diana's eyes. Is humanity so valuable? she asked. But this question was more than enough for Madame Demetrius. With a shuddering exclamation of something like utter despair, she hurriedly opened the door and stumbled blindly out into the corridor, there to be caught in the arms of her son, who was coming to Diana's rooms. My mother, he ejaculated. What is this? Diana stood at her half-open door, looking at them both like a young angel at the gate of paradise. Your mother is frightened of me, she explained gently. She says I am not human. I dare say that's very likely. But do try and comfort her, and tell her that I have no evil intentions towards her or you, and that I am going away as soon as you will allow me to do so. His brows contracted. Mother! he said reproachfully. Is this how you keep your promise to me? I gave you my confidence. You see the full success of my great experiment. And yet you reward me thus? She clung to him desperately. Feodor, Feodor, she cried. My son, my only child, you shall not blame me, me, your mother. I love you, Feodor, and love teaches many things. Oh, my son... You have drawn from your science something that is not of this world, something that has no feeling, no emotion. This creature of your making is not Diana. As she spoke, her face grew livid. She beat the air with her feeble old hands, as though she fought some invisible foe, and fell in a dead faint. Quickly Demetrius lifted her in his arms and laid her on the sofa in Diana's sitting-room. Diana came to his aid, and deftly and tenderly bathed her forehead and hands with cool water. When she showed signs of returning consciousness, Diana said whisperingly, I will go now. She must not be frightened again. She must not see me when she wakes. You understand? Poor dear old lady. She imagines I am not human. When she has told me, I shall be your doom. She smiled. Do you think I shall? Her loveliness shone upon him like a light too brilliant to endure. His heart beat furiously, but he would not look at her. He bent his head over his mother's passive figure, busying himself with restoratives, and answered nothing. She waited a minute, then added, You will arrange for my leaving here as soon as possible. After what she has said, it will be best for your mother that I should go at once. 
then and then only he lifted his dark eyes they were sad and strained i will arrange everything he said no doubt the sooner we part the better she smiled again then moved swiftly away into her bedroom and locked the door slowly madame demetrius recovered and looked around her with an alarmed expression has she gone yes her son replied with a bitterness he could not restrain she has gone and she will go you have driven away the loveliest thing ever seen on earth my creation through you she will leave me altogether and yet you say you love me i do i do love you cried his mother weeping Feodor, Feodor, i love you as no other can or will i love you and by my love i claim your soul i claim it from the powers of evil i claim it for god End of chapter 21「The Young Diana」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Young Diana by Marie Corelli. Chapter 22 The swiftness and silence of Diana's departure from the Chateau Fragonard was of an almost uncanny nature there were no affectionate leave-takings and she made no attempt to see madame demetrius who thoroughly unnerved and ill remained in her bedroom nor would she permit of any escort to the station or seeing off by way of farewell she simply left the house having packed and labelled her own luggage to be sent after her and walked quietly with dr demetrius through the lovely gardens all in their summer beauty to the private gate opening out to the high road, from whence it was an easy ten minutes to the station. He was very silent, and his usual composure had entirely deserted him. "'I cannot part with you like this,' he said in low, nervous tones, as she gave him her hand in good-bye. "'As soon as my mother recovers from this strange breakdown of hers, I shall follow you. I must see you again,' she smiled. "'Must you?' of course i must i am deeply grateful to you do not think i can forget your patience your courage he paused deeply moved i hate the idea of your travelling all alone to london why she asked in an amused tone i came all alone yes but it was different <laughs> you mean i looked mature then she laughed oh well nobody will interfere with a girl returning home from school in geneva a pained smile crossed his face yes you can play that part very well he admitted but you cannot live alone without someone to look after you she gave a light gesture of indifference no well i will get some dear old lady in reduced circumstances to do that there are so many of them all with excellent references someone about my own age would do for after all i'm over forty he uttered an exclamation of impatience <laughs> why will you say that because it's true she replied according to this planet's time but here her eyes flashed with a strange and almost unearthly lustre there are other planets other countings and by these i am well what i am he looked at her in mingled doubt and wonder. Diana, he said entreatingly, will you not trust me? In what way? she asked with sudden coldness. What trust do you seek? Listen, he went on eagerly. My science has worked its will upon you with the most amazing success, but there is something beyond my science, something which baffles me, which I cannot fathom. It is in you, yourself, you have learned what i have failed to learn you know what i do not know a smile suddenly irradiated her lovely face so might an angel smile in giving a benediction i am glad you realize that she said quietly for it is true but what i have learned what i know i cannot explain to myself or impart to others he stood amazed not so much at her words as at her manner of uttering them it was the unapproachable, 
ethereal dignity of her attitude and expression that awed and held him in check. You would not understand or believe it possible, she went on, even if I tried to put into words what is truly a wordless existence, apart from you altogether, apart not only from you, but from all merely human things. Ah, he interrupted quickly, that is just the point. You say merely human as if you had passed beyond humanity. She looked at him steadily. Humanity thinks too much of itself, she said slowly. Its petty ambitions, its miserable wars, its greed of gain and love of cruelty. What is it worth without the higher soul? In this universe, even in this planet, humanity is not all. There are other forces, other forms. But, as I have said, I cannot explain myself, and it is time to say goodbye. I am glad I have been of use in helping you to succeed in what you sought to do, and now I suppose you will make millions of money by your ability to re-establish life and youth. And will that make you happy, I wonder? His face grew stern and impassive. I do not seek happiness, he said. Not for myself. I hope to make happiness for others. Yet truly I doubt whether happiness is possible in this world, except for children and fools. And sorrow? she queried. Sorrow waits on us hand and foot, he replied. There is no condition exempt from it. Except mine, she said, smiling. I am relieved of both sorrow and joy. I never seem to have known either. I am as indifferent to both as a sunbeam. Goodbye. He held her hand, and his dark eyes searched her lovely face, as though looking for a gleam of sympathy. Goodbye, he rejoined. But not for long, remember that. Those whom you knew in England will not recognize you now. You will have many difficulties, and you may need a friend's counsel. I shall follow you very soon. Why should you? she asked lightly. His grasp on her hand tightened unconsciously. Because I must, he answered passionately. Don't you see? You draw me like a magnet. And I cannot resist following my own exquisite creation. She released her hand with a decided movement. You mistake, she said. I am not your creation. You, of yourself, can create nothing. I am only a result of your science which you never dreamed of, which you could not foresee, and which you will never master. Goodbye. She left him at once with this word, despite his last entreating call. Diana, and passing through the private gate to the high road, so disappeared. Like a man in a trance, he stood watching till the last glimpse of her dress had vanished. Then, with a mist of something like tears in his eyes, he realised that a sudden blank loneliness had fallen upon him like a cloud. Something I shall never master, he repeated, as he went slowly homeward. If woman I shall, but if not... And here he checked his thoughts, not daring to pursue them further. So they parted, he more bewildered and troubled by the success of his experiment than satisfied, while she, quite unconscious of any particular regret or emotion, started on her journey to England. Never had she received so much attention, and the eagerness displayed by every man she met to wait upon her and assist her in some way or other, amused her while it aroused a certain scorn. It is only looks that move them, she said to herself. The same old tale, youth and beauty, and never a care whether I am a good or an evil thing. And yet, one is asked to respect men. She went on her way without trouble. The chef de gare at Geneva was full of gentle commiseration at the idea of so young and lovely a creature travelling alone, and placed her tenderly, as though she were a hothouse lily to be carried, with care, in a first-class compartment of Dame Seule, where a couple of elderly ladies received her graciously, with motherly smiles, and remarked that she was very young to travel alone. She deprecated their attention with becoming grace, but said very little. She looked at their wrinkles and baggy throats, and wondered whether— if they knew of Dr. Demetrius and went to him, he could ever make them young and beautiful again. It seemed impossible. They were too far gone. They were travelling to London, however, and she cheerfully accepted their kindly proposal that she should make the journey in their company. 
On the way through Paris, she wrote a brief letter to Sophie Lansing, saying that she would call and see her as soon after arrival in London as possible, and adding as a postscript, I have changed very much in my appearance, but I hope you will still know me as your friend, Diana. The two ladies, with whom chance or fate had thrown her in company, turned out to be of the old English aristocracy, and were very simple, gently-mannered women who had for many years been intimate friends. They were both widows, their children were grown up and married, and many reverses of fortune, with loss of kindred, had but drawn them more closely together. Every year they took little inexpensive holidays abroad, and they were returning home now after one of these spent at aix la bande They were fascinated by the extraordinary beauty of the girl they had volunteered to chaperone, and, privately to one another, thought and said she ought to wear a veil, for no man saw her without seeming suddenly smitten all of a heap, as the saying is, and, after one or two embarrassing situations at various stations en route, where certain of these smitten had not scrupled to walk up and down the platform outside their compartment just to look at the fair creature within, one of the worthy dames suggested, albeit timidly, that perhaps, only perhaps, a veil might be advisable, as they were soon going across the sea, and the rough salt wind and spray were so bad for the complexion. Diana smiled. She understood. And for the rest of the journey she tied up her beautiful head and face in American fashion, with an uncompromising dark blue motor veil, through which hardly the tip of her nose could be seen. They crossed the channel at night, and breakfasted together at Dover. Once in the train bound for London, Diana's companions sought tactfully to find out who she was. Something quite indefinable and unusual about her gave them both a touch of nerves. She seemed removed and aloof from life's ordinary things, though her manner was perfectly simple and natural. She gave her name quite frankly, and added that she was quite alone in the world. "'I have one friend, Miss Sophie Lansing,' she said. "'You may have heard of her. She is a leading suffragette and a very clever writer. I am going to her now.' The ladies glanced at each other and smiled. "'Yes, we have heard of her,' said one. "'But I hope she will not make you a suffragette. Life has much better fortune in store for you than that.' "'You think so?' and Diana shrugged her graceful shoulders indifferently. Anyway, I am not interested in political matters at all. They are always small and quarrelsome, like the buzzing of midges on a warm day. One of her companions now took out her card case. Do come and see me in town, she said kindly. I should be very glad if you would. I live a very quiet, humdrum life, and seldom see any young people. Diana smiled as she accepted the card. Thank you so much, she murmured. Seeing at a glance the name and address, Lady Ellswood, Chester Square, and thinking how easy it was for youth and beauty to find friends. I will certainly come. And don't forget me, said the other lady. I live just round the corner, only a few steps from Lady Ellswood's house, so you can come and see me also. Diana expressed her acknowledgement by a look, reading on the second card now proffered, Mrs. Gervais, and the address indicated. I will she said, and yet in her own mind she felt that these two good-natured women were the merest shadows to her consciousness, and that she had not the remotest idea of going to visit them at any time. London reached, they parted, and Diana, taking a taxicab and claiming her modest luggage from the custom-house officials, was driven straight to Sophie Lansing's flat in Mayfair, which she had left under such different circumstances close on a year ago. Miss Lansing was in, said the servant, who opened the door, and Diana had hardly waited in the drawing-room five minutes, when there was a rush of garments and quick feet, and Sophie herself appeared. But at the door she stopped, transfixed. There's some mistake, she said at once. You must have come to the wrong flat. I expected a friend, Miss May. You are not Miss May. Diana held out both hands. "'Sophie, don't you know me?' she said, smiling. "'Won't you know me? Surely you recognise my voice? I told you in my letter from Paris that I was changed. I thought you would understand.' But Sophie stood mute and bewildered, her back against the door by which she had just entered. 
for half a minute she felt she knew the sweet thrill of the voice that was diana's special gift but when she looked at the exquisite girlish beauty of the the person who had intruded upon her as she thought on false pretences she was unreasonably annoyed her annoyance arising though she would never have admitted it from a helpless consciousness of her own inferiority in attractiveness nonsense she said sharply whoever you are you can't take me in my friend is a middle-aged woman older than i am you are a mere girl do you think i don't know the difference please leave my house at these words a delightful peal of lilting laughter broke from diana's lips sophie stared indignant and speechless while diana slipped off a watch bracelet from her slender wrist very well dear she said if you don't want to know me you shan't here is the little watch you lent me when i went away last year after i was drowned you remember in place of my own which i'm glad to see you are wearing you know i took up a position with the dr feodor dimitrius whose advertisement you sent me he wanted me to help him in a scientific experiment well i did and i am the result of his work i see you don't believe me so i'll go i told the taxi man to wait i'm so sorry you won't have me sophie lansing listened amazed and utterly incredulous that voice that sweet laughter they had a familiar ring but the youthful features the exquisite complexion of clear cream and rose these were no part of the diana she had known and she shook her head obstinately you may have met my friend in geneva she said stiffly but how you got my watch from her i am at a loss to imagine unless she lent it to you to travel with you look to me like a runaway schoolgirl playing a practical joke but whoever you are you are not diana may smilingly diana laid the watch she had taken off down on the table very well i will leave this here she said it is yours and when i am gone it will help you to remember and think over all the circumstances you had my letter from paris i had a letter replied sophie coldly from my friend miss may diana laughed again i wrote it she said how droll it seems that you should know my handwriting and not know me and i thought you would be so pleased you who said i was going to be a wonderful creature and that cinderella should go to the prince's ball and now you won't recognize me it's just as if you were jealous because i'm pretty i may as well explain before i go that dr demetrius for whom i've been working all the year is one of those scientific cranks who think they can restore lost youth create beauty and prolong life like faust you know he wanted a subject to practice upon and as i was no earthly use to any one he took me and he's turned me out as you see me all new and fresh as the morning and i believe i shall last a long while but here sophie lansing uttered a half-suppressed scream oh, go away she gasped you you are a mad girl you've escaped from some asylum i'm sure you have with swift dignity diana drew herself up and gazed full and pitifully at her quondam friend poor sophie she said i'm sorry for you i thought you had more character more self-control i am not mad i am far saner than you are i have told you the truth and one more thing i can tell you that i have lost all power to be hurt or offended or disappointed so you need not think your failure to believe me or your loss of friendship causes me the least pain i have gone beyond all that you are keeping the door closed will you let me pass really frightened and trembling violently sophie lansing moved cautiously to one side and as cautiously opened the door her scared eyes followed every movement of the graceful aerial girl figure which professed to be diana's and she shrank away from the brilliant glance of the heavenly dark blue eyes that rested upon her with such almost angelic compassion she heard a softly breathed good-bye and a gentle sweep of garments then a pause and diana was gone she rushed to the window yes there was the taxi waiting another minute and she saw her girl visitor enter it the vehicle soon disappeared its noisy grind and whir being rapidly lost in the roar of the general traffic it was not it could not have been diana almost sobbed sophie to herself 
i felt oh yes i felt it was something not quite human then turning to the table where the watch bracelet had been left she took it up it was indubitably her bracelet with her monogram in small rubies and diamonds on the back of the watch she had certainly lent it almost given it to diana and she herself was wearing diana's own watch which mr and mrs polydore may had given her as a souvenir of our darling child it was all like a wild dream where had this girl come from she is frightfully beautiful exclaimed sophie at last in an outburst of excited feeling simply unearthly even if she were diana i could not have her here with me never never she would make me look so old so plain so unattractive but of course she is not diana no beauty doctor could make a woman over forty look like a girl of eighteen or less she must be an adventuress of some sort she couldn't be so beautiful unless she were but she won't palm herself off on me my poor old diana i wonder what has become of her meanwhile poor old diana somewhat perplexed by the failure of her friend to accept her changed appearance on trust was thinking out the ways and means of her new life she had plenty of money for demetrius had placed two thousand pounds to her credit in a london bank a sum which she had no hesitation in accepting as the price of her life risked in his service the thought now struck her that she would go to this bank draw a small cheque and explain that she had arrived alone in london and wished to be recommended to some good hotel this proved to be an excellent idea the manager of the bank received her in his private office and fairly dazzled by her beauty placed his friendliest services at her disposal informing her that he was a personal friend of demetrius and that he held him in the highest esteem and honour to prove his sincerity he personally escorted her to a quiet private hotel of the highest respectability chiefly patronised by county ladies above suspicion here on his recommendation she took a small suite overlooking the park becoming more and more interested in her youth loveliness and loneliness he listened sympathetically while she mentioned her wish to find some middle-aged lady of good family who would reside with her as a chaperone and companion for a suitable annual salary and he promised to exert himself in active search for a person of quality who would be fitted for the post he was a good-looking man and though married was susceptible to the charms of the fair sex and it was with undisguised reluctance that he at last took his leave of the most beautiful creature he had ever seen with many expressions of courtesy and commiserating her enforced temporary solitude i wish i could stay with you he said regardless of convention i'm sure you do answered diana sweetly thank you so much you have been most kind a look from the lovely eyes accompanied these simple words which shot like a quiver of lightning through the nerves of the usually curt self-possessed business man and caused him to stammer confusedly and move awkwardly as at last he left the room when he was gone diana laughed they are all alike she said all <laughs> worshippers of outward show suppose that good man knew i was over forty why he wouldn't look at me the manageress of the hotel just then entered bringing the book in which all hotel visitors registered their names she was quite a stately person attired in black silk and addressed diana with a motherly air having been told by the bank manager for whom she had a great respect to have good care of her diana wrote her name in a dashing free hand putting herself down as a british subject and naming geneva as her last place of residence when her attention was arrested by a name three or four lines above that on which she was writing and she paused pen in hand are those people staying here she asked the manageress looked where she pointed captain the honourable reginald cleeve mrs cleeve two daughters and maid she said yes they are here they always come here during a part of the season diana finished writing her own inscription and laid down the pen she was smiling and her eyes were so densely blue and brilliant that the manageress was fairly startled i will dine in my room this evening she said 
i have had a long journey and am rather tired to-morrow perhaps i'll come down to dinner don't put yourself out at all about that said the manageress kindly it's not comfortable for a girl to dine in a room full of strangers or perhaps you know mrs cleeve and could sit at her table no i do not know mrs cleeve said diana decidedly i've seen her at a charity bazaar and i believe she's very stout but i claim no acquaintance she is stout agreed the manageress with a smile as she left the room diana stood still absorbed in thought her features were aglow with some internal luminance her whole form was instinct with a mysteriously radiant vitality so destiny plays my game she said half aloud on the very first day of my return to the scene of my poor earthly sorrows i lose an old friend and find an old lover End of chapter 22